bom dia a todos. Vamos dar início a esta, esta conferência sobre os desafios da educação à distância no ensino superior. Eu gostava de dar as boas-vindas em português a todos os presentes e a todos aqueles que nos estão a ouvir remotamente através do, da nossa página do YouTube e esperar que atinja esta conferência com a participação dos nossos convidados, peritos internacionais com experiência neste domínio, que possa ser benéfico para todos nós, em particular para a agência, naturalmente, mas a agência não tem, não desenvolve a sua atividade isoladamente, desenvolve sempre em cooperação com o grupo com o CISP e com a FESP, aliás, são nossos co-organizadores desta conferência e daí a minha, enfim, a minha saudação e estas, estas palavras em português de início. Tenho uma, uma apresentação rápida, só de boas-vindas em inglês e, portanto, vou passar para o Rodrigo. Good morning, everybody. Higher education plays a crucial role in the qualification of citizens in all societies. For centuries, universities have taken on, the, on this purpose, conceiving different types of teaching, developing appropriate pedagogical methodologies, and encouraging collaboration with the society. The performance of high education institutions, polytechnic institutes, and universities generate enormous benefits, not only in the qualification of young people, but also increasingly in adults. Distant learning has been one of the modalities used by high education with huge development in recent years. Its main merit results from adjusting to the living conditions of a population that cannot always benefit from physical proximity to high education institutions or that cannot easily reconcile, reconcile studies with the schedule of professional activities. For this reason, all over the world, universities have started uh, organizing programs using distance learning methodologies in Portugal The Universidade Aberta is part of this scope, but other, other high education institutions have also developed specific initiatives in this area. The modality of distance education is particularly interesting in the context of lifelong learning. Within the European Union, about 22% of adults aged between 25 and 64 have an education level below upper secondary level. For Portugal and for the same age group, this deficit is not 22%, but 48%. The effort that will have to be made is enormous, and the role of distance education can be decisive for in overcoming this gap. Within the European Union, an objective was defined that covers all, country, all the countries and which aims at providing learning opportunities that allow 50% of adults to attend a training courses per year, one per year. Distance learning provided by the high education assistance should be responsible for an important, an important component of this aim. An issue, an issue that deserves great attention concern the recognitions of earth informal and non-formal uh, learning activities. These initiatives are lost and uh, are not accounted for in the effort that institutions and countries make towards a better qualification of citizens. An effort should be made to recognize these activities and assign then credits appropriate to their durations and intensity of contacts. The pandemic, which has affected us since the first quarter of, two, of 2020, imposed a reduction in face-to-face -face classes and forced a widespread use of virtual interaction technologies. Through these instruments, it was possible to guarantee contact between teachers and students and in the emergence to continue the training process. The intensity with which those technology were adopted has led to compare and contrast the mechanism of distance education with the practice adopted in the emergency in which we have lived. The differences are substantial. 
covering, in the case of distance education, specific pedagogical models, asynchronous sessions, specific and flexible curricular structures, adaptation to the diversity of students' profiles, more pronounced autonomy, autonomous work procedures, appropriate formative and summative evaluation criteria, and programs evaluation that need using other parameters. At a time when distance education become more dynamic in Portugal, it is important to reflect all these issues, clarify the confusion that can be generated, highlighting the specific values of distance education, associating them with its specific objectives, with its model, with its method, and with its procedure. Moreover, to design an, edu an, edu an education based on the principles of distance learning are ori and orientated toward the diversity of audience who, for various reasons, cannot attend formal education. It is intended that this conference can contribute to redefine the future conceptual and organizational framework of distance education in the Portuguese panorama. The conference addresses the recurrent characteristics of distance education. It will benefit from reflections by international experts with recognized experience in this field of education. To confirm the interest that this topic aroused, the conference admit admitted 1,200 registrations with a special focus in higher education teacher, teacher. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the collaboration of our guests, Liz Meyer from the Open University UK, David Bolt from Deakin University from Australia, Carlo Oliveira, Universidade Aberta from Portugal, Ricardo Meiral from UNED, Spain, and Susan Svatsvek from the College Teacher Coach. Fernando Ramos, who has, who has collaborated with, her, with our agencies until now in these experimental phases of uh, evaluation of distance learning programs, will take a balance of this first year of evaluation. Finally, we'd like to thank the Portuguese Association of Private Higher Education, APESP, the Coordinating Council of Polytechnic Institutes, CISP, and the Council of Portuguese University Rectors, Group, for their willingness to join in the organization of this conference, as well as the Universidade Aberta for its logistical support. Special thanks to the service of the Minister of Science, Technology and Higher Education for providing this beautiful Já está? Ótimo. Então, bom dia a todos, uma vez mais. E vamos dar então início aos trabalhos. Eu penso que já temos online os nossos oradores. Eu começava por também fazer esta apresentação mais em, em inglês, porque para todos nesta língua internacional dos nossos dias nos possam acompanhar. Good morning, Liz. I can see you now. Good morning, everyone. I guess we are ready to start the first panel of the conference. So I'm pleased to introduce you, Dr. Liz Mar. Is that so, Mar? I don't know if you pronounce it like that. That's right. Liz is PVC, Pro Vice Chancellor at Open University. Her responsibilities include the student experience with a major focus on student success. 
Liz has over 30 years of experience in UK agri education with particular interest in lifelong learning and continuing education. She is Vice President of the European Association of Distant Teaching Universities, having served two years as President. Okay, Liz, you have about around 40 minutes to present your paper and after that, we'll still have time to accept two or three questions from the audience. So please, Liz, take the floor, the virtual floor in that case. Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to uh, share my screen so that I can um, present my slides for you. If you would just bear with me. I'm hoping that you're able to see my slides. Yes. I, yeah, I think I can see them. Okay. Uh, so good morning, everybody. And thank you very much indeed for inviting me to speak to you this morning. I'm really sorry that I wasn't able to be there in person and that I won't be able to stay for the whole day. I'm disappointed about that because it looks like a really interesting discussion and you've got some fantastic speakers. Um, so I hope I can start you off in, uh, in, in a satisfactory way. Um, I really did want to be able to attend in person, but as we all know, the difficulties created by the pandemic have made it very, very challenging to travel anywhere. So all of this, the stress of forms and tests and the risks are major barriers now to stress-free journeys, as we know. And I, I mention that specifically because COVID created many barriers for stress-free learner journeys as well, um, particularly in higher education, um, uh, mainly for the traditional sector, but also for some distance learning students. So in this session, I, I want to touch a little bit on um, what we learned from that, uh, from that experience, and what the what the subsequent changes in uh, activities in face-to-face -face universities can tell us about the need for effective e-moderation and mechanisms for monitoring students' learning in a distance and online learning environment. And in doing so, I want to use some examples from the Open University in the UK uh, to illustrate some of the things that I want to share with you today. Um, I thought I'd start by just telling you a little bit about the Open University in the UK, as, as you may not be familiar with it. Um, it is the largest university in the UK, and it operates across all four nations. So it's funded and, and regulated by four different um, governments, um, the Welsh, Irish, Scottish, as well as the English government. And it's been in existence since, since 1969 and it, it was set up as a radical endeavour at the time and we like to think that we are continuing with that radical endeavour. Um, that that endeavour was to ensure that people who wouldn't otherwise have access to higher education would be able to participate. Um, the mission of the university is to be open to people, to places, to methods and to ideas. And we've held true to that mission since our inception. And it's still very much what drives us as an organization. Um, we began as the University of the Air. That was the original name that it was given um, because we made use of existing technologies at the time. So television was one of the ways in which um, the, uh, the materials could be disseminated to students. It was a postal system, so everybody received the materials through the post. Um, they studied from the materials and occasionally met with, um, with a tutor and they can, carried out their assessments from home and undertook exams in a traditional way um, uh, in those early days. Um, we've grown, we've grown hugely. And we are now, um, as I said, the largest in the UK. We have um, between 170 and 180,000 students. Some of those are um, studying with our partner organizations. 
8,000 of them are um, international students. And, and obviously, with such high numbers, you'll appreciate that there is an incredible diversity in our student body. And that's important because it influences what we can do in terms of support, what we need to do in terms of supporting our students and making their learner journeys um, as successful as we can. So one in six of our students has a disability um, and that's around 30,000. That figure is bigger than a lot of actual universities. So it's a very considerable issue in the context of what we do and how we do it. Um, our students are generally mature students, um, adult students, but we're seeing increasing numbers of younger students. So currently around 34% of our students are under the age of 25. Um, many of them come with low qualifications or indeed no prior qualifications. And that is a, a one thing we have to address in terms of how we scaffold the learning for those students. And 26% of our students come from the 25% most deprived areas in the UK. So they come from areas where participation in higher education, studying at university is not traditionally something that happens in those areas. And they uh, additionally have to manage things like um, caring, responsibilities either for family members or for children or for adults and we also have students who are studying uh, members of the armed forces um, people who are studying in prison so I, I guess we we know as much as anybody about what it's like to teach at a distance and particularly um, what it's like to develop online learning and I did just also want to mention, because uh, in, in our introduction, we heard about the recognition of prior learning and, and awarding credit for, um, for experience and for activity that's been taken outside formal settings. We also have um, a, a, a free learning resource called Open Learn, which has short courses. Some of those are badged. Anybody can take those. Um, they don't have to register as a student of the university. And we also um, are joint owners of Future Learn, the, the MOOC platform. And one of the latest initiatives we've undertaken has been exploring how, well, helping students to take their learning from those, those sources, particularly from Future Learn, and to earn credit for those by reflection on their learning through what we call an open box model. So we, we're continuing to innovate in order to ensure that people can participate. Um, as much as possible. Um, this, is, this is just, um, sorry, I've skipped a slide. I just want to, sorry, I clicked too soon. Um, so I, th these images are just to illustrate the, the places in which our students study. Um, I wasn't able to get images of all the places. We do, know, we do know that some of our students actually do their studying in the bath because it's the quietest place they can find in their household. Um, but people can study on the, on the move. We have a, an app called OU Anywhere, so people can study when they're traveling. Um, we only have um, a very few students on campus, and there are postgraduate researchers. And actually, the image behind is our campus, actually. I just thought I'd share that with you. Um, so we have some postgraduate students on our campus, but all other students study at a distance via our virtual learning environment um, with some supplementary printed materials and the support of a tutor who gives feedback on assessment and who hosts online or face-to-face -face tutorials with students. Um, as a result of the pandemic, we moved all of our provision, all of our tutorial provision entirely online. Um, and the added benefits of that were that th those sessions are recorded and they are made available to students after the event. So they can go back to those tutorial um, recordings um, at any time during the course of their, of their module. The students all have electronic access to our library and to special, specialist environments. So we have um, virtual um, laboratories for science, technology, engineering. Um, 
and people, uh, students can conduct virtual experiments via those. And uh, we have a virtual microscope, so there's a um, telescope, sorry, not microscope. Uh, uh, and so we're able to, um, students are able to do much as they would in a face-to-face -face setting, but online in a virtual setting. But it's important to note that for most of our students, um, distance learning is the only way they can study, and very few of them have experience of studying in any other way. And although there are opportunities for students to meet up with others, either virtually, either virtually or face-to-face, -face, study is usually something that they do alone. So I just want to contrast that with the, the traditional approaches um, which we're all familiar with. So students attend lectures very often in large groups, um, probably a little bit more constrained by the by, by pandemic at the moment, but usually in large groups. They might have small group tutorials or one-to-one -one tutorials. They might utilize the equipment in labs. They're usually assessed by combinations of essays or coursework or examination. But in these scenarios, there's always somebody there with the student. It's the lecturer at the front of the room, the tutor working with a small group or an individual, a lab technician who's helping with the use of equipment. And that person or those people are moderating the student's learning. They're welcoming the student. They're explaining how things are going to work. They're putting students into groups with others. They're monitoring their progress. And, and in effect, moderating the entire student learning experience. And this has been the mainstream for centuries um, in higher education and universities. Class sizes might have varied um, from very, very small groups to very large groups. But the guide on the side, if you like, is always part of that experience. But what happens to that process when, for whatever reason, it's not possible to sit alongside your students, or the students are not able to sit alongside each other. What we learned from the pandemic was that students who were used to studying in face-to-face -face settings didn't enjoy the online alternative that they were provided with. And there are some really good reasons for that. Um, in part, it was because they were locked down. And so the experience of going from your bed to your desk is no fun at all, especially for uh, younger students. And the other reason is, I think, because it took a while for some universities to get up to speed in designing material for online learning. In other words, from moving away from the um, basically just replicating what you do in a face-to-face -face environment in an online environment. We know that doesn't work. And so we've been supporting a lot of universities in the UK to help to put their courses online and to develop them. So I'm turning now to the learner journey, and this is a really simplified version of, of what's actually happening. It ha this happens either in a face-to-face -face environment or a distance learning or an online environment. The objective is to help the student learn what they want or they need to know. So in other words, to get from, the, from here, the question mark, to here, which is the um, the light bulb moment going off in, in the student's head. But the problem with distance learning is that it's much harder to be sure that what you're doing is effective. The people who produce the learning materials don't often get to see the student. They don't get to talk to them. And the students themselves don't often see or talk to other students. So design for learning is really, really important. So, oh, again, I'm sorry, I'm clicking too quickly. So, um, most of you, I think, will, or, or, or I think some of you will be familiar with, with this model. It's one of the most well-known models for uh, e-moderation um, created by Julie Salmon. Um, and the five-stage model is designed for online rather than distance learning. So it does assume an intermediary, such as a tutor, but it's not completely reliant on that presence. It's not completely reliant on having somebody present. Some of the development activities that she advocates 
can be delivered through the design of the materials themselves. So I just want to take, uh, take you through this model and to think about the, the, the differences between a face-to-face -face setting and an online setting and how the intervent what interventions need to happen to ensure um, that's that, that learning, that students develop as autonomous learners. So the, the first stage at the bottom is around setting up the system and accessing it. So in a real world environment, in a face-to-face -face environment, you welcome students into the classroom, you show them where everything is, you get them to talk to each other. In the online environment, you need to uh, welcome them, but provide motivation in a very different way. Um, and it's about try helping um, learners to meet each other and to navigate the course. Um, I was I was likening this in my mind to um, to trying to find your way around IKEA. So when you first go into IKEA, there is a there is a pathway marked out for you. I think it's in every store, um, and you have to follow that pathway, and it takes you absolutely everywhere. As you get to know the store better, you can find shortcuts through. But in the first instance, you need that, that pathway showing and sharing with you so that you can you know where to look for the things that you need. So the first process is a little bit like that orientation. And the second stage is when students start to begin to feel like they're part of a community of learners. And I'm going to come back to that issue of community a little later on because it's a really important part of um, the student learning experience particularly in an online and distance uh, context. So, so this next stage is about setting tasks that connect people, um, that give them confidence. So encouraging people to post on discussion boards, for example, uh, encouraging people to interact with each other, perhaps posting questions that students can then answer as a group. The third stage is about information exchange. And this is where um, the student is beginning to interact quite independently or almost independently with community and with the e-moderator, whoever that might be. They're gaining confidence, starting to organise their time effectively. And you can see on the, on the right-hand side of this image, there's the kind of the heat map shows that the level of interactivity increases as you move into those kind of central stages but then can decrease as you move beyond them and students become more autonomous. Um, the fourth stage, knowledge construction. This is where the learner knows where to go to find out more, takes control of their learning. Um, but it's really important that the facilitator, the, the e-moderator, the tutor is able to reach out to people that may be struggling. So being to identify where there are problems that the students are experiencing and making sure that they, can, um, that they can help them in that respect. And then stage five is when the learner becomes very confident, they can reflect on their learning journey, they can apply their knowledge. And, and this is where the, I guess the, the moderator is supporting and responding rather than driving. So that's the that's the uh, that's the five stage model, which uh, has influenced um, very many of the of the uh, online learning experiences uh, that people have, and it's important to to bear this in mind because just putting copies of your PDFs and videos of your lectures online is not going to support student learning in an online or a distance learning environment. But there are other things that we can do as well. So um, I, I want to just move on briefly to talk about how we might monitor learning and particularly how we do that at the moment. So you've designed the course to support the student journey, but how do you actually know that learning is happening? Well, one way you can do that is through assessment. And that's, that's obvious, um, but there are different ways in which you can assess and different ways in which you can check back on the student's learning development. So short, low stakes assessment at the beginning so that people become accustomed 
to the ways in which they're going to be assessed uh, and not be frightened off by having to do a huge piece of work straight away. Using quizzes, um, so little, little quizzes in the text that allow people to check their understanding of the material and they can be automated quite effectively. Um, lots of opportunities for um, feedback. So you don't want to overassess students, uh, but making sure that there's plenty of time for formative assessment in the course materials, which will allow you to feed back to the student on their progress and also to understand how well they're doing is really important. Um, we can expand on that uh, now, and we make quite significant use of um, student learning analytics. Uh, and so we will use the data that we get from their use of the virtual learning environment. We can get data from um, the submission of their assignments or the completion of tasks within that environment. Um, uh, we can um, monitor their attendance at um, online tutorials or online events. We can look at the rates at which they post into forums or discussion boards. We can use all of that data to assess the level of engagement of the learner in their learning. And we can combine that with the, um, with the uh, assessment data that we have um, to estimate the extent to which they're taking on board the, the learning that they need to and the possibilities of their being successful. We can indeed combine that data with all kinds of data about the individual themselves, about their prior educational qualifications, um, about their um, employability, employment status, about their family status, and we can work out probability models which will enable us to identify when we can provide support to the student at the time that they need it. None of this is foolproof. Um, engagement has to be meaningful, uh, but uh, at a superficial level, it's possible to say, well, the student accessed the VLE three times in the last six hours um, and spent this, this length of time on it. But without knowing what they were doing, it's, it's possible that the student has logged on and then done nothing. Um, and so there needs to be um, a, a more, more checkpoints at which to ensure that the student is engaging and we're still working on developing measures to do that. I, I'm reminded of a, a, one of my doctoral students um, was researching learning analytics and she was interviewing some students who were making use of the learning analytics and one particular student had been told that or had heard that the higher the level of engagement the greater their, their livelihood of success and so she used to go on the VLE again and again and again and again in order to get the level of engagement up uh, but actually she wasn't doing anything so the chances of success were not quite so high so we have to be very cautious about that um, but, but learning analytics is a way in which in the future we can really focus on the student learning and, and the student experience. So, I want to just turn to um, some possible futures now. Um, yesterday, I attended a presentation by our technology partners, Infosys, um, and we there, there were some. They were talking to us about how we can take some of the developments that we've made already around student learning even further. So, we've begun to pilot chatbots. Um, for student support using artificial intelligence techniques to identify the most common queries that students and inquiries make so that we can speed up the response that we make to them. Um, we know that many of our younger students prefer to self-serve. They would prefer to go online, fill out forms, interact with chatbots than they would to ring up and speak to somebody. That's fine, but we need to make sure that we have the, the, the right provision in place to support them. So we're looking at, um, at chatbots which will help people to find, uh, find their way around their course, uh, to 
to develop their pathway through their qualification. Uh, we're looking at chatbots who will give simple answers to questions about how you finance, um, uh, how you get your student loan in place, um, how you, uh, what you should do when you start your course, all of those things that you need to know at the beginning. So almost that stage one of the, of the five-stage model, um, we can facilitate through the use of um, artificial intelligence technologies, and we will be increasingly doing that, um, in, in large part to make sure that we can speed up the responses to students and make sure that they get the answers that they need as quickly as they need them. But the next stage of our thinking is uh, to explore how digital tutor, digital assistants could be used as a way of supporting learning at a distance. So our students, many, as I've said, they're stood there in work, they've got caring responsibilities, they might be studying while they're on a um, in, in the armed forces on a, you know, they're away somewhere um, on a submarine. So um, they could be wanting assistance at any time of the day or night. Now, obviously, um, our tutors are very devoted, very committed, um, but they have to sleep and they have to eat and they have to take holidays. Um, and so what we really need is something um, some, some kind of technology that can take the place of that tutor when necessary. Perhaps not, not doing the sophisticated tasks, but at least managing some of the, um, some of the more regular um, issues, such as developing study skills, uh, appropriate study skills, thinking about supporting with referencing, uh, the kinds of activity that, that a tutor um, could leave to a digital assistant in order that they could focus on some of the more um, the more um, higher level needs of our students. Um, as I say, it, this isn't going to eradicate human intervention at all, but allow the tutor to focus more on value added activity. It's been quite a lot of work done um, in different parts of the world. Um, Stanford uh, created something called QuizBot. Um, QuizBot is something that, that um, quizzes students. So it, it'll ask the student a question on their topic. And so the students can ask to be tested on their topic. And, and the QuizBot will um, ask them a question, will give them clues, um, and will we'll help them with their learning. And the evidence suggests that um, those who used it um, saw a 25% increase in student success and that students were spending 2.6 times longer studying with QuizBot than they were studying with the traditional methods. So there's evidence there that, that this is a learning technology which could potentially be extremely useful. We're also um, looking at the, the extent to which things like um, uh, artificial intelligence, extended reality, augmented reality can be built into the, the learning that we're providing students. There are some questions there around the um, around digital poverty and inclusion. Um, we have to be careful that we're not excluding people because they don't have access to the technology or the broadband, but there are ways in which we can enhance learning and enhance the monitoring of learning in a really effective way. So that work is for our future. Um, we've started on it, but we're still in the quite early stages of test and testing and learning. Finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit about creating academic community at a distance. And you might wonder why I'm raising this in the context of moderation and, and assessing students' learning. Uh, this isn't a high-tech example I'm going to show you. It's a combination of existing technologies. It's webcasting, use of social media, online tutorials, all to support student learning and, and engagement in a virtual academic community. So there's a lot of evidence in, in the UK literature in particular, um, and, and I think in, in some of the American literature, about the importance of a sense of belonging and the importance of feeling as if you're part of a, an academic community in order to, to improve retention, so keeping students with you, 
and those students being successful. But a lot of that research work has been carried out in, uh, in a face-to-face -face environment where it's much easier to create an academic community and a sense of belonging because the students are actually there with you. Um, it's harder to get that sense of community in a distance learning environment, particularly and, and in an online learning environment where there's, there's discussion boards and forums, etc., and the possibility of tutor group meetings, but those are a, a few and far between. And finding ways of, of creating that community and removing those feelings of isolation that can lead to dropout are really quite important. So I've just got a video, which I'm hopefully going to be able to show you now. It's just short. Ah, sorry. I hope that... I'm sorry, I think I'm thinking that you weren't seeing that video. Is that right? Liz, we are sorry. seeing a, a letter. Is that that you want to show? Sorry, did, did you see the video? No, 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 not at all. No, okay, sorry, I don't know what, I did test it yesterday, but clearly it's not worked. Okay, um, okay. I can, I can, the, the link to the video is in the slides. So if people could um, perhaps uh, see the slides afterwards, they'll be able to watch the video. I'm sorry about that. Um, I, did, I did test it, as I say, but um, technology always lets you down, doesn't it, at the last minute. Um, but I think I, I just wanted to say about this, uh, about the Student Hub Live, which is um, where we use webcasting and social media to bring students together um, from right across the world, in fact, um, uh, to, for sessions, um, developing study skills, sharing academic content, actually talking and interacting with the academics in our studio. Um, Research by another of my doctoral students showed that students valued not just the opportunity to interact with um, OU staff, but also with other uh, OU students on different programs of study and building communities of interest through shared practices. And there's also evidence that, that learners benefited from these being safe spaces because they're moderated, but less formal than the module communities. So um, in summary, I just want to say that design for learning, I think, is really important. Moving a face-to-face -face course online requires more than video lectures and PDFs and material. The learner has to be guided through the course, but also to, become, to becoming an independent learner. And the course materials have to be structured so that learning is scaffolded effectively. Um, moderation can be built into the course, but it needs interaction, whether that be with a tutor, other students, or a digital assistant, but preferably a combination of those. And I'd also advocate that the academic team who write the course are visible and active within it in some way. Digital learning technologies are developing fast, and these offer the opportunity 
to employ digital assistance, both for support and for learning. Um, I mentioned augmented reality and extended reality. There's also automated assessment, automatic content generation. These are all set to transform the world of higher education and higher learning. Um, on it, just finally, the pandemic, I think, has focused our attention on how we can do things differently and better. So let's not lose that momentum. Our children's futures will be very different to our experience, and we need to prepare them appropriately for it. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Then, as was expected, thanks to your high level of specialization, focus on the student, uh, maybe we can have one or two questions about this subject. So, in the audience, someone wants to put a question to Liz? Or maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Susan, please. Ah, you need a um, maybe. No, no, no. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Susan Zvachak, um, the, uh, the college teaching coach. Um, I would be interested in your ideas about how to balance the moderation and interaction between the tutor and the students in terms of um, engaging the students without the tutor or the moderator really taking on too much of that explaining or so that the tutor doesn't seem to be taking over. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a, a, a good question, and it's important. So, in our, in our existing model, the the, the, tutor, the interaction with the tutor is optional for students. Um, so they they can um, they can contact their tutor if they wish to. They can attend tutorials if they wish to, but they don't have to. Um, what we in, encourage, um, but we do encourage people to interact. We encourage them to interact with each other. So all of our our modules have discussion forums where students can engage in, in discussion around particular issues that uh, emerge during the module, and they're encouraged to do that. So sometimes a tutor will, in their tutor group, they will put a question out which will prompt discussion by the students in the group, but not necessarily mean that the tutor has to keep going in. The important thing is to make sure that there's moderation there in case the, the, in case it goes off track or, or there are, there are things that, that people are saying that are clearly wrong and, and we, need to, we need to correct the, the line of thinking. But it's really important that at, uh, you notice from the five stage model that the, interact, the level of interactivity between the tutor and the students lessens um, the more that they develop as learners. And that's an important element that you have to know when to step back. And, and to let the students develop their own learning and so that they can become autonomous, independent learners. So it's, it's, it's more a case of knowing when and how to do it. Um, and that's the skill of being a moderator in that space, being able to step back. But you're absolutely right. You don't want the tutor to be doing it all the time. The students have to develop those skills themselves. Shall we have another question, please? Alice, uh, nice meeting you. Uh, here is Fernando Ramos from the University of Aveiro and also from the agency. Um, the question I would like to um, uh, put uh, is the, the following. One uh, key issue when you are addressing the digital transformation of uh, higher education, namely traditional higher education institutions, is the teaching staff uh, training. So uh, could you please share with us what is your um, uh, policy about um, uh, training, teaching staff and development uh, staff, uh, staff competencies, namely in the um, uh, distance education uh, field? Thank you. 
Yeah, it's, it, it is. The, the training and development, the learning is really important. So I, I want to address that two ways. First of all, in terms of our um, the, the academic staff community that are developing the materials, um, that there's regular training and updating available for them. Um, there's a lot of scholarship activity, which so we have scholarship networks operating across the university so that people can learn about what's going on, you know, investigate what's happening in the learning context, um, experiment with new, new technologies, new ideas, and then disseminate that experience more widely across the staff body. Um, our, our academic um, associate lecturer community, um, they, they have um, training available when they're new, so in, in how to work in the um, open university online distance learning environment. So understand the VLE, understanding our assessment processes, etc. Uh, so there's training available there. And then there'll be regular training and uh, updating in the um, professional development service that we provide and, and within the university. So it's it, it's there's lots of different opportunities. So it's either direct training um, short courses, online courses for staff, um, or there's um, uh, hands-on possibilities for, you know, face-to-face -face learning. Uh, but scholarship activity is, I think, one of the most important because it's learning from what's happening in the real world, in the student context, and, and thinking about how you feed back in that back in. Some of the technologies that I talked about there are still in, in quite early development. So the, the work around um, augmented reality and the work around um, chatbots and digital assistants, those are in very early stages. Um, and they're, they're being developed by a mixture of our, our, te our technical colleagues and the, and the academic community. Um, and as we develop them further, they will be disseminated widely and people will have the um, opportunity to learn how to use them in the context of, um, of, of developing their courses. It's, it's a really important point. The training and development is, is absolutely critical. It's not something you can just walk in and do. Um, you need to understand how to do it, how to do it well. Another question, Another, uh, the last one, please. Please. Hi, Liz. Um, my question is, uh, how do you foresee the role of a higher education teacher in distance learning? Uh, should teachers be able to produce their own digital education resources, or should teachers uh, uh, focus on the knowledge and rely on technical teams to develop the, the content? Thank you. That's a great question, um, and <laughs> my compromise answer is it has to be a collaboration. Um, I, you know, we, the, the academic has to have a part in producing like the, the content the materials, the way it's delivered for students. That's where the knowledge and expertise is. Um, but being able to ensure that it's delivered in the right way is also really important. So. We have a, a so we have technical teams who do the development of all of the course materials, but they work in collaboration with the academic community. So you, you, we don't separate it out, um, and we're actually working very much now on um, uh, direct authoring, um, which means that there's a, an even closer relationship will will develop between the technical experts and the academic experts, so that the the tech technical support people can support the academic in directly authoring the things that they want to develop for students so it's got to be a collaboration it's got to be a combination and I, I can't see a time where there won't be the role for the academic alongside the technical expert and unless all of our academics uh, suddenly develop all of the technical expertise as well um, which is quite a big ask um, I think we're going to need both sides. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. Uh, it was a pleasure to, to have you with us today. So I think we can move to the next speaker, Professor David Bald. Um, I believe he's with us now. 
Professor Baun has been involved in research and teaching in adult higher and the professional education for over 40 years and has published extensively in the field. He is one of the highest cited researchers in the world in the field of higher education with a current age index of 93. Before his appointment at the University of Technology, Sydney, he was professor and foundation director of the Professional Development Centre at the University of New South Wales. Currently, he is also Alfred Deacon Professor and Foundation Director of the Centre for Research on Assessment and Digital Learning at Deakin University, Melbourne. So please, David, welcome and take the floor. Thank you. Thank you for your introduction. I hope you can hear me clearly and I hope you can see my presentation on your screen. Um, I've just been listening to the last part of Liz's presentation and everything Liz said, I would want to endorse 100%. Um, we are in a time when we need to think about design, 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 design for learning, design for assessment is the major theme that runs through everything, I think, in the distance education space. We're also, I think, at the moment, living in very interesting times. The whole world has been forced into a natural experiment about distance education. Uh, the pandemic has meant that normal classes have had to rush to the online environment. The question is, have we really learnt enough from that? I think one of the things we should have learned is that mostly students were able to cope and mostly teaching staff were able to cope, but what their students experienced was a very, very poor version of distance education. Distance education can be a much higher quality than what we've seen during the pandemic. So what I want to talk about today is um, the assessment and feedback aspects. Um, and before I get into the, the main part of my presentation, I just want to say a bit about my context. Um, unlike the Open University in the UK, which is a fully distance uh, only distance institution, effectively. Um, Deakin University was established over 50 years ago as an equally campus-based and distance learning, so that our staff teach both online and at a distance um, as a normal part of what we do. And it is an, uh, an everyday activity for people to learn for to teach in both of those modes. Not only that, our students don't need to decide which mode they want to study in at the beginning of their course. They can change their enrolment, whether it's in a distance mode or a face-to-face -face mode at their own discretion, semester by semester. So what this means is that we have distance courses and face-to-face -face courses, which are completely and seamlessly equivalent. And that means assessment and feedback is seamlessly an equivalent for students, no matter what mode the student chooses to study in. So what I want to focus today is, I'm going to say a wee bit about the open and distance education context, but my experience at Deakin tells me that the issues to do with assessment and feedback are essentially no different in the face-to-face -face or the distance mode. We've been going through worldwide a revolution in thinking about assessment and feedback in recent years. And those and that thinking applies equally to whatever context we're in, face-to-face -face or online. So what I want to focus on here is what is the problem of assessment? And then I want to focus on what assessment needs to do. And it needs to do different things. There is not a single purpose of assessment. And we have to juggle those different purposes in the way we design our programs. And then I want to touch on the three main purposes. Assessment to assure outcomes. And I want to mention some things about authentic assessment under that heading. I want to look at assessment that enables learning. And under that heading, I want to look at feedback and what I call feedback literacy. 
And finally, I want to look at assessment, which develops students' capacity to make judgments about their own work. It is not good enough for us to be able to judge students' work. When students graduate, they don't go through some miraculous transformation whereby before then they have to be judged by others and after then they judge themselves. So we need to work out how to operate that effectively in our courses. So what have we learned from the distance education? Uh, and what have we learned reinforced by the emerg emergency remote teaching during COVID-19? Now, I was very pleased that somebody coined the term emergency remote teaching because I do not regard what happened in the COVID that most people experienced as real online or real distance education. It wasn't designed well enough for that. And one of the things I think we've learned is that online distance learning needs to be designed very well. Design, design, design in all matters is the theme we need to focus on. The other thing I think we've learned is that synchronous teaching may be overrated. When we translate from the classroom to online, we assume that teachers and students need to be present at the same time. But we've learned having to deal with students in multiple time zones, and we've learned through having to deal with students that have other responsibilities in their lives, that one of the real conveniences of distance education is that students do not have to be there at a fixed point in time at a particular day of the week. The other thing we've learned, and I think we've learned it very bitterly through COVID-19, is that we need our learning activities both at a distance and on campus to be much more involving and much more interactive. Students will not want to go back to going to campus and sitting in large lectures being talked at. We've made a step change in, away from that and we need to think about the implications of that both for campus and for distance. And of course, the other thing that we've, we've noticed, which has been given a big acceleration, is the move away from the traditional closed book, time-limited examination. So there's been a proliferation of other modes of assessment, which I'll pick up later. So what is the problem of assessment, essentially? Well, the problem we have is that assessment needs to satisfy many purposes, but it doesn't meet any of them well, or it often doesn't meet them well. First of all, it doesn't represent the kinds of tasks that students will be engaged in after graduation. There are some things that only appear in the world in educational courses during assessment. These events, these activities, these tasks have no relationship to what people do in society. And I think that's a problem for us. Another problem for us is that at the moment, when we do these exercises in mapping the curriculum, which is one thing we have to do now, I mean, certainly in Australia, we have to look very carefully at where learning outcomes are being pursued, where they're being assessed, how they're being assessed, and so on and so forth. What we discover time after time is that some learning outcomes are excessively assessed. Knowledge, knowledge, knowledge is over-assessed and all the other outcomes of higher education tend to be under-assessed. And the other thing we find about assessment at the moment, it doesn't help students to judge their own performance. And that I want to uh, come back to later is a key part of higher education. So what does assessment, research on assessment tell us over many, many, many years? First of all, assessment gives a message to students about what we really value. Students learn very early to discount what we say, to discount what we write down. They learn to regard what we put in our value above all else. And if our assessment is not the most perfect representation of what we care about most, we are doing it wrong. We also know that assessment encourages rote learning. 
and particularly the form of uh, tests and examinations we have, reinforce rote learning, and in the process discourages deep approaches to learning. We also know that assessment distributes, distributes student study time very poorly over the semester. So before a test, student activity goes up, after the test, it drops down. And depending on how we've scheduled the assessment over time, we get this very, very lumpy learning profile from students. We know assessment inhibits cooperation and collaboration between students because they are afraid of being accused of cheating. We also know that assessment overemphasizes some skills. It overemphasizes handwriting ridiculously because most students don't engage in a great deal of handwriting now uh, and at the expense of others, like communicating verbally. And of course, we know it distracts students from the object of study through a focus on marks and grades. So this is my way of summarizing what assessment always needs to do. The first thing it needs to do, and it, we are required to do this by our institution and sometimes by law, is to assure that learning outcomes have been met. If we say you enroll in this course and you'll meet these learning outcomes, we have to assess those learning outcomes. And that is what we used to call summative assessment. Another purpose of assessment is that it enables students to learn now. It helps them prepare for meeting the learning outcomes and to prepare for those final judgments about them that we um, record and put on their transcript. And the other thing that assessment always needs to do is to build students' capacity to judge their own learning. It doesn't matter whether a student knows a lot, if they don't know what they know, they're not very useful. <clears throat> so let's take each one of those in turn. Let's look at assessment for assurance. So after a lot of work from the OECD, right the way around the world in all the uh, developed countries, learning outcomes have become the major currency by which we describe what students will be able to do. And their public statements about what a student necess necessarily needs to do to successfully complete a course. They represent academic standards in terms of what students' performance needs to be. Learning outcomes are specified both at the high level for the whole program and at the course unit level for what goes on within a particular subject. And they have serious consequences. If we state them, we need to assure them. And in some areas, let me just give a little quote from Australia. We are required by law to say that if we specify a learning outcome, we need to assure that it has been met at the minimum level. If we don't do that, then our universities are at risk of losing their accreditation. So if we declare an outcome, we need to assure it. But in many countries, we were already starting to see the problems associated with learning outcomes and assessment. And students were starting to take legal action saying, you declare this course had these learning outcomes. I studied, I wasn't given the opportunity to meet these learning outcomes and I wasn't assessed on them. I want my money back or something else. So let's now look at what assessment is within the context of learning outcomes. So I've said that it's about judging whether students can demonstrate whether they met a learning outcome to a given standard. And that means we must establish a transparent standard for every assessment task. And of course, setting a pass mark is not setting a standard. A pass mark is a relatively arbitrary and flexible and variable item whereas meeting standards is not flexible, not variable. 
set in a general set of standards for a core school unit is not enough. And the really serious implication we have in a framework of standards is students cannot compensate for not doing well on a particular learning outcome by doing well on another. So when we traditionally had an examination or a test and we averaged the marks to produce a single passing mark or a mark for higher grades, then what we were doing, we were averaging over different learning outcomes. This is not legitimate. You cannot add together marks and grades from different learning outcomes. And of course, the other implication of this is that norm referenced uh, assessment is prohibited. And by norm reference, I mean when students are judged against each other. This is outlawed now. Now, it's taken a long time for my colleagues in many universities to realize this, but that is the case. So what else drives us? Well, this quote is from a few years ago now, but I think it captures something important from students and the cartoon illustrates this well. So students perceive traditional assessment tasks as arbitrary and irrelevant. They only aim to learn for the purposes of the particular assessment with no intention of maintaining the knowledge for the long term. Is this true of your students? Are they learning just to pass the test? If that is what they're doing, then we have got assessment completely wrong. One of the big themes that's uh, been occurring in recent years is this move towards having authentic assessment. So why does assessment need to be authentic and what does authentic assessment look like? Well, what was the problem that authentic assessment solves? Well, it solves the problem in that last quote. Students don't see the point of what they're learning. They see assessment as an artificial exercise which is not meaningful to them. They see assessment as not aligning with the world outside. It doesn't align with what they're going out and doing later. They don't see, see the program learning outcomes are ignored at the expense of individual staff members' favorite subject matter. So we organize assessment around course units or subjects. We don't organize assessment around the program as a whole. But of course, now we are seeing many examples, particularly in medicine, which is leading the way in programmatic assessment of looking at uh, meeting the needs of the program as a whole, not just the individual subjects. And of course, on a very practical matter, assessments are uninterested to take and boring to mark, or they can be. So what is authentic assessment? So authentic assessment tasks and items have realism. So there's the kind of look and feel of something real about what students are asked to do. They can see how it might link with everyday life and work. Authentic tasks are contextualized. So they're not abstracted in a way that we often do, but they're set in a particular context and environment. Authentic assessment tasks address real problems. So what is learned can be used to solve a problem or meet a need. And this, a focus on authentic assessment means that it's very engaging to students and students tend to take authentic assessment tasks more seriously than others. And of course, one of the key features of an authentic task is that it is not just there for the point of view of the people, the person who's going to mark the assignment. So authentic tasks have some purpose beyond the exercise itself. An authentic audience aids the construction of an authentic task. So rather than asking a student to write an essay, you ask them to write a report about a particular issue for a particular person in the community who needs to do something about it. So by setting the context and the frame around tasks, we can locate them 
in a way that students find more meaningful. And of course, in some cases, and I've got colleagues in, in media studies at the moment, um, they actually use real audiences. So students produce things and they post them online and they get a reaction from whoever can access the online environment. And I don't mean within the university learning management system, I mean in the public internet. Now, authentic assessment isn't an absolute. So we can talk about moving in an authentic direction. It's not a place we'll ever get to. And it's not a place that we really want to get to fully because real problems are often so messy and so complicated that it's inappropriate to bring them into the university. So we have an interesting tension. We've got to bring enough of the reality in, but not make it so complex that students get bogged down in things which are, which may be irrelevant. And of course, we've got two ways of approaching this. We can either take our existing assessment tasks and ask ourselves, how can we make them more authentic? But I much prefer the alternative, which is to go out to the world of practice and use authentic examples there and adapt them to the course. And for authentic assessment, we need to look at the artifacts that students produce. Are they realistic artifacts? Do they meet a need? Do they reflect what a practitioner will do? And of course, the issue is, can conventional tests and examinations be authentic? Well, you can have authentic exams and tests. And I've written a paper with some colleagues in Chile about this but it's only with great difficulty. We really do need to change some of our testing systems in order that assessment should more generally be more realistic. So let me look at the next um, theme, which is assessment to enable learning. <coughs> and one of the big things in this area is the process of feedback. And there's been a major, major shift internationally in the way feedback is conceptualized over the last eight years. And it's moved from thinking about feedback as something that teachers do. Teachers make a comment on students' work, and that's feedback, to a learning-centric view, which means students receive information from others and they act upon it to improve their work. And in concepts of feedback now, unless the input that comes from other people leads to a worthwhile effect, that is improved student learning, then feedback itself hasn't really occurred. All that's happened is hopefully useful information has been brought to students' attention. Unless students use it, we can't really talk about it as feedback for learning. Now, I was involved in a very large um, national project in Australia looking at um, feedback and, and, and addressing the question, what does really good feedback look like? Now, we thought when we started, we could just go to the literature and find a nice definition of feedback. But when we went there, we were dismayed that the definitions of feedback weren't very useful at all. So we had to come up with our own. And this is what it, we came up with. Feedback is a process. It's a process. It is not just an input. It is not just information. It's a process in which learners make sense of information. They have some information, which perhaps we give them, or perhaps they get it from somewhere else. But it's information about their particular performance. They have to do something, and they need to get information about what they have done and they need to use that to enhance the quality of their work or the learning strategies that they're engaged in. And I'd like to direct your attention to this um, website that's, that's listed there, feedbackforlearning.org. And we've got a huge amount of resources about feedback and what good feedback looks like. And of course, this is not feedback. Of course, you don't do this in distance education anymore. 
we don't see paper because all assignments are now electronically submitted, or at least I assume they are with you, they are with us. One of the things we did on this project is that we did a survey of students and we got over four and a half thousand responses, which is interesting in itself because students are really interested in doing, getting feedback done well. And what we did is we asked them to list the course or the course unit where they had the very best experience of feedback in their whole university experience. And then we collected these together and we ranked them in terms of which were the units that students said were the very best in doing feedback. And we assembled them and we then went along and we did case studies of exactly what was working that students said was good feedback. And if you go to our website there, feedbackforlearning.org, you can see these case studies. I think we've got seven or nine case studies. But we decided to make things hard for ourselves. So we didn't look at small courses. So in small courses, we ruled them out because it's so easy to do feedback well if you've got a small class of 50 students or so. In our case studies, we've got at least three examples where the enrollment of students is greater than a thousand. So we can show through these examples how you do feedback, both face-to-face -face and at a distance um, really well with large numbers of students and to get really high quality feedback. And for example, one of our examples is about the person responsible for the overall class has a team of tutors and she moderates the quality of the feedback information to the, from their tutors, not just moderating their marks. So she ensures that all the tutors give really high quality feedback. And she uses that through um, audio feedback. So the other thing that we're seeing a lot of now, again, both in distance and in face-to-face -face mode, the use of audio and video feedback. And that's been taken up greatly because one, after initial difficulty, it's easier to do and it saves time and you get a much better quality of information and a much better relationship with the students. So key points about feedback, Feedback is one of the very few ways in which courses are tailored to the individual student. Most of the things we do, we treat all the students absolutely equally. And that is not good because we know students are different from each other. So we do need to help to recognise that students have different needs and need to be responded to differently. We need to think about feedback processes and the giving of students comments is only a part of the feedback process. Unless students are very actively engaged, feedback can't influence learning. And unless students can demonstrate what they've learned from feedback, feedback isn't complete. So one of the things we need to think about in design is that there need to be activities early on in the semester where students produce work, they get information about their work, but they then have an opportunity to do something with it. We don't just say, well, one day you might have the opportunity to do this again. We design the program so that for the really important things, students do get to practice and do it, get, do it again. And we must always judge feedback in terms of its effect on student learning, not on the quality of the comments themselves. This is just a an advertisement for a couple of books that I've been involved in on feedback while I have a glass of water. By the way, there's a, there's a whole lot of references at the end. So when you get the slides, you can uh, access the references. Now, one of the really important distinctions which it's, which it's necessary to make is the confusion that people have between marking and giving feedback. And this paper I've done with uh, Naomi Winston from the University of Surrey in the UK, distinguishes very carefully between mark justification, 
So you mark a piece of work and you grade it. And you give some justification why has that grade been given using a rubric or some other um, uh, standard form. But also we need to think about what feedback information we provide. Now, mark justification is always backward looking. It's always looking back at what students have already done because we're marking them on what they've already done. Feedback is about students doing something better in the future. So feedback is always essentially forward looking. We don't need the word feed forward because that, if you use the word feed forward, it means you don't understand what feedback is. But feedback information focuses on comments about what students can do to improve their work. So that when students get their work back in a formative context, they need both the marks and the justification of the mark, but also, and this is what they often don't get, is they need feedback information about where can I take it from here? How can I get better? Um, now I'm going to kick this as a jump over this slide. And, and this is a challenge. When you, when, if you want to follow up and look at the slides later, I challenge you to look at this list of feedback strategies and implement some in your course. And I suggest that you will get a significant improvement in the quality of students learning if you follow some of these strategies. But that's a little tease and I'm gonna go on and talk about feedback literacy. Now, in order for students to be actively involved in feedback and for them to use feedback information well, they need to be literate in the understanding of feedback. They need to understand it and how it operates. And David Carlos from the University of Hong Kong and myself um, developed this notion of feedback literacy. And we defined it as the understanding capacities and dispositions needed by students to make sense of information and to use it to enhance their work or their learning strategies. So we identify that they need to understand what feedback is. They need to understand that feedback isn't just the comments that staff make about their work. They also need to understand that feedback is about making judgments and then making judgments about the information they receive. They also need to focus on how do they handle the emotional impact of feedback information, which they can often, you know, it can often be very burdensome and can be very off-putting. And they need to understand how they can take action on the basis of feedback information. <coughs> Now, in subsequent work, we've actually developed a whole framework of and identified what are learner feedback literacy competencies. So we're asking ourselves, if we wanted to identify whether a given student was feedback literate or not, what would we notice about them? And now we've gone on to develop a, an instrument which uh, measures feedback literacy, which we're in the process of starting to uh, roll out. And these are three elements of how you build, build feedback literacy into a course. And the things we're focused on here is how do students elicit feedback information? And one of the really useful strategies is to get students to say what they want. How can we encourage students to process information through course design? And how, how can we encourage them to enact that in their future work? Now, of course, we've been talking here about student feedback literacy, but it's become very apparent to us that teaching staff, uh, professors and instructors need to develop feedback literacy too. And we need that feedback literacy both to design our courses and the design assessment and feedback, but also to conduct it on a micro basis. On a given assignment, how does feedback work there? And again, we've got a framework uh, that helps identify what are the features of teacher feedback literacy. So the final thing I want to focus on, and I'm actually gonna do this very quickly because of time, is to talk about 
develop an evaluative judgment. And if students can't judge the quality of their work, how can they learn effectively? If students can't judge the quality of their work, how can they practice effectively? How can they work in the world? And we've defined evaluative judgment as the capacity of anyone to make informed decisions about the quality of their own work and that of others. And you might say, well, surely we do this anyway um, in our courses. And the answer is yes, we do it, but often it's not explicit or systematic. Often it is just distracted by the fragmentation of the curriculum. So in one unit, it gets developed, it's not taken up in another, another unit. And many of our conventional assessment practices inhibit it. They give students the message that it's only other people that can make judgments about your learning. Where students need to appreciate they are the ones that need to primarily make judgments about their own learning and they should be using the judgments of others to inform their own judgment. And these are two of the key components. Students need to understand notions of quality and they need to make comparisons. Is their work matching this notion of quality? So some of the strategies that we use in developing evaluative judgments is getting particular kinds of feedback information, engaging students with models and exemplars, uh, discussing standards, discussing criteria, and so on and so forth. And we've got um, useful resources which you can just download online about developing evaluative judgment. Now, I'm going to finish here um, in order to give some room for some questions. So the message is the same message that uh, Liz gave earlier about design. Assessment and feedback must be deliberately designed to have a continuing positive effect on student learning. It is not good enough that we use assessment only to judge students. We need to judge them in such a way that we equip them to make better judgments for themselves. So students must be able to use standards and criteria for themselves and with each other. And we need to develop students' capacity to judge their own work because every other outcome is dependent upon that. And at the end of the day, students are equipped for the future, not primarily through specific knowledge and skills, but through their capacity to make informed decisions about their own work. Thank you. Thank you, David, for such a clear presentation, focus on quality of assessment, introducing very interesting concepts like feedback. Of course, probably you feel the same I do, that in a certain way, we find your remarks universal, both for face-to-face -face and open and distance learning. We need to embed that concepts in the, in the distance learning concepts. And I will open the debate if anyone wants to pose a question to David. Thank you so much, David. No one? Oh, I've got something to say while somebody thinks about their question. I, I have a question. question. Oh, you have a question. Okay. I will save my remark. Let's okay. Carry on. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Pedro Cabral from uh, the Portuguese MOOC platform. Um, my question in here could be or seems a little bit naive, uh, but uh, what I wanted to know what, what type of strategies could we provide to massive groups? Uh, regarding authentic assessment, because uh, uh, if we think about an exam and you uh, and a final exam, uh, probably the students will feel that feedback is not that relevant because they finally they had their final grade, so they don't worry much more about uh, wh what is done. They they finish what they wanted to have that final grade for the certificate. 
So, so my question in here, it's, and I'm reinforcing it, it's what type of strategies can we have for feedback when we are thinking about uh, massive groups? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I think one of the things that um, you're also touching on there is the issue of when is feedback, when is a good time to give feedback? And the answer is, it is a very bad time to give you at the end of the course or the end of semester. So my view is you only do mark justification for final assignments, for final examinations. All you need to do is justify the mark. Feedback needs to occur early on and it declines over time. Summative assessment, um, assessment for assurance builds up over time and by the end, it's almost exclusive. So we need to think differently about these two notions of assessment. One starts high and dro drops off, and one starts low and builds up. Now, in terms of large classes, um, see, my view is um, you just treat large classes as if they're aggregations of small classes. Now, one of the things that we do in Australia is that the unit of resource for distance students is exactly the same as face-to-face -face students. So we don't have the problem of servicing um, with inadequate resources our distance students because the, the, the funding model means that we get exactly the same income to the university no matter what mode the students are studying in. So basically, when you do things with a large group, you just give them an authentic task. Um, let me give you an example. In one of those case studies that I mentioned on our website, um, it's a first year psychology um, subject on um, health behavior. And the authentic task that the lecturer gives the students, and it runs right through the year, is they have to change their own behavior in health. They have to, they have to undertake some exercise, they have to look at their diet, they, 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 um, whatever an appropriate health behaviour is for them. And each individual student is judged on the change in their own individual behaviour. And what happens is that they report on this at a number of different points in time, and tutors give them feedback on their report on their health behaviour through audio feedback, not through writing, and the students use that to further change their own behavior. Now, the person who teaches this subject is an extraordinary teacher. And she's an extraordinary teacher because not only does she give this as a task to her students, she gives it as a task to herself. So she changes her health behavior every time she teaches this. And she reports to the students on how well she's doing. So this is an example of an authentic assessment. It's so authentic, it is embodied in the physical body of the students. So we can think of other authentic assessments, which are, are rather less <laughs> extreme than that. Uh, but that's one example. More questions? Unless you don't have... Oh, can I make my comment then? Okay. So, David, probably it's very, very late in Australia now to keep uh, with us. And so I will close the session and uh, I will invite everybody to coffee. To ah, okay, David, do you want to, to make a comment? Uh, yes, just, just finally. There's a wonderful irony about this conference. This is a conference about distance learning, which is not designed for distance learners. So where is the opportunity for people at a distance participating now to post their questions? So it enables me to give an illustration that's embodied in the very activity we're engaged in right now that says we have to change our thinking about design. And it means we have to change our thinking everywhere. So we can't allow our distance learners to have any less quality of experience 
than those that are physically present. So that's something we can take away with and run with. Thank you. Bom, vamos, vamos continuar. Uh, tenho agora o prazer de vos apresentar uh, a professora uh, Carla Oliveira. Uh, I will speak in English also, I think. It's better? Ok. Um, now, uh, thank you, thank you very much for coming and uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Uh, Carla Oliveira is uh, currently uh, director of Open University in Portugal, uh, where she has been for more than two decades, uh, during which she carried out other management roles. Uh, Carla holds a PhD in chemical engineering from Imperial College London, uh, and her main areas of research interest have been the, f the field of exper experimental thermodynamics. But now, Carla has been involved also in coordinated distance education and training programs uh, aligned with sustainability development goals, namely the doctoral program on social sustainability and development. Carla, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Um, and I will start by uh, congratulating the organizers <clears throat> Sorry for choosing this topic that nowadays assumes particular relevance. Uh, allow me also to uh, acknowledge the invitation to, to talk about pedagogical models in distance education uh, context. Uh, as it has been said, I'm currently director of uh, Universidade Aberta, the Portuguese uh, Open University, which was founded 30 odd years ago. Uh, and since then, higher education pedagogical models, teaching strategies, learning outcomes, and student-centered approaches have been at the core of our activity and concern. All these are um, concepts that we've been uh, listening about uh, this morning. And 15 years ago, uh, following the extensive integration of uh, ICT, information technologies, in teaching and learning, we have at the Universidade Aberta developed and implemented a virtual pedagogical model that has been fully adopted since 2007, 2008. And since then, the necessary adjust, adjustments and improvements, both from the pedagogical point of view and uh, technological, have been uh, introduced. So today, and um, for such a, a diverse audience here in the room and uh, following us online also, and after the presentations of Liz Mars and uh, David Baud, and I'm really pleased to know that we share similar beliefs and uh, viewpoints. I will attempt here to introduce some uh, key ideas about pedagogical models in distance education and the lessons that at Universidade Aberta we also have learned over the years and with the application of our own pedagogical model. I will try uh, and have some provocative uh, remarks with the purpose, uh, above all, of encouraging to think more practically about distance education. And so, what is the importance uh, and significance of a pedagogical model for distance higher education? Why is it needed and what for? Especially uh, in a sector, the higher education sector, that is predominantly very traditional and where distance education has been seen as uh, an outlier. A lot has been said and written for the past two uh, decades about uh, digital era, digital transformation, uh, and all this led also to the transformation of the educational uh, offer and pedagogical models. Um, let's recall the Bologna process where the concept of learning outcomes that we, we heard about it uh, previously, uh, was adopted and proposed in the areas of knowledge, skills, attitudes and competencies, triggered this change, particularly in Portugal. 
And these main uh, inceptions are also strengthened through the adoption of digital technologies uh, and tools also, namely the concepts and practices of student-centered learning, cooperative and collaborative activities among students and self-learning capacities when and where it is supported. But quality of learning and achievement of outcomes remains the primary goal of higher education. And usually, quality of students um, learning, quality of students learning is determined by three uh, major factors. The content, the effective teaching, and the rigorous assessment. So, online uh, education, it's very, it's quite different from the conventional uh, university education in many ways, namely the format with implications on the structure of the course, the learning environment processes, the instructional resources and activities which have implications on the content presentation and the student objectives and expectations including attitudes, learning skills and interaction between the different actors. And in addition, distance education can also be identified with a loss of the role of the lecture in synchronous context because there is no um, close uh, interaction with the students uh, to ex explain some topics. There's also a, a sense of loss of, improve, of uh, improvised face-to-face -face interaction and contact between students themselves and between the student and the teachers, and also the loss, uh, the perception of the loss of uh, the verbal, non-verbal language that we all can see in the classrooms. And all these dynamics, they have to be replaced by uh, narratives, activity development, and teachers' ability to design, and again design, learning paths for uh, students. Moreover, online education, and this has been said here today also, is substantially different from what Dom you have experienced with the emergency remote teaching. This was a temporary shift of instructional delivery to an alternative delivery model, delivery mode, sorry, based on the medium and not on the pedagogy. The primary purpose of this shift was not to create a robust educational system but to provide temporary access to education and instructional support. But we should take stock of what we have learned over the past two academic years and what lessons can be brought forward. And of course, the overall perception now is that distance education and the challenges associated to it. And one of these main challenges is in the change in the pedagogy or moving towards a student, effective student-centered and social constructive approaches. So, back to the pedagogical models. Uh, many uh, great minds uh, contributed to the development of pedagogy of, as a science. And one of them, uh, Jerome Brunner, in 1999, so last century, stated that pedagogy is a science that makes educators aware of different teaching and learning standards and strategies which guide what, to, do, to whom, how, and when to teach. So pedagogical models, they provide the foundations for online education as they ensure consistency across different educator perspectives, beliefs, approaches, and objectives. They create a framework from which the guidelines for organizational purposes are derived. They provide the standards that guide educators when building activities, design assessments, provide feedback, and moderate their online environments. The absence of a pedagogical model or a framework can lead to situations where technologies and different tools surpass the pedagogy and online education becomes characterized only according to the technologies they use. And the research shows that effective online learning requires or is a result of careful instructional design and planning which involves decision 
on variables uh, such as the modality, whether we're talking about fully uh, online, blended with different percentages, or web-enabled face-to-face, the pacing, self-paced, class-paced, both self and class-paced, online communication, asynchronous, synchronous, or a blend of both and in what uh, percentage, the teacher's role, the student's role, uh, whether it's a, a read-only or a read-mainly course or problems, uh, complete problems, answer questions, and the class size, meaning the student-teacher uh, student ratio. And to make things a bit more intricate, each one of these decisions, they have a strong implication on different and on the other variables and also decisions. For example, the target population, if we think about the target population, which are, uh, has to do with the learner's uh, characteristics, the, this will define or it will help to define the type of communication. Flexibility is crucial for working uh, adults and therefore asynchronous activities are usually more appropriate for this type of population. Class size. Uh, it will, this is a great constraint for the type of strategies that we use or that we design and also it has a strong financial implications on the whole structure. Uh, and of, of course this impacts also in the feedback that the teacher gives to uh, the student as we uh, heard previously. The interaction, it's also important because interaction is between the student, uh, student content, student student, student teacher. So this is, has to be cons considered when designing and properly integrated within the course uh, design. And this shows that online teaching and learning requires carefully planning and it's now uh, defined or considered uh, uh, a design science, as Diane Lorillard put it in 2012. And those that are here and that are listening to us that have built online courses know that this is a complex ecosystem that involves instructional aspects, organizational aspects, support systems for learners, support systems for teachers, social resources, and many, others, uh, many other uh, items. But teacher's role is uh, paramount in distance education and it does not fade away. On the contrary, it is emphasized as pedagogical aspects are more highlighted as we can already uh, understand from what we've been listening and uh, from what I've said previously. But nevertheless, I think it's important that we uh, reflect and we look into our own, at our own sector, the higher education. And I think we all agree that in Portugal, higher education, uh, higher education teachers are mostly of uh, older age. I don't want to say older age, but we are. <laughs> but it's true, we are all <laughs> burdened with uh, uh, traditional teaching, uh, often not very welcoming of new technologies, and we prefer to stay with what we know. So formal, ped formal pedagogical training as it is expected in the UK, as we, we heard Liz Mars saying, as in, the, in Australia, is not widely accepted among us. Uh, and it's not an institutional culture also that recognizes excellency in pedagogical science. Academics, we have our own practices and teaching models, and usually it's a teacher-centered uh, model of teaching. So this change is also a challenge, a cultural set challenge that faces all the traditional institutions when they engage with distance education. And similarly, as we, we heard previously, assessment is also an issue and it, we are not taking advantage of what learning technologies can bring to promote more authentic and engaging assessment that both assesses knowledge, skills and attitudes and competencies. So, at uh, Universidade Aberta two decades ago, as I mentioned, we uh, trans totally transformed uh, because we, we were created as a distance learning institution. We, we, 
last century, 1988, when we started, we had a massive um, model. So as it was very similar to what uh, Liz said at the Open University, we had the books and it was mainly written. So two decades ago, we changed completely and we, start, we de developed our pedagogical model. Uh, we started a cultural transformation within the institution, even if we were, and we are still uh, a, a young, sort of a young institution, we had to do also a cultural transformation we, inside, and we had our own pedagogical model that we integrated in all our courses. And that influenced not just the pedagogy, but our own identity as an institution, our culture, our process and procedures, as well as the students, obviously. And the model comprehends the activity of teachers, the students and support staff, as well as the availability of the necessary technological uh, resources. And the model is based on the, the four um, cornerstones that uh, I identified there. Student-centered learning, where the student is an active individual builder of his own uh, knowledge, engaged and committed to uh, its own learning process and with the learning uh, community. Learning happens both through self-learning and self-reflection, as well through dialogue and interaction with the teachers and with the, the, the peers. Flexibility, and flexibility uh, is seen as um, the original uh, matrix of the distance education. This is students can learn where and when they see fit, regardless of distance and time constraints. Moreover, the, uh, the profile of the Universidad de Berta students, they are adults with professional, family, and civic responsibilities. So, although the modern technologies and the current technologies, they provide means for synchronous uh, communication, the adopted model and the model that we still have in place uh, is predominantly on a based on the synchronous technologies and interaction. Interaction, again, it's one of the, the principles um, and it's, we, we take it very, very serious because it implies a very, a, a careful design, um, a careful planning of all the course and all the activities. Um, because of the interaction strategies, they, um, they are at the core of the design, of the instructional design, depending on what we intend to achieve with the course, depending on the scientific areas, obviously, and it, it, our main goal is to stimulate students' initiatives, students' uh, involvement, and to ensure engagement with the, the learning process and in, with the, the nature of the work we are, uh, or they are de developing. It is also important to emphasize that the value of written interaction um, combined with the synchronous modes of uh, communication st helps students to develop the critical reflection skills uh, while sharing resources, activities, and uh, knowledge with, uh, with their peers. Digital inclusion, it's uh, also um, a pillar of, this, uh, of our model and it is perceived as making a sex av access available to adults who want to program in higher education institution but have not yet developed the necessary skills to engage in a course. And that's why uh, all our uh, courses uh, we have, uh, prior to the enrollment, we have a two weeks uh, certified program, uh, which is introductory module where new students, they acquire and they get more familiar with the skills necessary for uh, the communication and for studying uh, online. So these are the principles that support uh, the pedagogical practice at uh, Universidad Aberta and guide the whole organization in their teaching, in their planning of the activities, in the designing the, the courses, management of activities of the students, the type of materials we, de, we develop, and obviously the nature of the, the assessment uh, also. So this, uh, this approach uh, promotes or should promote reflection of what is learned with prior knowledge and allowing also for self-regulation through the establishment of individual goals, of students' individual goals and strategies, 
providing them with personalized feedback and self-assessment uh, instruments uh, also. So it is um, therefore uh, essential to define in each learning activity the um, expected learning outcomes, what it's the, what's the role of the student, how long they have to perform the activities, and what tools should they use to, to achieve those, uh, those goals. So look briefly into uh, some of more uh, practical aspects of what I call the, the, the ecosystems and what we have at the uh, Universidad Aberta. We have a, a, virtual, uh, a virtual campus, which is a, a multi-purpose area where the students uh, interact with the uh, Universidad Aberta in all aspects of the academic path, the administrative, pedagogical, um, social, cultural. So this is the, the, the door, the entrance of the, the universities and everything happens through this uh, virtual campus where after they can get and they follow their own, uh, their own path. The other um, important, very important area is the course uh, organization and the, the teaching work, which comprises a, a, a course guide uh, that supports all the informed decision and it, it will help students to, to, it will help them to decide about which training path to, to follow or to choose. So they will have all in the course guide, they have the general information about the course, uh, about the course organizations, the assessment, the teaching team, and then I'm going from the more general to the more specific. Then they go into the course unit plan, which for online students, uh, it's a, a very important tool because through this they manage their own study and their own learning path and uh, strategy. So that's where they have all the, the, the feedbacks, all the marks, it's through all this uh, uh, course unit plan. Then they have also, the teaching team and the, the, the teaching team, which is a teacher, a lecturer, and when needed, there is also tutors uh, involved, as uh, it's uh, quite similar to what uh, Open University UK has also. We have the, the, tutor, the tutors when, when it's needed, so there is rules. Uh, we don't always have tutors. Um, and the teachers, not the tutors, the teachers are straight involved in the design, the plan of the course unit. The tutors, they are only supporting when the, uh, there is an enormous number of students and then they go into supporting the, the students, the, the learning process. And then we have also a course coordination. And the course coordination, uh, it's a, a small team, one or two, uh, two or three people, uh, which coordinate the teacher from the pedagogical uh, point of view, monitors also uh, the, the students, uh, supervises some administrative support to, to students, monitors projects and actively participate in the quality assessment of the course which is done uh, every, every year. The learning, uh, the learning uh, methodologies, which um, it was also here uh, briefly uh, uh, addressed, and uh, the current digital environments, um, they are very prone for uh, active learning, new active learning methodologies, which imply new roles for students, for teachers, new roles for teachers, and also new uh, mediating tools. And with the, within the learning methodologies, we can have the problem-based learning, the project-based learning, the case-based learning. There is an enormous uh, different uh, tools and methodologies that we, that we can use, depending, and they are chosen, or they should be chosen, depending on what we intend to achieve. So, uh, therefore, the pedagogical training of the, the teachers um, the, the knowledge of the, the new methodologies, the very well-defined goals and outcomes for each course, it's very important So because it's based on that that we can choose the, the, the methodologies. And as, as it was said previously also by, by Liz, this is done not individually, so there are teams 
uh, to help people. It's not uh, every or each uh, lecturer individually that decides on everything because obviously there is an enormous amount of uh, different uh, uh, areas involved and we have teams to, to support this uh, sort of uh, uh, decisions. We have again the collaborative methodologies which are also uh, crucial for developing critical thinking and appropriation uh, of knowledge and consolidation skills uh, associated also to, with uh, cooperation and different uh, relationships uh, uh, depending on the, um, the outcomes of the, the courses and also on the scientific areas and also another uh, strategy that we, we have in place for different courses and a bit more advanced because required require uh, advanced skills, it's the uh, multimodal technologies where um, which is used or which are used f to create processes and they use video or audio or multimedia uh, to uh, in integrate it, all integrated within the learning uh, environment and uh, to, with the, the learning activities that uh, we intend to, to, to achieve. Usually we use this sort of uh, multimodal te technologies more for uh, MSCs or even uh, PhDs more than uh, first cycle uh, uh, courses. Assessment, uh, I'm not uh, spending much time here because we, we heard about, about it all and from a very well known uh, person, David. Um, and assessment, it's obviously becoming an increasingly important and uh, inseparable factor in the quality of learning process. And uh, uh, continuous assessment is encouraged and done in different, uh, at the uh, Universidad de Berta is done in different uh, languages and digital media in different ways depending uh, on specific educational context, context and scientific areas also. So uh, continuous assessment should be uh, diversified, lead to, to feedback with an individual component and also with a general one be transparent uh, both in the request and the uh, assessment criteria and also sustainable as we, uh, we heard uh, about uh, previously. So it becomes obvious that the, the teacher's role is uh, clearly different when we're talking about uh, distance education, but it's equally uh, a key. And the teacher is expected to be uh, creative in the design of learning activities, uh, permanently reflecting upon the research uh, and the practice, uh, demanding but, but at the same time aware of the needs and difficulties uh, ex expressed by the students, and along with the uh, fundamental importance of interaction in the learning process, the teacher is required to master knowledge scientific knowledge, to make available and facilitate varied learning resources and to organize enriching activities that promote reflection and sharing within the group, within the group with the students and within the group the, the peers. And all of this requires formal training, the possibility of sharing practices with colleagues, the formal recognition of excellence and the sharing of this uh, excellency. So the training uh, of teachers, formal training of teachers is crucial when we're talking about uh, distance uh, education. And uh, I think we all had this experience now with this uh, the past couple of years um, and a lot has been happening and uh, we have been asked to help uh, a lot of institutions and colleagues to uh, changing from uh, face to face to distance education, at least some of the, the courses. And um, I will be uh, finishing with uh, just a few, uh, a few thoughts. Um, a pedagogical model or a framework uh, must consider, include and reflect um, educational, uh, classical education approaches, psychology, sociology and technological principles also allows uh, the existence of a framework or a model allows coherence, consistency and management of students' expectations, which at distance education it's very important to be able to manage uh, and to go um, to meet the students' expectations. 
and should constantly evolve and alter to include new technologies, new social processes, and all this requires a team, uh, wor a working team on these issues and uh, requires also continuous uh, modification. And its effectiveness is measured by the student's learning uh, outcomes. So here, assessment, again, is very important. Assessment, not the traditional assessment as we, as we know, but the, the feedback, all the, the, the learning uh, outcomes, monitoring that we have to do towards the, the learning process. So distance learning offers not only um, if we, if we move towards distance learning, this implies also a transformation on the educational paradigm, but also has an impact on other areas of the institutional organization and within its culture also. Um, in addition, any pedagogical model or organizational model will have necessarily to uh, comply the, the legal framework. Um, and the quality framework that is defined in the legal uh, instruments also. And this, of course, will be discussed a bit later, uh, both by uh, Susan and uh, Fernando also with the, the report of what's, uh, what's been happening. And um, the lack of teachers' pedagogical training, the technological and pedagogical support offered, and the cultural shift needed that incorporates a pedagogical model, but goes beyond that. These are some of the reasons for the lack of effectiveness and even the lack of quality in some of the approaches that we, uh, that we can see. But on a positive note, and just to, to finish on a, on a positive note, um, it's possible, it's a, a huge challenge, but it's very, um, demanding and it's very uh, interesting and it, it's very rewarding when we uh, during the, the whole process and higher institutions they need to understand that is, distance education will need to impact more than just the academics and the students it will also have an impact on policy on regulations on support and of course on the institution's identity and culture thank you Thank you so much, Carla. And stick to the time. It was very good because it uh, allows us to compensate uh, starting a little bit uh, earlier, um, late. So, uh, any questions? No? Yeah. Hello, Carla. Teresa uh, Restivo from A3S. Uh, would you like to give me an idea about which is the average age of your staff? Because you were talking about <laughs> we are old, so I would like to know. <laughs> also, I would like to ask you if it is easy to select staff for, uh, and how more or less which are the main lines for doing that. Posso usar, posso, posso usar isto para tirar só aqui para falar um bocadinho melhor. Um, the, the average age of the academic staff, uh, it's, uh, I can't give you a number, but uh, I would say it should be around 54, 55. Um, it's not very different from, uh, but uh, again, if we... Um, but when we, we, we try to, and we have the applications for hire new staff, the, the, average, the, the age of the, the new people, that the ones that are applying for the um, teaching, uh, initial of the professor auxiliar, uh, the age, it's, it's about 45. So we're not getting many young people when we need it. Uh, that's what I what I meant, and this is it's a very demanding because you have to uh, continue with your uh, research uh, activities, all the projects, all the teaching, and it's a completely different mindset that we what we are used to. So, um, if I'm talking about administrative staff, uh, the average age probably it's about 58. <laughs> so it's not. Uh, um, I was just uh, talking on the, at the break, we're now trying to reinforce the um, 
qualified people for instructional design and we're hiring uh, people in this, in this area. And uh, it's been surprisingly, uh, we're getting quite uh, very good quality people uh, with doctorates from different uh, areas, uh, from education to uh, cinema, uh, multimedia. Um, and those, they are uh, slightly younger, so uh, there is hope. <laughs> Um, but it's been a very good surprise that a lot of people are looking into this, uh, these jobs and they are uh, really doing very, very well. Uh, I think you've asked something else which I forgot, sorry. Uh, because it's uh, so specific uh, uh, background you need, uh, I was wondering which are the main um, topics you look at when you select people for open university? Because I believe that we don't have uh, so many staff, no. I mean teachers prepared for uh, distance education. True, but when, when we select and when we hire people, we, we do it uh, with the, the scientific areas. And then we have in internal training uh, on distance education and on different topics. All the, the new uh, lectures, they have to go th uh, through uh, training, formal training. We have uh, uh, training on um, distance learning, just the principles, the ideas, the, all that about the pedagogical model of the university, but also about uh, feedback, uh, about moderation, about assessment, different tools of assessment, different ways of doing assessment. And then we, uh, we have all the, the lectures that go through this, uh, this training. And uh, one of the, when I mentioned the legal uh, framework, one of the things that it's in the, the, the existing legal framework is that Universidad de Berta um, has as a mission, let's say, or an obligation um, to, to provide uh, some assistance to, to other universities when they intend to, to offer and they train the, their staff. So that's why we are also reinforcing our, our area in these uh, training activities and um, because of the legal framework, but also because of the, the pandemic situation, we have been uh, looked for uh, quite a few institutions and also uh, individuals to provide uh, some training, some in specific uh, areas, more technological or more pedagogical depending because we have uh, the, the courses are short courses, Sh by short I mean four weeks, uh, everything online, all the courses are online uh, and they provide certification, so it's uh, recognized uh, training courses and we have been uh, providing that. Thank you so much. Carla? Thank you so much, Carla. Well, we will, we'll have now Ricardo Mairal. Yes? You are not seeing yet uh, Professor Ricardo Mairal? Thank you very much. Está, ok. So, welcome, Professor. It's my pleasure to be here. Yes, yes, yes. Well, uh, just, just a few words to, to welcome you, to say that we are very glad that you accepted our invitation, and just to say um, two, two or three lines about you. Your, um, Ricardo Maral is a full professor of linguistics at UNED. He's also the president of the Spanish Association for Applied Linguistics between, he was, uh, between 2011 and 2017. And since, uh, uh, since 2018, is his director at the UNED, uh, and in 2020, just recently, was elected the president of European Association of Distance Teaching Universities. Very glad to have you with us, Professor. Can you, you have the floor now. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to, to be here today with uh, this uh, such prestigious conference and be I have the opportunity to be sharing with all of you our projects and experiences in such hard times as we are living, as we are living. Uh, let me ask you a question. Can you see uh, the, uh, my presentation in full mode? Yes? Can you see the presentation? 
Yes, yes, we are seeing the presentation. Mode? Okay, so uh, before I actually go into the exact details of, uh, of the topic of my talk, which is curricular design and student diversity in my, uh, in my university, let me just give you a, you know, a flavor of the scope of, uh, of, uh, of my university. You probably know, you know, UNED is the biggest public university in Spain, and our institution has been devoted to, uh, to quality higher education and research since 1972. As a matter of fact, you know, next year we will be we will be celebrating our 50th anniversary, and I will just be referring to this event later on. UNED has consolidated its leadership position as the biggest, the largest campus in Europe, distributed in 75 cities and 16 countries, as you see there. All right, we, uh, I mean, the leading university in Spain holds its success to its unique model of online and blended education that allows our students to study from anywhere in the world as long as they are connected to the internet. As I always say, we try and we combine the best of both worlds, I mean, online and in-person uh, in uh, tutorials. So as you see, you know, in our more than 60 associated centers, as you saw in the previous slides, in cities large and small throughout our national territory, provide the opportunity for students to attend optional intern in-person tutorials with our unit tutors who impart weekly or bi-weekly tutorials in evening hours that accommodate most work schedules. In these tutorials, the specific contents are discussed and the students' queries regarding course contents and activities are answered. Uh, I mean, the student is, the system is designed to fulfill the needs of the students in a diversity of situations, as I will just be referring in a minute. I mean, situations that are very heterogeneous. I mean, working or caregiving students who live near an associated center and who cannot apply and who cannot attend daytime classes at the traditional university can complement the online course with the in-person tutorials. Other students can do all of the coursework and interaction with professors online. Our infrastructure, human resources, and technological platform allow us to be the only Spanish university without an admission grade requirement. And this is important for you to remember. Our public tuition fees are very competitive, granting students access to higher education in advantageous uh, conditions. All right, obviously, in technology is, you know, talking about the challenges in higher education, technology becomes the top or, or occupies, a, 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 you know, a, a priority or becomes a priority in our agenda. UNED is at, the, is at the technological forefront of Spanish universities, thanks to its infrastructure. In our university, we design, we develop, and we deploy our own tools. There are technological facilitators for the students and their academic progress. Let me just, you know, we are just launching a very ambitious technological plan. Let me just give you a brief flavor of it because it is really, you know, important in order to account, in order to understand how we account, how we tackle, you know, the student diversity. We have initiated a very uh, ambitious, as I said, technological transformation plan, which concerns many areas. I mean, communication, the use of intelligent data, the application of disruptive uh, technologies such as um, Internet of Things and blockchain, cybersecurity, and artificial intelligence. I mean, obviously, uh, during the pandemic, we have learned that if we want to arrive, if we want to have, you know, a more efficient administrative organization, e-administration has become a top priority. We have begun digitalizing all the administrative processes and tasks so that, you know, processes are simpler and we can allocate more time to another task. Uh, moreover, I ask you, uh, I asked the vice rector for technology to have a leading position in the most disruptive technologies. IoT is one of them. We have installed sensors in all our buildings so that 
we our university up i mean so that we uh, our buildings become smarter and our university is more sensitive and more green and is more sensitive to sustainable uh, issues uh, as uh, uh, captured in the 20 and 30 agenda uh, but moreover, talking about disruptive technologies, I want my university to have a new position in blockchain. And, you know, we have developed a proof of concept prototype in what we call self-sovereign identity. In this self-sovereign identity model, there is no sense of entity necessary to carry out identity processes. I mean, the user is sovereign, and these processes are carried out between people and organizations without intermediaries. The certainty or a guarantee of immutability is provided by the, block, by the blockchain, which is a fundamental piece. But moreover, you know, in such large university with almost 200,000 students with, you know, distributed in, as, you, as I saw you, in 61 centers in Spain, plus 14 centers abroad, 16 different countries, cybersecurity, becomes a top priority. As the value of data increases, information security risks and privacy concerns obviously multiply. Sustainable strategy to secure data and protect privacy is absolutely essential through the establishment of an IT and data governance, which develops a risk security strategy that effectively detects, acts, and prevents any type of threat. Another key piece is the definition, as you see in the transparency, is the definition and implementation of the cloud backup and disaster recovery plan against cyber attacks. I mean, all of all these projects, I mean, I just presented a flavor, as I said, aim and point towards developing a smarter university where artificial intelligence plays a colossal role, a central role to develop, you know, personalized learning models. We, I mean, diversity is addressed, as you will see in a minute, in many ways in our university. Mainly it is addressed through a unique combination of distance education and local in-person tutorials. And this subject, in any kind of degree, of course, has its own specially designed online course. And we develop, you know, we aim, and we are just working as uh, we'll just be referring to in a minute, we are just working on developing personalized learning model, customized to our students' needs. And there, you know, artificial intelligence plays, as I said, a, a colossal role. Let me just give you a short note uh, to say that as an acknowledgement of this content effort to improve and foresee future challenges, UNED has been recognized as one of the top universities in the world by the Shanghai ranking in this global ranking of ac academic subjects for research, mainly in the areas of education, psychology, science, and energetic engineering in the years 2018 and 2020. But, all right, given this setting or in this context, I would like to discuss the many different kinds of diversity our students bring to the UNED and how our distance learning and how our distance education system has grown and continues to grow to allow all of our students to reach the full potential. Uh, I will also comment, because I was asked to do so, and I think that this is really pertinent, I will also comment briefly on how our relationship with our accreditation agency works to ensure the proper recognition of the distance education that we practice. All right, so as I said, we are just working on a in the university without borders. Uh, and this is the essence of our university. So uh, the difficulty I wish to address today is how to get a group of diverse students from each individual's starting point to a common destination, which is the acquisition of skills and competences in a fixed amount of time with similar effort. All right, let me just show you the first program. What is UNED ASSES? UNED is the game to the Spanish university for international students. What do I mean? We have UNED ASSES. This program is a service offered by UNED 
that evaluates the students' official academic transcripts and carries out the testing required to access undergraduate programs at Spanish universities. UNED, I mean, the specific competences, competency tests are exams that UNED ASIS offers in certain subjects. International students who wish to improve their admission rate are required to take these tests. So, UNED ASIS accreditation is a digital certificate that allows students to take part in the Spanish university admission process. Students from other countries only require a validated diploma to access several undergraduate programs. Students can apply for this accreditation from February to November each year, and students who require overcoming a specific competency test must request the accreditation within the time frame established by the June and September examination periods. But we talking about diversity. Apart from you know having or providing access to our international students, our we have uh, uh, several other programs. Our students are also quite diverse in age. While younger students may come to the UNED directly after the secondary education, our more mature students often come to us without the necessary credentials. And for these students, the UNED provides courses to pass university entrance exams specifically for, for students over the age of 25, for students over the age of 40, and for those older than 45, in order to enter undergraduate degree courses. Adults with undergraduate, undergraduate degrees also flock to our master's degrees to acquire expertise in a specific area or to other skills. In addition, I would like to emphasize, you know, our UNED senior courses and programs addressed for those over 55, which offer a wide variety of courses to serve the need for something that I really think, which is lifelong learning. So let me just give you some figures about this diversity. We've got international students coming from abroad. We've got, you know, access for people older than 25, 40, and 45 in the net senior. But UNED has over 8,000 students who are differently able. This is, this is 40% of the total of students with disabilities in undergraduate degrees in all of Spain, and 20% of the students in master's degree. And this is a program that let me tell you that I, you know, I really feel very proud of. But moreover, we've got over 1,200 students in penitentiary institutions who are enrolled in UNED. And nearly, you know, nearly uh, 20,000 uh, of our students live in rural areas, in towns fewer than 10,000 inhabitants. And UNED has 25 associated centers in towns with a population of 20,000 inhabitants or even uh, less. But over 7,000 students, over 7,000 students who live outside of Spain, mainly in Europe, Latin America, but also in North America, Africa. We've got one center in Africa, Asia, Oceania, or in Rome, in Nearly 70% of our students enroll in degree courses, and about 84% of those in lifelong learning courses are employed. So, this is the diverse type. As you see, we've got a very diverse set or range of students. How do we respond to this diversity so that our students you know, can reach the final destination, which is the acquisition of the learning competence? competences. All right, some, some universities, in order to deal with these diverse starting points, some universities achieve this by creating groups of students with more homogeneous starting points. How? Well, by implementing cutoff entry qualifications or favoring full-time students who tend more to be young students who come straight from secondary education and are not working by having daytime in-person classes only. But some universities do not wish to or cannot implement measures such as these. 
My university, UNED, is one of these. Why? Created, as I said, in 1972, as a university with a profound, with a marked social aim of social inclusion, UNED embodies what we know today as sustainable development goal number four, that I quote, ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning. As a matter of fact, the first function specified in our university statutes is the following, and I quote, to facilitate the access to university education and to continuity in the education of any qualified person who chooses the UNED education system because of his methodology or because of work, economic, residential, or other reasons. So, as you see, in its origins, the UNED was designed to be the university that rich people who could not access a university education in a traditional daytime and in-person class university. Adults of all ages who are working, people living far from the nearest university, Spanish people living in foreign countries who want a Spanish university degree, people with family obligations that make university attendance absolutely impossible, or people in prison and differently able people from whom university attendance is difficult, among others, you know, form part of our student diversity. I am really, really proud of the profound social vocation, you know, of my uh, university. How do we respond? How do we attend these diverse necessities? Let me just begin by commenting, by sharing with you, you know, uh, the program of uh, UNIDES. UNIDES, the, 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 UNIDES is the center for attention to differently able persons. Push Maxim is a university for everyone with no barriers. The vocation of UNIDES is to guarantee equal opportunities for differently able students in the UNED and remove all barriers to their access and promote full participation in learning. UNIDIS attends individually to the particular needs of each student, working with professors to adapt materials, learning processes, and evaluations to the functional diversities. UNIDIS also provides training for professors regarding accessibility for course materials and adaptations that effectively remove barriers to learning. This unit also coordinates a network of volunteers to assist our students and works with the employment center to orient students in their job searches. The second is our program of university studies in penitentiary centers. Following our social vocation that I was just referring to, I mean, following this vocation to reach everyone and everywhere, the UNED provides an orientation service for prospective students in penitentiary institutions, weekly tutorials for students studying for the university entrance exams, a contact person for students in degree programs, attendance to associated centers for students in open regimes, and in-place exams for all students in prisons. Students who are allowed to access online courses are assisted in this. And students who are not receive all the necessary material printed out for their courses. The unit firmly believes that people who are in the penitentiary system benefit from educational opportunities that can support them in the reinsertion into society. Uh, next, the third program that attends to a specific diversity is our program for evaluating our students who are members of the armed forces stationed in military missions. UNED has provided exam opportunities for, for our military personnel in, Mali, in different countries, such as Mali, Mauritania, Somalia, Gabon, Iraq, Lebanon, Turkey, Latvia, Lithuania, Italy, the United States, as well as personal station, station on board ships. Moreover, in the recent extraordinary COVID-19 circumstances, our commitment to attending to a student diversity was put to the test. 
Although the main coursework at the UNED is carried out online, our students do, of course, have work study experiences in most of our degrees. And our final exams, and this is one of the most important challenges we have to face, the final exams, especially in the undergraduate courses, are in-person exams. As are the public defense of uh, sessions for undergraduate and master's degrees final papers. Professors and staff during this period work diligently and quickly to create online alternatives to in-person work study experiences, reproducing in a virtual environment the situations and conditions that the students would encounter in the workplace. But, you know, uh, the, we created, we, we had the necessity to have an alternative to in-person exams. And we created online exam formats to ensure our students' evaluation during the pandemic, during the pandemic. While, you know, the general secretariat of, the, of our university created a new exam calendar and made sure that professors and students had all the necessary information to use the format successfully. But, you know, we created this, uh, I mean, this, we, we created a, a, an application, which is AVEX, uh, which is, uh, I mean, it's a virtual examination room. That's what the acronym, the acronym stands for. And the, which is, you know, we, we, we could uh, set over a million exams uh, for, you know, uh, between uh, during uh, 2020 and 2020 and 21, which is really an impressive, an impressive figure. But in this context of online exams, you know, we had to develop, I mean, a, an alternative plan, what we call net 100%. I mean, the strength of the personalized attention that was the mark of, uh, of our uh, university, you know, uh, was just, was, was put in place. Uh, by the uh, by this project UNED 100%, which which is uh, with the primary aim to support the learning efforts of each and every student during this difficult period. I mean, the vice rector of students and entrepreneurship, in coordination with the associated centers, made sure that each student, and this is important, made sure that each student had the necessary equipment and connections to take his or her exams online and to do so in person when necessary. There was in fact, but another instance of our conviction that each student is different, but requires and deserves whatever support is needed to be on an equal footing with equivalent opportunities for success as any other student. Of course, diversity in a student's life and work situations is not the only kind of diversity that must, that must be considered in a university setting. As, you, as we are all aware, as educators become increasingly aware of the diversity of ways that students learn, it becomes clearer and clearer that providing just one learning path is not really sufficient to meet all the students' needs. The, only, the, or the online format for our courses provides a unique opportunity to offer a wide range of materials to our students while reading, comprehending, analyzing, and applying the contents of written materials continues to be an important skill in many of our courses. This is supplemented with audio material, video presentations, online discussions in the course forums. The online courses using modular designs contain a wide range of continuous evaluation materials, tests and quizzes, essays, exercises, problems, collaborative projects, which contributes to the student's final grade, along with instruments for self-assessment along the way. More and more courses are offering different options of continuous evaluation exercises so that our students, so that our students can choose whatever best meets their learning needs. And in connection with this, you know, technology plays a pivotal role. We are just developing an ecosystem such as the one you saw in this slide, such that you know our students have access to a customized learning model where all the applications are interconnected and are tailor-made to the uh, to our students' need. In 
connection with this, we are just launching a very ambitious project on data analytics and personalized learning models. Let me just give you a brief uh, glimpse of what we are doing. Look into the future. You know, our university is studying the best and safest ways to introduce artificial intelligence techniques in our online courses in order to track the students' progress, in particular, the difficulties they encounter, so that proper support can be offered when necessary. These techniques for modern users, which make it, which make it possible to personalize these interactions, must take all aspects of student diversity into account. We've got a, an institute, uh, we've got a university institute, what we call University Institute of Distance Education. This institute is working to put in place an innovative project type entitled Data in Action, which will track evidence regarding the validity of the methodological approaches implemented in the courses, information which will help professors to better orient the online teaching. UNED is moving forward and rapidly in ensuring the accessibility and interoperability uh, of all its online web pages and their contents, as well as the online courses and materials containing them. Applying procedures and technologies, such as the one you see in the slide, the generator, the interactive generator of contents and courses, that will make sure that each action taken by professors, tutors, and administrative personnel complies with our requirements for our accessibility and attention to diversity. I mean, behind all these initiatives are the many research projects, both national, uh, both national and international, in which our university has participated in recent years. Let me just give you some examples of some of the most relevant projects, as the ones you see in the transparency. Jacha Y is one of them, or Acacia is another one. All right, all, all of these initiatives, innovations, and best practices are communicated to the professors for their implementation through the University Institute of Distance Education that I was just referring to uh, a minute ago. This institute, in its training portal, offers UNED professors exciting and provocative courses that constantly surprise and stimulate in person and online courses on a wide range of subjects and methodologies that help us to better serve our diverse student body are offered throughout the year. Many of these courses can also be accessed for self-training at any time. In addition, OpenNet is a resource that includes a large number of MOOCs, which can be accessed by anyone within or outside of UNED. Let me just give you one figure. Last year, we had over 500 students participating in our MOOCs uh, courses. Finally, I'd like to address one last question, which is essential. I mean, how do we reconcile? How do we reconcile the enormous flexibility that we implement to attend to a student diversity with the relatively rigid structures required by our academic evaluation agents. How do we do that? Because as you see, our, I mean, our students are very diverse. I must confess, I must confess that it's not always an easy task. Time and time again, in a variety of contexts, we are faced with extreme difficulty that most professors from outside of UNED, accustomed to teaching in the traditional classroom, have to understand what distance learning is really all about. And all of us who practice distance teaching know that it's not about doing the same thing as you would do in the classroom, just online. As I said, you know, and I would like really to emphasize this point, you know, it's not really about doing the same thing because it just behind there is you know, a very solid methodology, as you all know. We know, we know that it is about designing courses in ways that permit each student on his own, on his or her own terms, in her or his own time, to create her or his own personalized learning path. Using 
a variety of material and resources that guide them from the, from the very starting points to the end point of acquiring the requisite skills and competencies. And we do this every day. And this is natural for us, but it's not easy to understand. And, and so we have found that the best way to help our evaluation agency understand what we do and evaluate our processes and results in a fair way is to constantly educate and to constantly explain. We work very closely with the agency in preparing, monitoring, and evaluating our degree programs. We also provide the context necessary to understand the diversity of our student body and the special challenges this poses. For example, for the proportion of full-time to part-time students, for measures of success in courses, graduation rates, and even more important, dropout rates. We have found that the more we work together with our agency, the greater of an effort the people involved make to use relevant criteria to evaluate our educational level. In fact, our agency of reference is presently helping us to introduce pilot projects for innovations in evaluation, in order to test them before requesting a modification of our official programs. In conclusion, I hope you know that I have just given you a broad idea of the diversity of the students who come to our university, how we approach this diversity through curricular design, research, and attention to our students. All open and distance education universities can learn a lot from each other. And together, don't forget, always together, we are in the time that is absolutely essential to have the capacity to sign and to establish uh, alliances. As I said, all open and distance education universities can learn a lot from each other. And together, we can show agencies, we can show, we can show students, and I would say, we can show the world at large the capacity of distance education to meet a student's needs in a really profound and responsible and high quality procedures. As I said, uh, and let me just conclude with, uh, with this, our, uni our university, uh, has, uh, is the largest university in Spain, almost 200,000 students in very diverse situations. Our university uh, was born, uh, the, 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 the statues, the fund, foundational statues of our universities, you know, uh, insist on the uh, on the marked uh, social vocation. And we want to strengthen this social vocation. We've got a very different range of diverse programs as I, I show you in this presentation. And next year, we will be 50. Next year, we are holding, we are celebrating our 50th uh, anniversary. And let me just tell you that almost 3 million, 3 million students have been enrolled in some course or other along this uh, 50 years. That's an impressive figure, which just give you uh, a glimpse of the scope and the important scope and the social function of our university. Of course, I just wish to cordially invite all of you to participate in, uh, you know, in our 50th anniversary. Uh, it will be a pleasure you know, to welcome you in our university, which by the way, I would like to feel like yours for now. Thank you very much for your attention. Now, you know, I just uh, would be willing to, I uh, would be delighted and very glad to answer any question that you just want to, to, to raise. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you so much, Ricard Mairal. So, uh, the floor now is, yes, some questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I was um, expecting uh, some uh, different um, approach. Uh, I'm here representing the Board of Portuguese Technical Engineers, 
and uh, we are the, the institution that is responsible to provide professional competencies uh, to the, the people who uh, graduate from the, from the higher education institutions. My concern is, and I'm extending this question to Professor Carla as well, if she wants to, to participate in the answer. How do you um, deal with the need of uh, practical, experimental uh, work in uh, engineering, mm -hmm. for example? How do you provide uh, uh, people who are in uh, Colombia to um, make an essay for uh, diametral uh, um, resistance uh, in, a, in a, a, a sample from a road, for example? Okay. This is very concerning because I can uh, see that happening in um, formal face-to-face uh, -face institutions, but I don't see how you provide that to people we are, who are uh, in 10, 20, 25 different places in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. I'm, I'm very sorry that the, uh, that the approach was not the, the one you expected. Uh, but I just wanted to show, you know, the diversity of students that we have in relation to your to your query. Uh, as I said, we follow a high we we follow a hybrid uh, methodology. I mean, we have in person classes in our centers, all right, and we have online, uh, which we uh, complement and supplement and enrich by online uh, courses, and therefore all the experimental load of uh, uh, degrees such as engineering, chemistry, physics, and sciences in general, you know, are done in our labs, in our centers, in our associated centers. Well, associated centers have labs where our students do their practices. Practices are fundamental in order just to give credibility uh, to our methodology, but moreover, we are just talking about technology. We are just developing remote labs where students in a remote way can do their practices. You know, we have done so in terms of engineering and physics. So the experimental uh, work that, uh, you know, attached to uh, sciences and engineers, uh, engineering grades is, uh, is guaranteed by our, uh, by the, the labs that we have in our centers together with the, our the implementation of our remote labs I mean I hope that I have answered your question because this is in fact one of the issues that our accreditation agency you know wants to guarantee that we comply with this with these majors thank you so much Ricardo do you do you still want okay do you want to, to make some okay no so I think there's no more question. Thank you again so much, uh, Professor Ricardo Mairal. We are Thank now you. going for a break for lunch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, shall we start? So, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, participants, those here and those at a distance. Uh, this time has not been possible uh, to have uh, the questions from those uh, not pre uh, in a face-to-face -face process, uh, but uh, we'll expect that any comments uh, could be sent to the speakers directly. Um, so uh, we are in this uh, conference uh, related with challenges uh, of uh, distance education on engineer and uh, uh, higher education. Uh, well, uh, a central uh, topic to the evaluation is the evaluation of the education. And the main question is, uh, of course, uh, a question of criteria. Uh, also, uh, on the topic, at the top of these characteristics, uh, of the characteristics of distance education, we have its flexibility, as we already listened during uh, this morning. 
And uh, in fact, it has been very evident, this flexibility uh, during all the pandemic situation. Uh, each, uh, I mean, everyone, everywhere, we have been using uh, uh, distance uh, uh, processes of uh, teaching. Uh, and so we uh, understood that uh, flexibility has been a uh, major point. Therefore, uh, the, the, the name of the speech we are going to, to, to listen, I mean that Susan Svazek will offer to us, criteria for evaluating distance education from uh, program quality, uh, is an important topic and I'm sure that uh, it will leave a lot of questions for us. Uh, Susan Svazek got her PhD in Education Technology and Distance Education. Uh, she's co-author of the book uh, uh, Teaching and Learning at a Distance, which is already on its seventh edition. <clears throat> on the last ten years, she has been uh, with the University of Denver, where she was uh, associate provost. And in the last few years, she dedicated to uh, she dedicated her activity as an independent consultant, speaker, and teacher focused on cultivating learning center, uh, teaching at a distance <coughs> in higher education. So uh, I think that it's time for asking Susan to take the stage and uh, let us listen to what you have for us. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. And before I forget, thank you to uh, A3ES for the invitation. Um, I had spoken with them by Zoom earlier this year. And um, so I, I am looking forward to hearing even more from them. And I have enjoyed the presentations so far today very much. I was, I was saying yes and nodding yes, yes, all along. So who would have guessed? two years ago that we would be in this position. Who would have thought that we would, we would go to this emergency remote teaching? How many professors would have expected to one day be teaching in their face-to-face -face situation only to find out that in one week they were going to be teaching online? So I think that it has been a very interesting experience for those of us who work in distance education, partly because we can now say, now do you believe me? I have been telling you these things. So it, it, is, it has been a very, uh, as I said, a very interesting experience. But I will say also that we, um, we also have a negative side to that, and that is that many people have judged uh, distance education by what they have seen in the past year and a half, where this kind of emergency remote teaching is not really what I would call quality distance education, mainly because we didn't have time to prepare. So what I want to talk to, to you about today is how do we then step back and look at distance education programs that have been prepared. So uh, I want to start, you know, we, we say we want to get on the same page. So we're on the same page. Um, one of the assumptions that I will work from is that when I say distance education or DE program, what I'm referring to is a cohesive formal curriculum. Now, obviously, we can use online education and distance education of various forms for informal learning, for uh, training, um, for all types of lifelong learning, but I will be focusing on formal uh, curriculum-based distance education programs today. I would like to reinforce that distance education is not a new phenomenon. Um, I thought it was interesting that Liz Marr this morning, in fact, 
said that her institution, the Open University in the UK, was originally known as um, the College of the Air, or maybe the University of the Air, because they started before there was an internet. And in fact, in many countries, um, some form of distance education has been around for 200 years or more it, with different delivery modes. So even though we're going to be talking about online learning, keep in mind that many of the issues and challenges that you have been encountering, in fact, have been around for a very long time. We have simply changed delivery modalities. Another very important point that I want to reinforce is that very often people will compare online learning to face-to-face -face learning with the goal that online learning should be just as good as face-to-face -face learning. And I would argue that when we do that, we are making the assumption that face-to-face -face learning is the, is the ideal, that it's the best education could be. And I'm not convinced that's true. So as we are looking at these ideas about how to evaluate programs, let's not get caught up in comparing is this online program as good as a face-to-face -face program. I think there are bigger issues that we need to be looking at and also not assuming that our face-to-face -face teaching is the ideal that we should aspire to. So, and there we go. So if I am tasked with evaluating a distance education program, these are the areas that I would be looking at. So what evidence am I gonna be looking for about the quality of a distance education program? Now, these categories, you know, they could, these items could be categorized in a number of ways. And there are some elements that overlap. But these six areas, I think, represent the core of what we would be looking at. And I will say that I'm only going to spend a little bit of time on each one simply because we don't have time to do more than that and entire books have been written about this topic. So, I will move quickly. So, um, academic considerations, these are actually not so different from looking at the quality of a face-to-face -face course. We assume that the coursework within a, um, a distance, or, or rather within any degree program, um, has been developed with a lot of um, scholarly rigor, that in fact the entire curriculum has been developed according to standards within the particular uh, discipline. And I think that we need to also, in distance education, continue to sort of argue against the idea that a distance delivered degree program is somehow less than a face-to-face -face degree program. Um, in fact, students learn just as much online as they learn at a dis er, in the classroom, and in some cases they learn more. And we can go into that later if we have, if we have time. So I think that one of the sort of givens about online programs that I would look for as an evaluator would be these academic standards. Um, another area that is very similar is that we would hope we have learning-centered course design. Now, I see this as somewhat different from learner-centered or student-centered. There is nothing wrong with learner-centered or student-centered course design, but I believe that learning-centered course design gives us that broader recognition that the teacher's role is important. And we need to also be looking at the course content and specific elements of the discipline. And we need to be looking at the quality of the teaching itself. And so I think that learning-centered course design 
puts the focus on the process and not on the person. So a couple elements of that that I would look for in a high quality program include that course developers have instructional design expertise. Now, that is, that is a, that's a big question because very few higher education faculty members come into their first teaching position with any instructional design expertise. In fact, most do not have formal teacher education experience. And so when we say that course developers should have instructional design expertise, we need to be looking at issues of what is a quality uh, course, what kinds of things should we be looking at when we develop a course, and that that should apply both to face-to-face -to -face and to online programs. And specific to online programs is that the courses that are incorporated into the program, in fact, incorporate strategies that are appropriate for the virtual environment. There has been a lot of discussion about the idea that we, we don't simply um, say, well, this is what I always do in my face-to-face -face course, so I'm just going to keep doing that same thing and maybe put myself on camera while I'm doing that. In fact, I would argue that um, a heavy emphasis on lecturing is not really a good strategy for face-to-face -face instruction either. But thinking about how do we design for an environment. If you think about it, um, you design courses differently if you are in an auditorium with 500 students than if you are in a seminar room with 12. And so when we look at here's another environment, it's not so different. We are looking at how we interact within a particular environment, how that environment influences us, how it influences our students as well. Okay, those two areas I didn't want to spend a lot of time on because they are very similar between face-to-face -face and online. Now we get into some things that are a bit more, dif a bit more different. With the idea of institutional commitment, one of the things that we need to look at with online programs, and remember, I'm talking about programs, not specifically individual courses, but that degree program, we need to look at whether the institution, in fact, is committed to a distance education program. Some of the things that we look for would include that there are internal agreements about how that program will be supported. And so we could look there at things like, um, as enrollments grow, will funding also be growing to support that program? Um, we might look at faculty governance issues. If your faculty senate, or the equivalent, has input into face-to-face -face programs, is there going to be that similar um, governance structure that applies to your online program as well. One thing that, uh, one experience that I've had that I think illustrates this really well is that at my former institution, the University of Denver, the School of Business decided to um, implement an online MBA program. Well, they worked with an outside company, what's called um, a program management company, to do that. And there was no sort of institutional agreement about that. It was simply the school of business, and the program or the company they were working with said, we will guarantee that within three years you will have 500 new students in this program. Well, that sounds fabulous except that no one talked to the support entities within the institution. So suddenly, you have hundreds of new students who need to access library facilities online. 
Do you, does the library have the staffing for that? Are they prepared for that? Well, that was an unhappy surprise because there was no internal agreement between the School of Business and the library. So in fact, the, the program was implemented and the contract signed with this program management company before the library knew about it. So now here, they're having to figure out what are we going to do? Are we going to somehow get some extra funding to possibly hire another staff person to support these students? Are we going to have to make resources available at times um, and with, that are robust enough to handle these hundreds of students? That was not a, the kind of surprise that we want to see in our institutions. And so as we think about institutional commitment, we need to look at how is that kind of coordination going on. Another element that we can think about in terms of the institution is can the upper administration for the institution explain and support the idea of having an online program in terms of strategically why that was done. If asked, could they speak articulately about how that online program helps to further the mission of the institution? And so we need to look at from the top down as well as the bottom up in terms of upper administration, needs to be thinking strategically about this, and we need to look from the faculty perspective upward, and then in that middle area, we wanna see someone who is coordinating. Okay, and as I said, we wanna see a qualified distance education uh, administrator, coordinator, who is going to be able to manage those internal agreements who is going to be able to manage issues related to things like enrollment, issues related to registration, other forms of student support and faculty support. This person, or maybe an office of people, should also be involved with internal evaluation of that program because we wouldn't simply look for a typical form of program evaluation that looks primarily at issues related to the online, or primarily to the issues related to face-to-face, -face, we would be looking at a broader evaluation that also looks at these elements that are particular to online. We wanna see a strong relationship between those support entities and the distance education administrator or coordinator and the, uh, the academic departments so that we don't simply have, you know, here's our distance ed coordinator who's over here sort of working magic, pulling rabbits out of hats while we have the people in the department trying to figure out who does what. Right? What decisions are, you know, do we make? What decisions does the administrator make? Who arranges for faculty support? Who arranges for student support, for example? And then finally, another issue, another issue of institutional commitment is one that um, when, I, when I bring this up with faculty members at various institutions, um, what I say often is, okay, you have an online course that you've developed and you're teaching it. Who owns your course? Now, what I mean by that is, uh, let's say you've developed the course and you're teaching it, and then you leave that institution to go teach somewhere else. Can you take that course with you? Maybe. Can your institution keep that course and hand it off to another instructor to teach, even though you developed it. Now, I'm not gonna say that one situation is better than another, but these are questions we have to be asking 
And unfortunately, almost every institution that I've worked with, where I ask the faculty that, who owns your course? I see a lot of people get a panicked look on their face because they don't know. So the issue is not, oh, I should own my course, or, oh, the institution should own it because the institution was paying the instructor while they created it, right? It's not that one or the other is better. It's that we need to know what it is. And everyone <laughs> needs to know that. So if I were evaluating a program, you better believe I will be asking people this question, do you know who owns your course? So simply another example of institutional commitment. OK, technical support and infrastructure, this is probably the most obvious area that when we look at a distance education program, we would say, oh, well, you know, definitely we need technology. Um, so things that I would look at to evaluate a program is, does the institutional infrastructure, um, is it capable of handling bandwidth heavy applications? Uh, probably, maybe, who ensures that? Right? So here we get back to this issue of internal coordination and management. We also need to ensure that we have adequate staffing to support students and to support faculty when they need it. Okay? Does that mean on the weekends? Does that mean at 2 o'clock in the morning? Those are questions we need to decide. Okay? And so ensuring that, in fact, if a student is having problems, let's say you know, their assignment is due at midnight, which I don't understand why assignments are always <laughs> due at midnight, but are they going to be able to contact someone in tech support if they're having problems? Whoa, that was amazing. <laughs> Did you, okay, thank you very much. Did you read that? <laughs> it's been wonderful. Um, Hi, guys. Speaking of tech support, um, <laughs> could we go back to the little, um, the little projector screen image? <laughs> OK. Fabulous. Thank you. And by the way, thank you to the tech support. You guys have been terrific, well, except for that one little thing. <laughs> um, I, I think it's also important that we look at support and accommodations for uh, students and instructors who are differently abled. One example of that might be, do we have captions, written captions on our videos? Okay, something that maybe we don't think about. And we need to think about, are there measures in place, and this is not just a technical issue, it's an issue related to instructional design and faculty support and student support. But do we have measures in place, technical or otherwise, to verify that the students who are taking the class are the same ones who enrolled in the class? And in case you're not aware, um, I think it's interesting to, to look at some of the websites. Google take my online class for me, and I will tell you, you will be very shocked. <laughs> um, there are people you can hire to take your entire course for you, to participate in discussions for you, maybe just take your tests for you, or write a paper for you, or in fact, write your dissertation. Okay? It's all available for money. So, how do we deal with that? Are we aware of those issues and are we aware of the ways we work against these people? Oh boy, faculty development and support. Um, so, so here's the question. When I say instructors are experts in the field, here's what I'm getting at. Many online degree programs are established 
and the instructors who are teaching in that program are not, in fact, the same instructors who are teaching on campus. So if I have a chemistry degree program on campus, I have my regular faculty teaching those classes. Now, are those the same instructors who then also teach online, or are we simply hiring a whole new group of instructors? Again, there are pros and cons to either one, but we need to be able to justify that and to ensure that if we are hiring what in the US we call adjunct instructors or special contract instructors, that they are in fact experts in their field. So that we are not simply saying, well, this is a separate program, so we're just going to hire these other people. Uh, this seems like an obvious one, but I'm always surprised um, by the faculty members who haven't gotten any training on how to use the learning management system, whether that's Canvas or Moodle, Desire to Learn, Blackboard. They all have similar capabilities and they all can take some time to learn. And so having that training is critical. We also need to provide instructors with professional development on topics like what are the teaching strategies that are especially useful for an online degree program? How do we deal with course design? Okay, a little bit different from just individual strategies, individual assessment design, but really looking at how do I design a course from scratch? How do they manage their online course? One of the problems with online courses, if they are not well designed, is they, they will eat you alive. They will take every minute of your day if you let them. So knowing how to manage that, and this goes into course design, of course, but being able to manage that is critical or the faculty members are going to burn out because those courses, they will take all the time you have in the day if you let that happen. Okay, and then facilitating online engagement, as Liz Marr talked about this morning. There's um, especially useful strategies for that. There are some that are less helpful. Um, we also need to look at uh, faculty development for what are the institutional expectations for the faculty. Now, some of those things, you know, might be, uh, you know, how do we train faculty members to, you know, give appropriate feedback um, in the online environment? Uh, we might look, <laughs> we might look at things like, how are we evaluating the, the teaching quality. Now, I will go on record here as saying, I don't think we do a good job of evaluating teaching quality for face-to-face -face classes either. Okay. So this is not something new, but in fact, what we hear a lot is, oh, you know, those, those distance education courses, we have to really evaluate those carefully. We have to really look at those with rigor, and I say, you are right. And let's apply that same amount of rigor to our face-to-face -face classes. And suddenly, the room gets very quiet, just like, just like that, just, just like that. Um, there we go. Those expectations need to be clear to instructors. Um, one thing that I found amusing is that I was teaching an online course for a university in the United States and one of the parts of my contract that I signed as an adjunct instructor said that I would agree to be in my office um, a certain number of hours each week. Well, that was fine. I was in my office in Colorado. Um, unfortunately, the students were all over the United States. So, those expectations really should be uh, managed to fit the online environment. And we need to make them clear to the instructors. 
Are we expecting faculty to do all of their content development support? And by that I mean, are we expecting them to create their own videos or other content objects? Okay, if we are, we probably need to help with that development. And we need to make sure that, that instructors have input on their courses and on the program. So again, as I'm thinking about, do instructors have input? Do they have some kind of official input on, an, on a face-to-face -face degree program, okay, as part of the faculty senate or some other form of oversight, then they also need to have that for an online program. Okay, support for students. Um, one of these three could be your student. Um, and we need to think about, can students do the things administratively that they need to do remotely? Can they register for your classes remotely? Can they enroll in the university remotely? Can they access, um, you know, scholarship, uh, like official, what do I want to say here? Can they pay their fees remotely? It doesn't make sense to have a distance education program and then tell students, oh, but in order to register for classes, you have to come on campus, okay? so thinking about that. I would also look for um, what expectations do we have for students um, for things like if they are uh, participating in a course with a lot of discussion, have we clarified what our expectations for that discussion are? Have we clarified for all of the courses how often they need to be online in the course site? So there are various expectations we have for the students, and we need to make those clear right up front. Uh, Liz, I believe, talked about this idea where we develop a sense of what we would call the learning group. Okay? If I'm evaluating the program, I'm going to look at courses and see if there are opportunities for students to develop that sense of community or not. We might also look at whether the program is using learning, analytic, learning analytics effectively to identify students who may be at risk because they are underperforming in the program. How do we know who those students are before it gets too late? And we need to think about how do we make provisions for things like proctored testing at a distance. If we expect students to take an exam and we want them to take it in the presence of another human being, how are we going to arrange that? How are we going to provide laboratory experiences? How are we going to handle things like internships? Okay, I wanted to leave some time for questions because I know I covered a lot very quickly just hitting a few points um, as we were going along. But I would like to very quickly just say that good degree programs online look a lot like good degree programs face-to-face. -face. Okay, What we are looking at, if I'm evaluating a degree program, an online degree program, I'm going to look at a lot of the same things that I would look at to evaluate a face-to-face -face program, but I'm also going to look at these elements that I just mentioned in terms of student support, faculty support, institutional commitment, um, academic rigor, technical support. Okay, so again, there are some, um, there's some specifics for online program evaluation that I think we need to pay attention to. But please keep in mind that good teaching is good teaching. Okay, questions? Thank I you, might Susan. have answers. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, well, there are many questions from speaker. Uh, oh, but I would like also to, to see if there are questions from yes, participants. Yes, there's someone here. I have one here. Thank you. Uh, hello, Susan. Thank you hello. very much for your presentation. It was lovely, very, very inspiring. Uh, I'm Nilsa from University of Lisbon, and I would like to see you go a little bit further on institutional commitment, because I do see this as one of the main aspects to be discussed. Mm -hmm. And I would like to you to go deeper on the idea that institutional commitment is not easy on distance education when we are thinking about conventional brick and mortal universities. So can you go deeper on how can we make institutions that have no or very little experience on distance education to have a vision about it? Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, thank you for that question because I think the issue of how does an institution support a degree program is one that we sort of take for granted with face-to-face -face programs. Um, but it is absolutely critical for an online degree program to have that support. I think one way that we do that is that we recognize, first of all, that as a traditional degree offering institution, we probably need to identify people externally that we can bring in who in fact are experts on distance education. I think we have to be humble enough to say, this is not my area, this is not my strength. So how can I identify someone who, who does know this stuff? I think that's a critical first step. Um, the other thing I would argue is that because the, um, the degree of coordination institutionally is so necessary with an online program, as I mentioned, things like who, um, who sets up the evaluation program uh, for routine evaluations of that online degree program, who establishes that, who decides what the criteria are, who manages those agreements with your IT office, who manages those agreements with the library, okay? who designs the faculty training. I think there are many issues that we need to have people who in fact have distance education expertise help us with. I would also argue that in many cases, our face-to-face -face degree programs rely on departmental commitment much more heavily than on the entire institution. Because the institutions have already been designed specifically to facilitate face-to-face -face instruction. So that, in a sense, is, we would say it's baked in. You know, it's already integrated into the structure of the institution. And now we bring in this new kind of program that still needs the support, but may in fact need another layer of support that might not be there initially. And so the, the focus might shift from being primarily uh, departmental or disciplinary support to that plus um, the more specialized support that is required for an online program. I also mentioned that uh, university administrators should be prepared to articulate how the implementation of this online program helps the institution achieve its mission. Why are we doing this strategically? Who are those students? What's that market that we're looking at? You know, where are those students coming from? How do we identify them? How do we reach out to them? These are all questions related to university mission. So I think that, you know, we really do need to look at how does the institution as a whole 
reach out to students that that institution may be, I won't say they ignored it, but were less aware of those students in the past, or certainly less reliant on those students in the past. So those are questions that really require understanding how an online degree program fits into the broader structure of the institution, not only fits into the department. Does that help? Yes. <laughs> Another question. Thank you, uh, Susan, for your presentation. My name is Luis. I'm from Universidad Europea, and I'm struggling with the same issue you just mentioned, and uh, I would like you to go a bit further on that. The thing is that um, it reg regarding the, the process of enrollment and managing and everything about online, it's specifically online. Um, so it, it makes sense to have a, a, a business and management unit specifically to online because everything is different, okay? But at the same time, we did that in Europea, but nowadays I'm struggling with teaching staff because teaching staff comes from the face-to-face -face, mm -hmm. and I'm pushing for uh, education on online, but they are still on the face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. Then teaching staff starts to, to become divided between the face-to-face -face and the online. And the pedagogical practices, as we know, they are totally different. So there's not a clear path, mm -hmm. specifically in the beginning, because once you have a, a big institution online and a big face-to-face, -face, it clearly, you can divide both. But in the beginning, you cannot do it. So we've made the choice of, of dividing a business unity just for online with specific enrollment process, specific marketing and admission process, uh, specific uh, um, formation to, 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 to professors, but at the same time, especially in Portugal, we, we engaged on the a scientific domain. So this are the, the, the teaching staff of mathematics, these are the ones of engineering, these are the ones of and, and we go from then. Uh, so I would like to hear your thoughts on what should we do specifically in the beginning, because it's hard to, to get the volume going. Once you get the volume going, you do everything, but until right. that point, you don't do it. Okay? Right. Thank you. You know, excellent question. You know, it's, it's kind of like nobody wants to be the first department <laughs> to do this because you know, while you will be stepping out there and be a pioneer, you will also be sort of the guinea pig that everything happens to. But everyone else will learn from you. Uh, you know, that issue of having a separate unit, I think there are pros and cons to that. I think it is very helpful in the beginning to do that. I would be concerned about that long term simply because uh, we can end up seeing a lot of redundancy. So for example, registering for courses, why would that be different between registering for online and registering for face-to-face? -face? In the beginning, we may want to establish those separately, but eventually, I think we really need to think about integrating those systems, partly for redundancy, but the other element I would warn against is that as soon as we have entirely separate units, what this begins to look like is we have the real university here. And then we have those online programs over there. And I actually heard uh, an academic dean um, say one time, referring to the on-campus faculty as the real instructors. Um, I can assure you the online instructors were every bit as real, but in fact that dean was expressing an idea that I think we need to constantly work against, which is the idea that somehow those online programs are less than. And so I think that long term having completely separate entities for administration um, and for those program coordination issues at the beginning, I think that can really be helpful. Long term, I think it's a mistake. 
Um, and, and another element, you know, you mentioned training faculty. I think one thing that we also see is that the tools that our online instructors are using, usually the LMS, you know, Canvas or Blackboard or Moodle, it's not as though the online instructors are the only ones using that. We also need to be doing the same sort of faculty development for the on-campus instructors. And so I think, you know, we, we don't want to think of, oh, well, the online people use technology. Yes, and so do your face-to-face -face instructors. And so I would, I would caution against having things too much separated um, long term. And as I said, at the beginning, it can be very helpful, especially if you have someone, a support person, come in and help you initially establish that program and to deal with those internal coordination issues um, with, you know, who's going to decide things about, like, IT support. Um, you know, if students have technical problems, do they call the instructor? Okay. Do they call IT? What hours is IT open? What questions are they able to answer? Um, and, and so I think it's helpful at the beginning that you have that distance education person or office that focuses initially on that first one or two or three programs. And then, as we would say, you get your feet under you, and you're feeling, okay, we can do this. <laughs> then you can become much more integrated. So I think your idea of separation is good. I would just caution about doing that long term. So, Susan? We start late, I know, but uh, <laughs> we have to keep the... Yes. Schedule. So thank you very much. I'm sure the, there will be many other questions. I have some, but I can ask later. <laughs> okay. Okay. And thank by the way, thank you very much. It, very quickly, by the way, if you do have additional questions, um, you can email me at susan at collegeteachingcoach.com. Thanks. Thank you. Now. Uh, we, I would like to ask Fernando Ramos to, to come around. Uh, Fernando Ramos is full professor at the University of Aveiro. Uh, he got his PhD in 1992 in electrical engineering. Uh, in the last 25 years, he has been dedicating his, uh, his activity to the um, his scientific activity in the application of digital media in higher education learning uh, progress, process. Uh, he integrates the HES uh, uh, Commission for Distance Education since it uh, starting in July 2020 and currently is his chair. Uh, so uh, thank you and uh, for being with us and uh, I'm sure that Fernando as chair of the commission will have a lot of things curious for all of us uh, according to the evaluation of the uh, first uh, submissions of online programs. Muito obrigado, Teresa. Boa tarde a todos. Uh, o aspecto bom de ser orador nesta conferência é poder estar sem máscara e, portanto, um, de acordo com aquilo que estava combinado, eu vou fazer a minha apresentação em português, uh, que tem esta designação, a experiência do primeiro ciclo de avaliação de cursos em educação à distância. Uh, a apresentação vai procurar dar um, uma, uma, uma panorâmica genérica sobre o trabalho desenvolvido nos últimos 14 meses uh, nesta área em Portugal. E vou começar, enfim, por fazer uma brevíssima uh, lembrança de qual é o quadro legal da educação à distância em Portugal. Depois, enfim, uh, 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 partilhar alguma informação sobre a forma como foi organizado este primeiro ciclo de, de avaliação de, de propostas de novos ciclos de estudo na modalidade de educação à distância. Apresentar os resultados uh, à data, enfim, não à data de hoje, mas de anteontem. 
e também referir o trabalho em curso e futuro. Do quadro legal da educação à docência em Portugal, no ensino superior, rege-se naturalmente pelo mesmo conjunto de suportes jurídicos que são válidos para o ensino presencial, embora com a especificidade de haver um decreto-lei especificamente sobre o regime jurídico do ensino superior ministrado à distância, em relação ao qual eu vou fazer alguns destaques, porque parece-me que são particularmente importantes para se compreender aquilo que aconteceu durante estes últimos 14 meses e é que, de alguma forma, justifica também os resultados que existem até ao momento do processo de avaliação. Esta coisa está um bocadinho lenta. Ah, ok. Portanto, no seu preâmbulo, o Decreto-Lei 133 de 2019, enfim, não vou ler isto tudo, porque isto é a transcrição do que está no Decreto-Lei, um, o, o, o preâmbulo do Decreto-Lei 133 de 2019 é muito claro quando diz que o ensino à distância deve assumir-se como uma alternativa de elevada qualidade à modalidade presencial e não apenas uma mera reprodução ou paralelo do mesmo. Um, no mesmo preâmbulo é referido que a flexibilidade de tempo e de lugar proporcionada pelo ensino superior à distância preconiza que os estudantes possam desenvolver o seu percurso formativo ao ritmo que melhor, melhor se compatibiliza com a sua vida pessoal e profissional. Este objetivo impõe uma nova abordagem pedagógica, mas representa também uma oportunidade para introduzir inovações a nível curricular que atendam às necessidades dos destinatários do regime instituído pelo presente decreto-lei. Desse modo, prevê-se que a concessão do plano de estudos curriculares deve ser orientada para assegurar uma elevada flexibilidade quanto à inscrição e frequência e a oferta efetiva de unidades curriculares optativas, tendo em vista a valorização de percursos de aprendizagem personalizados e adaptados às concretas necessidades de formação dos estudantes. Gostava de salientar o facto de haver neste preâmbulo, enfim, neste esterto do preâmbulo, duas referências específicas à expressão flexibilidade. Okay? Uh, o artigo 3 do, do, do decreto-lei, um, uh, enfim, de, na, na sua, na, que, que, que tem um conjunto de definições, inclui a definição do que é que se entende por um ciclo de estudos ministrado à distância, o um ciclo de estudos com frente de grau académico, em que as unidades curriculares lecionadas na modalidade de ensino à distância corresponde a um mínimo de 75% do total de créditos do respectivo plano de estudos. E refere ensino à distância como sendo o ensino predominantemente ministrado com separação física entre os participantes, um processo educativo designadamente docentes e estudantes. Quando nós, enfim, na, na, na agência, começámos a procurar compreender como é que podíamos implementar Uh, do ponto de vista da avaliação e do ponto de vista dos guiões, uh, uh, enfim, este, estes conceitos definidos no, no decreto-lei, deparámos-nos com um problema, que é um problema que, cuja resolução ainda, ainda está por, uh, por concretizar, que é uh, relativamente ao significado concreto deste adverbio de modo predominantemente, do ensino predominantemente ministrado com separação física entre os participantes no processo educativo, e aquilo que foi decidido foi fazer uma leitura minimalista uh, desta, desta cláusula e considerar que, cumpre esta, uh, que, que cumprem esta, esta regra todas as unidades curriculares em que o número de horas de contacto à distância seja superior ao número de horas de contacto uh, presenciais. Uh, mas isto... Uh, 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 tem, 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 uh, abre a porta a certo tipo de problemas, por exemplo, a possibilidade de um ciclo de estudos, embora cumprindo a regra dos 75% de SETS em unidades curriculares predominantemente à distância, poder ter, na realidade, um número de horas de contacto presenciais total que é superior ao número de horas de contacto à distância. O que, é, enfim, o que seria uma situação paradoxal uh, atendendo à modalidade de educação à distância. E, portanto, isto é um aspecto que, do nosso ponto de vista, 
necessita de uma reflexão aprofundada no sentido de ser possível encontrar uh, uma fasquia diferente para, para o significado deste, deste adverbio. O artigo 8º do decreto de lei refere que as instituições de ensino superior podem atribuir graus académicos uh, nesta modalidade, desde que disponham cumulativamente dos seguintes meios humanos, um corpo docente total seja qualificado uh, na área, obviamente, e que tenha formação pedagógica comprovada para ensino à distância, um corpo de técnicos especializados com as qualificações adequadas e em número suficiente para prestar apoio individualizado aos estudantes sempre que necessário, e uma equipa que reúna competências técnico-pedagógicas para colaborar com os docentes no desenho curricular dos planos de estudo e dos materiais dos ciclos de estudo. Portanto, isto é explicitamente referido no decreto-lei. O artigo 9 refere-se aos meios materiais e tecnológicos. Portanto, as instituições necessitam de dispor cumulativamente de um conjunto de condições, nomeadamente infraestrutura de sistemas tecnológicos que configurem um campus virtual com funcionalidades de interação pedagógica, um sítio web direcionado para os estudantes que garanta o acesso permanente a bibliotecas digitais, repositórios, serviços de empréstimo de materiais digitais e laboratórios virtuais, um sistema integrado de gestão académica que assegura a tramitação desmaterializada de todos os processos académicos. Okay? Não leio tudo para também não ser excessivamente maçador. Artigo 10, modelo pedagógico e desenho curricular, Cada ciclo de estudos ministrado à distância deve obedecer a um modelo pedagógico, okay, que constitui o um referencial para a ação educativa à distância, uh, integrando nos seus pressupostos básicos a flexibilidade para aprender em qualquer momento e lugar, um desenho curricular que constitui a concepção modular dos conteúdos, metodologias e atividades de ensino-aprendizagem, visando a flexibilização do acesso a adequação do planeamento curricular aos processos coletivos, etc. E, portanto, mais uma vez sublinho as, as duas referências ao conceito de flexibilização que já tínhamos visto uh, estar presente noutros, noutros uh, momentos, digamos, do, do decreto-lei. E, portanto, este, este conjunto, de, este conjunto de, de definições e de declarações do decreto-lei foram, obviamente, os princípios que foram adotados como critério de base, como quadro de referência, para, quer para a elaboração dos guiões, quer para a avaliação dos ciclos de estudo que foram submetidos, e vamos falar com um pouco mais de detalhe nisso mais à frente. Um, referir, no entanto, que continuamos com... Uh, temos outro tipo de problemas, ou enfrentamos outro tipo de problemas, nomeadamente o facto de no quadro jurídico nacional, horas de contacto são horas de natureza presencial, tal como definido no artigo 3º do Decreto-Lei 74, enfim, na sua versão do Decreto-Lei 65 de 2018. O Decreto-Lei 133 de 2019 não tem qualquer referência ao conceito de horas de contacto. Okay? Um, um panorama geral e rápido sobre o trabalho realizado nos últimos 14 meses. Portanto, esta, a Comissão para a Educação à Distância da, da Agência foi criada uh, no final de julho de 2020, presidida uh, pelo professor Alberto Amaral, na altura ainda presidente do Conselho de Administração da Agência, e constituída por um conjunto enfim, de especialistas na área de educação à distância e por um representante do CRUP, um representante do CISP e um representante da APESP e também uma, um, uma representante da Universidade Aberta. Uh, o, o trabalho inicial desta comissão foi a, foi a, a criação barra adaptação dos guiões que vieram depois a ser utilizados, que é como base para a proposta, para a submissão de propostas de criação de novos ciclos de estudo nesta modalidade, quer para a respectiva avaliação. E este trabalho foi um trabalho que foi desenvolvido, enfim, entre agosto e outubro do ano passado. O período de submissão de novos ciclos de estudo foi aberto no dia 16 de outubro e, portanto, este período, a plataforma esteve aberta durante um mês para, para a submissão de novas propostas. Eu penso que é relevante referir o facto do período de aviso prévio, o anúncio, digamos, da abertura desta, desta call, 
ter sido relativamente reduzido face à data de abertura. O anúncio público foi feito no dia 7 de outubro e, portanto, pouco mais, um, pouco mais do que uma semana antes do início. E, portanto, é natural que muitas instituições, eu diria todas as instituições, tivessem sido apanhadas um pouco de surpresa pelo facto de, enfim, desta, deste período tão curto digamos, do anúncio da, 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 da abertura das, da, do período de submissão de propostas. Um, no fruto da, da recomposição da, da, do Conselho de Administração da Agência, uh, também foi feita uma recomposição da, da Comissão de Educação à Distância, e também, que foi também reforçada com um, a, a integração de um conjunto adicional de especialistas na área e a, a, a primeira fase, nós organizamos a avaliação um, dos, dos ciclos que foram submetidos que foram 59 ciclos uh, de estudos que foram submetidos organizamos a avaliação em três fases uma primeira fase que abrangeu quatro cursos uh, e que teve fundamentalmente como objetivo testar digamos todo o processo que era completamente novo de aplicação dos guiões, dos critérios de avaliação e portanto fizemos isso numa espécie de abordagem piloto ao processo de avaliação com o um primeiro conjunto de quatro propostas depois alargámos em fevereiro para mais 16 e finalmente em março para as restantes 39 e neste momento o trabalho que está a correr é a finalização da avaliação destes cursos da terceira fase e também eh, já foi iniciada a revisão dos guiões que irão ser utilizados para a nova call que irá ser aberta eh, em outubro, como, como iremos ver mais a seguir. Um, do ponto de vista da organização das comissões de avaliação externa, nas, na, na primeira e na segunda fase, Basicamente, os peritos de educação à distância que foram envolvidos foram os próprios membros da Comissão de Educação à Distância, enfim, com a colaboração de mais uma pessoa externa. E, na terceira fase, alargamos o envolvimento de peritos a um conjunto adicional de outros 14 peritos externos nacionais. E, portanto, na terceira fase esteve envolvido um total de 21 uh, especialistas na área de educação à distância. Cada uh, comissão uh, de avaliação externa foi constituída por três membros. Um, na primeira fase, dois peritos de educação à distância com um perito da área científica. Na fase 2, um perito da área de educação à distância e dois peritos da área científica. E na fase 3, um dos peritos da área científica passou a ser obrigatoriamente um uh, perito uh, estrangeiro. Este quadro mostra o resumo das propostas que foram submetidas para a criação de novos ciclos de estudo. Portanto, num total de 59 propostas que foram recebidas, 18 de primeiro ciclo, 39 de segundo ciclo, 2 de terceiro ciclo, apenas 6 propostas provenientes de instituições públicas e, portanto, a esmagadora maioria proveniente de instituições de ensino superior uh, privadas. A distribuição por uh, área da, Cana da CNAEF é esta que está aqui. Portanto, a maioria, de, uma, uma, um, digamos, os campeões da, da submissão de propostas foi a área de ciências empresariais, depois a área de formação de professores e ciências da educação, uh, aproximadamente uh, a par da área das ciências sociais. Uh, e depois uh, o conjunto de, de uh, áreas adicionais enfim, com esta distribuição que aqui é apresentada. Uh, por tipo de ensino, portanto, como já referi há pouco, a maioria das propostas foram submetidas por instituições privadas, 53, uh, e a maioria dos uh, ciclos uh, 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 dizia respeito a segundos ciclos, ok? 39 segundos ciclos, 18 primeiros ciclos e apenas dois terceiros ciclos. Este quadro mostra o estado atual, atualizado ao dia 15 de setembro, portanto, anteontem, do processo de avaliação. Okay? 
dos 59 uh, uh, ciclos de estudo que foram submetidos uh, já foram objeto de decisão uh, 31, uh, dos quais uh, dois ciclos de estudo a decisão é de acreditação, acreditação sem restrições, portanto um ciclo de estudos de terceiro ciclo um, público e um de segundo ciclo privado. A acreditação com, com condições quatro ciclos de estudos, portanto todos do privado, uh, três de segundo ciclo e um uh, de primeiro ciclo. Ok? Uh, 24 decisões de não acreditação e uma decisão de exclusão liminar. Uh, esta é uh, a indicação das áreas científicas do, do, dos cursos que foram suscetíveis, que, 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 sobre os quais caiu uma decisão de acreditação ou de acreditação com condições. Portanto, Ciências da Educação e Ciências Informáticas, dois cursos acreditados, um terceiro ciclo, um segundo ciclo. E acreditação com condições de três anos, um, um segundo ciclo na área do desporto. Uh, e acreditação com condições por um ano, um primeiro ciclo na área das Ciências Empresariais e um segundo ciclo na área das Ciências Sociais e de Comportamento e um outro na área das Ciências da Educação. Ok? Aqueles números que estão ali é o número de vagas uh, 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 aceito para, para cada um destes cursos acreditados ou acreditado com condições. Principais destaques da avaliação. Aspectos mais positivos. A existência de algumas infraestruturas e sistemas tecnológicos de suporte à educação e assistência na generalidade das instituições que apresentaram propostas de criação de novos ciclos de estudo. Uh, nomeadamente no que respeita a a experiência da utilização de plataformas de tipo LMS, a existência de sistemas de gestão académica desmaterializada, enfim, que já é um pouco generalizada em todas as instituições, e também a facilidade de acesso online a recursos bibliográficos, naturalmente incluindo o acesso à Bion, mas não só. Aspectos menos positivos da, da, da avaliação, Bom, um, todos eles naturalmente relacionados com os critérios definidos pelo Decreto-Lei 133. Uh, um, um dos aspectos uh, uh, que foi bastante frequente foi a falta de preparação pedagógica do corpo docente, que como vimos é um dos requisitos obrigatórios para um, a existência de ciclos acreditados nesta modalidade. Uh, uma parte significativa das instituições uh, apresentou, digamos, como demonstração, como evidência da formação dos seus docentes, a frequência de alguns webinars, uh, alguns webinars até de muito curta duração, duas horas, três horas, uh, e MOOCs com abordagens de natureza passivas, informativas, uh, a ausência de formação envolvendo a experiência concreta de desenho curricular e de práticas de animação de ambientes de aprendizagem online. Outro aspecto menos positivo, mais ou menos transversal, eu diria a maioria dos cursos que não foram objeto de acreditação, é a falta de, ou, 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 ou as deficiências ao nível da, da, da existência de pessoal técnico qualificado e da existência de uma equipa de suporte técnico ou pedagógico, portanto, a ausência de detalhes sobre a composição e qualificação dos membros dessa equipa, a ausência de técnicos qualificados para o apoio pedagógico e muitas vezes a equipa constituída por técnicos informáticos sem qualificações para o apoio pedagógico. A adequação, outro aspecto também muito frequente nos ciclos de estudo que não foram objeto de uma apreciação positiva o facto de não haver uma adequação do modelo pedagógico à exigência do artigo 8º do decreto-lei. Em muitas situações se verificou uma, uma, uma proposta de, de um modelo pedagógico basicamente baseado numa lógica de transposição literal do modelo presencial para online, a ausência de flexibilização de atividades e de percurso formativo, a ausência de diversificação e flexibilização das estratégias e técnicas de avaliação. 
Uh, outra, outro, outro aspecto menos positivo, muito frequente, uh, nas propostas que não foram uh, objeto de uma apreciação positiva, foi o problema da declinação do modelo pedagógico nas unidades curriculares. Okay? Uh, assistimos frequentemente a um, uma proposta de modelo pedagógico completamente desarticulada, depois com a declinação desse modelo, nas, nas, nas estratégias pedagógicas concretas de cada unidade curricular do plano de estudos. Portanto, desenho curricular das unidades sem articulação, ou mesmo, ou, ou mesmo por vezes até em contradição com o modelo pedagógico enunciado, e cópia de desenho curricular entre unidades curriculares com objetivos, metodologias e estratégias de avaliação diferentes, sem atenção às especificidades de cada OC. Portanto, frequentemente assistimos a propostas em que Uh, foi, uh, houve uma opção por, por um copy-paste, digamos, do modelo pedagógico de cada unidade curricular, um, em, entre as diferentes unidades curriculares. Uh, neste momento, e para terminar, decorre, como eu já referi há pouco, a conclusão da avaliação da COL 2020. Está a proceder-se à revisão dos guiões, uh, porque a nossa experiência, naturalmente, um, revelou a necessidade de haver um conjunto de melhorias uh, dos guiões, tanto do ponto de vista dos guiões de submissão como dos aspectos relacionados com a avaliação. E já foi anunciado em, em 15 de julho de 2021 uh, o período de submissão da próxima call, da call para 2021, que vai estar aberta de 26 de outubro a 26 de novembro de 2021. E, portanto, naturalmente fica aqui o convite e o incentivo a que as instituições apresentem um, propostas um, neste período para, para a avaliação. Muito obrigado. Existirá alguma pergunta muito breve, uma vez que nós estamos mesmo ultrapassados em tempo? Muito breve, por favor. Olá. Muito boa tarde. Luís Vilar, através da Universidade Europeia. Um, eu acho que, antes mais, obrigado pela vossa apresentação. Eu acho que este momento é, é muito importante para, para percebermos aquilo que não estamos a fazer bem e não estamos a convergir com o que é expectável. Um, obviamente que, que já foi aqui falado, o, 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 o tempo limitado para a submissão uh, acabou por contaminar a qualidade dos cursos. Eu sinto muito isso. Um, e hoje, com mais tempo, consigo ainda melhor perceber isso e também com a ajuda da A3S e, da, e das CAIS. Um, Poderíamos discutir isto durante muito tempo, aliás, eu gostava de aprender mais sobre isto, mas há uma questão que me parece fundamental. Tem a ver com, com a exigência que as CAIs estão a fazer de que os docentes tenham experiência no ensino à distância. Ora, o que a lei diz um, é formação, não é experiência. Um, e todas as CAIs, ou quase todas as CAIs, nos apontaram que é preciso experiência. Ora, eu pergunto-me como é que nós fazemos inovação em qualquer área que não seja educação hum, com experiência, porque se é inovação é porque nós nunca fizemos e vamos tentar fazer. Portanto, eu só, só colocaria esta questão de uma forma muito breve, se não deveríamos perceber melhor que é formação e não é experiência, porque é o que está escrito na lei, e, e pedir e alegar a ausência de experiência no ensino à distância para, para reprovar uma, uma acreditação, parece-me excessivo. Por isso, Gostaria só de, de saber os seus comentários relativamente a esta matéria. Muito obrigado. De facto, o que o decreto-lei refere é a existência de formação, não é? A formação sem alguma experiência concreta também não se consegue, não é? E, portanto, provavelmente o que as CAIS... Enfim, eu não conheço, como imagina, não conheço os relatórios das CAIS todas, mas aquilo que está estabelecido é que haja exigência do ponto de vista das evidências no que respeita à formação pedagógica dos docentes. E a formação pedagógica dos docentes é algo que implica necessariamente alguma experiência direta de concepção e de gestão da dinâmica de comunidades online. Okay? E, portanto, eu penso que é nessa medida que a questão da experiência tem vindo a ser uh, equacionada e utilizada pelas CAIS para, para justificar a sua apreciação. Portanto, penso que é essa a interpretação que deve dar à, à questão da experiência. Bom, então, uma vez que nós estamos um pouco atrasados já, começamos a seguir o almoço, depois daquele almoço Muito fantástico. E, portanto, 
Encerrávamos aqui esta, esta parte da conferência, vamos fazer um coffee break e depois voltamos para a parte final. Está bem? Obrigada. início ao debate que, que se impõe nesta fase, depois de termos aprendido hoje mais algum, um pouco sobre ensino à distância, algumas práticas, alguns conceitos e a importância de alguns temas de avaliação ou de feedback ou, ou de, de, daquilo que acontece em termos globais no ensino à distância por, por esse mundo. Temos agora a oportunidade de falar um pouco sobre a prática das inscrições e a visão das inscrições e para isso temos aqui representantes do grupo do CISP e da PESP e para isso eu vou passar a palavra a cada um dos senhores professores, representantes dos respectivos conselhos e pedir-lhes para fazerem um pequeno comentário de 5, 10 minutos sobre aquilo que as inscrições pensam sobre o ensino à distância, que dificuldades é que tem e qual é o futuro, no fundo, qual é o futuro das instituições em termos de ensino à distância. Se calhar eu passava à professora Rita para começar a falar. Muito obrigado. Olá, muito boa tarde. Cumprimento os meus colegas e todos os presentes aqui e online. Centrando-me um pouco no, no ensino politécnico, eu diria que nós temos um ensino mais técnico, mais tecnológico, e que nesta fase estamos mesmo num panorama em que começamos a falar claramente em reskilling e upskilling. Por isso os politécnicos têm tido um papel relevante na qualificação das regiões onde estão inseridos, e temos agora metas todos, não é? O ensino superior no global, mas metas até 2030 de, de aumentar esta qualificação, e eu diria que passa não só pelo alargar da, da formação inicial, mas sobretudo, e é isso que nas instituições começamos a sentir e a apostar e a delinear, o alargar a formação ao longo da vida, que é algo que já foi dito aqui hoje várias vezes. Quando falamos em formação ao longo da vida, é claro que temos que, eu diria quase que obrigatoriamente, começar a falar também em modelos de ensino à distância, porque estamos nos a referir a um público-alvo que são profissionais no ativo, e faz todo o sentido encontrar modelos que permitam a tal gestão, flexibilidade entre a gestão da vida profissional, familiar, pessoal, quer dizer, há toda aqui uma compatibilização que fica muito mais fácil, não é? E com isso conseguimos trazer muito mais para o ensino superior e para esta formação ao, ao longo da vida. Ainda há uma semana atrás apresentámos um conjunto até de candidaturas ligadas até ao impulso adulto, e sem dúvida nenhuma que o ensino à distância vai ter que ser um dos modelos a adotar para conseguirmos atingir aquilo que nos, nos propomos. Eu diria que para além desta adequação ao público-alvo, ao público-alvo que claramente assumimos nos próximos tempos, há também aqui uma grande vantagem que cada vez mais tem sido procurada, que tem a ver com o trabalho em rede. Por isso o trabalho entre várias instituições, e aqui falo até em concreto de graus conjuntos, é algo que penso que cada vez mais as instituições reconhecem que é uma garantia de qualidade, quer dizer, é uma junção de know-how, de especialidade, e temos toda a vantagem em poder montar graus com o know-how, não é? com, com a experiência e, e os peritos de várias instituições. Claro que recorrendo a modelos de ensino à distância fica muito mais fácil compatibilizar e criar estes graus conjuntos, quer a nível nacional, quer mesmo a nível internacional com outras instituições parceiras e eu diria que há já alguns modelos não é? há já várias experiências no país de, de, de cursos criados num formato de ensino à distância há outros num, num formato presencial mas provavelmente compatibilizando os dois e por exemplo remetendo para momentos presenciais mais intensivos, mais curtos torna mais fácil realmente esta efetiva colaboração entre instituições de diferentes regiões, diferentes locais Focando aqui um bocadinho na, na parte que é os prós e os contras e o compromisso institucional. Eu acredito que de uma forma uh, global, quer dizer, começa a haver cada vez mais também um reconhecimento top-down da importância e da aposta e, 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 e do querer fazer e querer incorporar na, na prática de, de todas as instituições a componente uh, de learning, a componente de ensino à distância. Hoje também já foi aqui um pouco discutido Uh, se são duas instituições separadas ou se devem ser conjuntas 
eu particularmente acredito que deve ser conjunto, quer dizer, penso, e posso dar um exemplo concreto, não é? Nós, no, por exemplo, no Politécnico Leiria, quando iniciámos com licenciaturas à distância, o corpo docente era exatamente o mesmo, por isso tínhamos os mesmos professores a dar o curso de modo presencial e à distância. E tiveram que ter muita formação, e já lá vou um pouco mais ao investimento em que haver nessa formação. Mas dizer que o facto de termos os mesmos professores uh, nos dois regimes, e inclusivamente a avaliação por exames, a avaliação era comum, e isso foi fundamental para a credibilidade, para a garantia da qualidade e para esta tal, esta tal questão que hoje também foi, já foi referida e foi referida muito para a Susan, de garantir a qualidade e, e ter ao máximo também mostrar que a qualidade das aprendizagens de um lado e do outro são equiparáveis, mesmo que as metodologias uh, sejam bastante distintas. Dizer que do ponto de vista, e, e agora no final da tarde começámos a conversar um pouco mais disso, é fundamental haver aqui um investimento muito grande na formação dos professores. E quando estamos a falar de formação, estamos a falar de formação em contexto, eu até diria, nós defendemos muitas vezes que o ideal para não termos um bom professor à, à distância é alguém que já tenha sido estudante à distância, que já tenha passado por essa experiência, e por isso é que muitas vezes a grande maioria dos cursos de e-professores, e-tutores, optam por esse regime, precisamente porque o primeiro passo a dar quando queremos a tal transformação digital, não é transformar um professor do presencial num professor do digital, digamos assim, é ele também passar por esse processo de ser estudante à distância, e depois, não é só formação sobre modelos dada de uma forma passiva, quer dizer, quando falamos de informação tem que ser uma informação estruturada e que envolva, por exemplo, a adaptação, a construção do desenho curricular, do, de uma unidade curricular, quer dizer, uma, uma aplicação em contexto e em que haja aqui um apoio. O que liga também com outra questão, que não é que está no, no nosso decreto no 133, que é a tal equipa. E quando falamos aqui de uma equipa técnica de apoio, tanto para estudantes como para professores, não estamos a falar só de técnicos de informática ou técnicos de design, não estamos a falar só de recursos e de materiais um pouco mais ricos, um pouco mais bonitos, estamos a falar aqui muito do desenho curricular dos instructional designers, não é? Alguém que até ajuda e senta-se ao lado do professor e não é só uma questão de adaptar as sessões presenciais para sessões síncronas, os materiais para materiais um pouco mais ricos, trata-se de rever mesmo o desenho e o funcionamento todo o MOC, repensar as atividades e depois isto está ligado também, não é? Alguém que perceba e que domina o assunto e que trabalha com o professor, está ligado com muito aquilo que foi dito de manhã que é a importância do feedback, o não centrar tudo numa avaliação no final do semestre, num exame, não, tem que haver outros instrumentos, tem que haver todas as atividades, por isso eu dizer que do ponto de vista institucional, e há muito por fazer, mas eu acredito que as instituições cada vez mais começam a reconhecer, é necessário investir, investir nas plataformas, penso que é onde a maioria até por fruto daquilo que foi os últimos dois anos, investir nas plataformas, e aqui plataformas, não digo só as plataformas de aprendizagem, mas também as plataformas académicas, a interoperabilidade entre plataformas, é fundamental todo esse investimento, é fundamental a equipa técnica de suporte aos estudantes, eu não digo estar, ter um técnico às três da manhã para ajudar um estudante, mas idealmente alguém até à meia-noite ou alguém a partir das oito da manhã, porque sim, e isso também se aplica se calhar a todos os estudantes, também os do presencial, não é? Todos nós sentimos isso agora, e, e depois eu diria este, este apoio constante, esta formação pedagógica constante para os professores, por isso eu diria que estas são claramente as áreas, e acredito também que o trabalho que a a es agora está a fazer também é um pouco a ajudar a nortear, e, e não só os professores, como os coordenadores de curso, como até a nível institucional, onde é que as instituições têm que investir se querem mesmo dar passos de qualidade nesta área da educação à distância. Obrigado. Boa tarde a todos. Boa tarde aqui aos meus colegas na mesa. Eu não podia deixar de estar mais de acordo com o meu colega Rico. De facto, uh, o ensino à distância uh, abre o... Quer dizer, eu, eu vim de uma universidade de, uh, tradicional de, de ensino cara a cara. Uh, este ensino à distância uh, abriu quase que, com a pandemia, aqui uma nova fronteira. Isto é, abriu um continente novo. De, de dimensão que todas as instituições de ensino superior um, agora olham com olhos diferentes. Eu já estava cá, nós é que nunca tínhamos olhado para eles, eu acho que se calhar o grande fruto da, da pandemia foi isso de mostrar uma realidade que lá estava, eu sei que a Universidade Aberta já existe há muitos anos e está muito à frente nisto, mas para a maior parte da, das outras era uma coisa muito distante. Eu não posso deixar de estar mais de acordo com, com, aqui, com, a, com as necessidades 
de que temos, de que o ensino à distância é uma coisa diferente do que já foi, isto já foi dito várias vezes hoje, do que fizemos no período de Covid. Ou seja, no período de Covid não foi bem ensino à distância, foi, foi um ensino de emergência à distância para um ensino presencial que foi desenhado presencial. E isso leva-me um pouco a, se calhar, um pouco à necessidade das instituições mudarem um bocadinho a sua forma de pensar e a sua forma de articular para incorporarem o verdadeiro ensino à distância. Eu, eu falando um bocadinho da realidade que aconteceu na minha própria instituição, eu devo dizer que uh, no início, em, em março de 2018, quando na prática tornou-se evidente que tínhamos fechado o ensino presencial, uh, que foi, o, foi o pânico generalizado no corpo docente. Uh, e agora o que é que fazemos e tudo mais? E uh, conseguimos adaptar, e acho que todas as universidades, e todas as instituições de ensino superior fizeram um trabalho fantástico de conseguir, num tempo recorde, transferir uh, esse ensino para um ensino à distância, com as limitações nós sabemos. Mas o, o, o que eu verifiquei na altura foi, uh, demos alguma formação ao nosso corpo docente e uh, passou aquele momento de pânico inicial para um momento de euforia. E, e eu não sei se aconteceu nas outras instituições, mas na minha aconteceu um pouco. Ah, afinal, isto afinal não é assim uma coisa tão difícil. Afinal, mexer no Zoom ou no Teams, que eu achava que era um papão, não temos um corpo docente assim tão, 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 tão idoso, de, idoso não é a palavra correta, <risos> tão envelhecido, mas com algumas, da, com algumas limitações e conseguiram atravessar essas limitações. E, e depois esse ponto de euforia disse, levou à questão, ah, então isto agora podemos fazer todos os cursos, isto passamos os cursos todos aqui à distância, porque é, uma, é fantástico, vai ser a solução que vai permitir trazer muitos alunos, porque a minha universidade é em Lisboa, há problemas de residência, as casas são caras. E eu acho que neste momento, passando uh, este período, este período de primeiro pânico e período de euforia, é que está a altura de facto de pensarmos verdadeiramente no ensino à distância. Ou seja, passarmos nas várias dimensões de que o ensino à distância não é meramente pegar no modelo de ensino presencial, mete no zoom e já está. Mistura, junta um bocadinho de água, não é isso. Okay? Tem que ser uma coisa pensada de raiz. Tem que ser uma coisa adaptada mesmo para ser um curso diferente, um curso com essas ferramentas e desenhado, como a lei diz, para permitir um ensino que pode ser feito em qualquer lugar e mais ou menos a qualquer altura. Ou seja, aquele paradigma de que nós tínhamos no ensino presencial que, por mais diferentes fossem os alunos, havia algumas coisas que eles tinham em comum, estavam todos no mesmo fuso horário, okay? estavam todos na mesma região geográfica, isso desaparece com o ensino à distância. E isso põe uma série destes desafios que a Rita tão bem aqui definiu e que nós temos que pensar. E não só os docentes têm que pensar, mas acima de tudo, e aqui falando como parte da, da direção de uma instituição, a própria instituição, a própria direção tem que acolher. Ou seja, temos que refletir nos recursos, temos que refletir na forma de valorização dessas atividades. O ensino à distância não é um ensino só para trazer uns alunos um ensino de segunda, não, é um novo ciclo de estudos. E isto tem todas as dimensões, para além das dimensões técnicas e tudo mais, mesmo a dimensão da valorização da carreira dos docentes. Eu, por exemplo, contra mim falo, em que nós temos um modelo de, de avaliação que conta muito nas bases das horas de aulas presenciais efetivas. E nós sabemos que o ensino à distância, essas até devem ser as mais pequenas. Porque nós temos que ter um ensino que acompanha o, o, o aluno, um ensino que vai ter um, uma quantidade de trabalho muito adicional na sua preparação desse ciclo. Isso tudo não é contabilizado, pelo menos no nosso caso, na forma como nós avaliamos o trabalho dos docentes. E isso é algo que temos que mudar e todas as instituições têm que fazer esse trabalho de refletir isso tudo, para além de todas as outras dimensões. Obrigado. É só falar? Obrigado. Então, primeiro, boa tarde a todos e a todas, como agora temos que dizer e um cumprimento particular aqui à mesa e uma constatação que eu acho muito interessante não deve ser por acaso quer a Rita, quer eu somos oriundos da mesma instituição embora já lá não esteja há oito anos e estivemos direto ou indiretamente ligados 
ao lançamento da unidade de ensino à distância do Politécnico de Nicolaria, eu tive desde o princípio ligado à unidade, e aliás fui responsável institucional por ela durante quatro anos, e agora estamos aqui os dois, aliás um colega nosso, o Rogério, há bocado mandou-me uma mensagem, viu-nos à distância, e disse, é pá, fantástico, dois aqui da ESL, nós éramos os dois da ESL, estão aí nesse, nesse fórum, é uma constatação interessante. Depois congratular a... a a A3E, na pessoa do seu presidente e da sua direção, por uh, ter considerado a APESP, que é a entidade que eu aqui represento, uh, em pé de igualdade com o CRUP e com o CISP, uh, o que não é habitual, uh, porque infelizmente em Portugal há muita gente que julga que o Estado é para uh, servir o Estado. Não é? O Estado é uma entidade que serve a comunidade. Mas em Portugal há muitos responsáveis de muitas instituições ao mais alto nível que acham que o Estado é para servir o Estado, não é para servir a comunidade. E nós próprios nos queixamos muitas vezes disso, e muitas vezes até com alguma incompreensão das pessoas, porque somos discriminados em muitas situações. Eu já tive uma vez uma situação em que uma diretora de um hospital me disse, não, primeiro estão cá os alunos do público, depois é que são os do privado, porque o Estado é para servir as pessoas que andam nas escolas do Estado. E, portanto, felicitamos o Sr. Professor e a A3ES, por finalmente termos uma instituição que nos põe a todos em, em pé de igualdade. Relativamente a, a esta questão, eu não vou entrar em muitos detalhes, porque acho que aquilo que era fundamental dizer sobre o ensino à distância já foi dito, e vou fazer aqui uma apreciação um bocadinho mais política ou institucional. E é assim. Eu acho que há aqui uma situação que é inevitável considerar, que assim, uma coisa era o ensino à distância antes da pandemia, Outra coisa é o ensino à distância depois da pandemia. Não tem nada a ver uma coisa com a outra. Isto é como comparar os táxis com os Ubers. É mais ou menos a mesma coisa. Portanto, os táxis podem continuar a querer fazer o seu serviço, a ter as suas regras, mas agora toda a gente anda de Uber. E, portanto, aqui é um bocadinho a mesma coisa. Isto foi uma barragem que estava fechada. Toda a gente percebia que o ensino superior não podia continuar a funcionar com as regras de há dois séculos, não é? que era ainda o paradigma fundamental em que o ensino superior se se orientava, e hoje houve aqui uma série de colegas nossos que deram aqui uma lição de ciências de educação, para quem é das ciências de educação isto pouco trouxe novidade, mas para quem não é, provavelmente foi novidade para muitas pessoas o que aqui foi dito. E, portanto, percebia-se que o ensino estava estagnado, era preciso mudar. O que a pandemia, felizmente, neste campo, neste campo veio fazer foi mudar tudo aquilo que era até agora, que eram, enfim, animais sagrados ou... Uh, o que lhe queiram chamar e portanto houve um dia que se rompeu toda a gente começou a utilizar o Zoom o Teams e seja o que for e agora é imparável isso, portanto pode vir a agência colocar muitas limitações aos cursos, pode vir quem quiser por muitas limitações que as instituições provaram esta situação e vão continuar a utilizá-la quer a APES, quer a a 3 s queira, quer não queira enfim, essa é a realidade e basta olhar para o que se passa neste momento para aquilo que as instituições estão a fazer para perceber que este é o caminho e portanto, eu acho que todos nós a agência e os responsáveis institucionais têm que olhar para esta realidade com olhos de ver podem vir as CAIs querer impor imensas coisas mas a realidade é o que é e portanto, a realidade acaba sempre por vencer perante as forças do do, do, do retrocesso, do querer colocar barreiras, etc. E, portanto, eu acho que é preciso olhar para esta conferência de hoje com olhos do futuro e pensar como é que nós podemos aproveitar toda a experiência que tivemos nestes últimos tempos para incorporar o melhor que há no ensino à distância. O ensino à distância é uma realidade muito antiga em Portugal. Eu devo recordar que a telescola que muitos não se lembrarão, porque não tenho idade para isso, foi o primeiro exemplo de ensino à distância em Portugal, aliás, com imenso valor, só que como nós, enfim, depois do 25 de Abril, achámos que tudo aquilo que tinha a ver com o Estado Novo devia ser banido, as pessoas baniram praticamente toda a experiência da tal escola, que é uma experiência riquíssima, e aliás, a Universidade Aberta, nos seus primeiros tempos, bebeu muito daquilo que era a experiência da tal escola. É preciso ter isso em atenção e não digamos assim, não deitar para o caixote do lixo, a experiência que nós temos nesta matéria, que foi, aliás, pioneira uh, para a época e com belíssimos resultados. Eu, um dos primeiros estudos que eu fiz quando fiz o mestrado em Boston e regressei foi exatamente fazer um estudo sobre a tela escola e, ao contrário daquilo que se dizia por aí, a tela escola não tinha um ensino pior, nem, nem os resultados dos alunos eram piores do que os resultados do, dos alunos do presencial, embora fosse Vox Populi que assim acontecia. E, portanto, eu acho que nós devemos incorporar na nossa experiência todas estes todas estas estes contributos. Por outro lado, relativamente à, àquilo que é hoje a Universidade Aberta, que é a nossa, enfim, 
principal, o principal player, digamos assim, nesta área, até à pandemia. Eu acho que a Universidade da Aberta tem aqui um papel muitíssimo importante de se perceber que não pode mais continuar a viver num espaço fechado e tem que partilhar isso com toda a gente. E, portanto, eu tenho uma perspectiva muito crítica do, do, do decreto do 133, nomeadamente, em algumas coisas que têm a ver com o posicionamento da Universidade Aberta, mas isso é um problema meu pessoal, não vou agora aqui eh, elucubrar sobre isso, mas acho que a Universidade Aberta tem aqui um papel importantíssimo, mas é preciso que perceba que tem que partilhar eh, com todas as outras instituições. Relativamente à formação de professores, foi uma coisa que aqui foi eh, referenciada várias vezes. Eu acho que há aqui um erro enorme. O ensino à distância não se faz com professores, faz com equipas multidisciplinares. Faz com equipas multidisciplinares. O professor é apenas um L dessa cadeia. Os instructional designers, como há bocado aqui a Rita falou, são tão importantes como os professores. Portanto, é, um, é, é, uma, é, uma, é uma falsa ideia dizer que nós precisamos só de ter professores qualificados. Não, nós precisamos ter equipas multidisciplinares, em que o professor é apenas um elemento dessa equipa. Há um conjunto de outras pessoas que são aqui necessárias. Portanto, por favor, a A3S não se fixe nos professores e na formação e na qualificação dos professores. É das equipas. As escolas têm que ter equipas multidisciplinares capazes de responder aos desafios que o ensino à distância coloca e que não são assim tão diferentes daqueles que colocam o ensino presencial. E só para vos dar um exemplo, o que é que nós assistimos hoje aqui nesta conferência? Quantas pessoas aqui falaram especialistas em ensino à distância? O que é que aconteceu aqui hoje? O que podia ter acontecido há 50 anos atrás? As pessoas falavam, hoje utilizaram este, esta tecnologia. Se fosse há 50 anos atrás, escreveu no quadro preto. Se fosse há 40, tinham utilizado um retroprojetor. Se fosse um bocadinho mais recentemente, tinham utilizado um projetor de slides. E hoje usamos isto. Mas o que é que aconteceu? Nós estivemos aí sentados a ouvir as pessoas. E agora a assistência está a nos ouvir a nós. Onde é que aqui se traduziu aquilo que são hoje os grandes apores do ensino à distância? Aquilo que nós vemos em qualquer apresentação, quando vamos a uma apresentação aí de uma empresa, ou o que seja, ou de um grande programa, o que é que nós vemos? É isto? Não. Isto é o que a gente faz nas aulas com o apoio tecnológico avançado. Portanto, não tem nada a ver com isto. Nós próprios não incorporamos na nossa ação aquilo que são as conquistas, os desafios, as tecnologias que nós temos à mão hoje. Porque senão, os colegas que falaram da Austrália ou de, de outro sítio qualquer, tinham feito uns vídeos com 8, 10 minutos, provavelmente transmitiu a mesma mensagem e nós ficávamos todos muito mais satisfeitos a ouvi-los. Esta é que é a realidade. Portanto, nós temos que mudar os paradigmas em que permanentemente estamos a viver no campo da educação. Porque isto que aqui se teve a fazer é exatamente aquilo que é clássico fazer. Não houve aqui nenhuma mudança relativamente ao que é clássico. Ora, isto é que é preciso mudar completamente. E, portanto, se nós estamos aqui a falar de ensino à distância e queremos virar as nossas instituições para serem melhores, para chegarem mais longe relativamente ao ensino à distância, temos que começar por mudar todos os paradigmas que até agora temos como adquiridos e que não estão adequados aos tempos presentes. Reparem, ensino à distância toda a gente já faz. Os alunos passam a vida nas aulas a mexer no telemóvel. Vão para casa, o que é que as pessoas fazem quando chegam às conferências? Abrem os computadores e começam a mexer nos computadores. É isto, o ensino à distância é para usar. É uma coisa que aqui ainda não se falou hoje, que eu acho que é fundamental e é base de tudo. A autonomia dos estudantes. O que nós temos é que dar autonomia aos estudantes. E só se falou aqui dos professores e de dar coisas aos estudantes. Não, o que nós temos é que desenvolver a autonomia dos estudantes. E para terminar, <coughs> queria só dizer uma pequena coisa. Uh, um colega tinha-me falado dos resultados da avaliação. E disse, é pá, uma vergonha, os privados apresentam não sei quantos projetos, os públicos só apresentam seis. Eu acho que é normal. As escolas do Estado estão asseguradas pelo Orçamento Geral do Estado. Os privados é que têm que trabalhar pela vida, têm que fazer pela vida, têm que arranjar cursos, têm que arranjar mais alunos. E, portanto, é natural que os privados estejam mais interessados em usar novas tecnologias, em ir mais longe, do que as escolas do Estado. Desculpem lá, eu também já fui do Estado, agora estou num privado, tenho uma percepção. Não é diferente porque eu sempre penso o que penso agora. Agora, confronto-me todos os dias com outras realidades que não aquelas com que me confrontava. Quando era dirigente da, do público ou do Ministério da Educação, do que fosse, eu sabia o que é que tinha para gerir, que era o orçamento do Estado. Agora, e mais aquilo que eu conseguia das despesas, das receitas privadas. Agora, só vive das propinas dos alunos. E, portanto, todas as instituições privadas vivem só das propinas dos alunos, não têm depois nenhum do Estado. 
e às vezes quando abrem concursos ainda beneficiam as escolas do Estado ou os institutos do Estado contra os interesses dos privados. Portanto, é natural que nós tenhamos interesse em apresentar mais cursos, em aproveitar todas as oportunidades para ir um bocadinho mais longe, para captar mais alunos e, sobretudo, para ir para, para, para outros públicos. Nós também temos interesse em ir para o interior, também temos interesse em chegar aos Palop, também temos interesse em ir para muitos outros sítios. Eu, aliás, há bocado havia uma coisa que me fez uma certa espécie, porque eu até já trabalhei também com o UNED, é não haver um único aluno da UNED em Portugal. Achei estranho. Ou, ou o colega da UNED se esqueceu dos portugueses, ou então achei estranhíssimo, porque eu, a noção que tenho é que também há alunos da UNED cá em Portugal. Uh, mas, de qualquer maneira, isso é um problema. De qualquer forma, eu gostava, sobretudo, de salientar este aspecto que é assim. Temos que mudar o paradigma. E não é tanto uma questão de falar das coisas como é que o ensino à distância deve ser ou não deve ser. Deve ser é questionar os próprios fundamentos do modelo e como é que nós o podemos aplicar de uma forma generalizada, porque o ensino nunca mais vai voltar a ser o que era. Portanto, daqui para a frente é presencial, face to face e online, e, e, e não há volta a dar a isso. Muito obrigado. Eu acho que como nós ainda temos algum tempo, eu passava a palavra para a audiência e, e, e aceitava inscrições para duas ou três questões e depois passávamos novamente aqui a, a, ao palco. Professor Fernando Ramos. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado. Era só para, para introduzir um tema que que eu penso que valia a pena, se calhar, recolher algumas opiniões, alguns comentários do painel, que é o facto de nós irmos cada vez mais assistindo a soluções híbridas, à emergência de soluções híbridas, e não apenas esta coisa dicotómica de ensino presencial por um lado, ensinar de ciência pelo outro, ok? Eu estou convencido, e, e não, penso que não, não é preciso uma, uma, bola, uma, uma, uma bola mágica uh, para, para, para antever isto, que nós vamos ver o surgimento crescente de cada vez mais soluções híbridas que vão num contínuo desde, entre estes dois extremos, do completamente presencial e completamente à distância. E, portanto, isso vai ser uma realidade que nós vamos ter e vai ser uma realidade que vai enriquecer, do meu ponto de vista, o conjunto de soluções que as instituições têm ao dispor, enfim, para chegar aos seus públicos-alvo, e o contrário, não é? Os, as pessoas para a, a melhorar a sua formação e qualificação. Obrigado. Muito obrigado. Boa tarde. Uh, é muito rápida. Fui eu o único que, uh, quem fez comissão aparecer ali cursos acreditados à distância com 25 vagas. Obrigado. Mais alguma questão? Eu, eu talvez não precisasse dizer, mas o, o contributo que a agência, como é, como é óbvio, o contributo que a agência de avaliação e acreditação do ensino superior quer dar para esta nova modalidade de ensino à distância é uma reflexão. E, e hoje o que pretendemos foi praticar boas práticas, comparar e, enfim, e ouvir alguma coisa sobre boas práticas, mas também ver os resultados. E, e alguns dos aspectos que o professor Fernando Ramos aqui eh, mostrou eh, são conclusões de uma primeira análise dos processos que foram submetidos à agência, não interessa se é público ou privado, mas do total dos processos que foram uh, submetidos à agência nessa primeira fase. E há duas ou três conclusões evidentes, que já foram aqui muito discutidas. Uma delas é que foi evidente que maior parte ou a grande parte dos processos que foram não acreditados tinham como base a conversão automática dos processos do presencial para o ensino à distância. Portanto, enfim, não adequaram uh, aquilo que é o espírito do ensino à distância. E, por outro lado, as dificuldades, quer em termos de recursos humanos, recursos técnicos, humanos, docentes e de formação pedagógica e também não docentes, que foi aqui falado, e, e outro aspecto que sobressai também um bocadinho dos, dos, de, desta nossa conversa é que é muito importante, alguém dizia de manhã, que a capacidade do ensino à distância para ir de encontro às necessidades dos estudantes ultrapassa um bocadinho tudo aquilo que nós estamos aqui a falar, das preocupações das instituições e dos professores, etc. Um, e, portanto, eu acho que, 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 que ainda há muito para fazer. Este é um primeiro momento de discussão. Para o ano, provavelmente, teremos outros dados para discutir. E aquilo que a agência quer mesmo é que todas as propostas que vão ser submetidas, enfim, entre 20 e qualquer coisa de outubro e 20 e tal de novembro, sejam boas propostas para podermos, de alguma forma, 
um, subscrever este projeto para o ensino superior em Portugal. A outra questão só que eu queria acrescentar como pequeno pormenor, e já passo a palavra aos, aos meus colegas do painel, é que, de facto, em Espanha, desde abril ou maio, um real decreto põe em evidência a existência de um modelo híbrido. Em Portugal, neste momento, a agência pode acreditar cursos na modalidade presencial e na modalidade de ensino à distância, porque é isso que, que, que está na legislação em vigor. Em Espanha, eles introduziram um novo conceito de modelo híbrido, que talvez sirva a algumas das questões que foram aqui levantadas, que, que, que considera uma determinada porcentagem de ensino à distância, não acima dos 75 como nós temos, mas entre 40 e 60, e que provavelmente poderá servir algumas das, como base para algumas das discussões que foram aqui tidas. Neste momento a agência só pode acreditar cursos de ensino à distância ou presencial. Eu passava a palavra agora novamente. Comentar rapidamente o comentário do Fernando Ramos, para dizer que eu estou totalmente de acordo, aliás, daquilo que eu conheço das instituições de ensino superior, ele tem vindo a ser feito ao longo dos anos, tirando a universidade aberta, não, não temos falado tanto de e-learning, temos falado de e-learning, que é precisamente este blended, o, o ter as duas coisas, não é? Ter a atividade online com momentos presenciais. E eu diria que no, a maioria das instituições presenciais, provavelmente ele será o modelo ideal, porque por um lado dá a resposta àquilo que também hoje já foi levantado, não é? O trabalho em oficina, em laboratórios, há um conjunto de conhecimento tácito que é muito mais fácil de aprender em determinados contextos e, e, torna, e, e torna mais rica essa experiência. E depois, por outro lado, há aqui também outra dimensão que cá não foi tanto focada, foi focada um bocadinho de manhã, que é a construção da comunidade de aprendizagem, do tal grupo. E sem dúvida nenhuma, quem em qualquer turma, mesmo uma turma de uma pós-graduação, de um mestrado, havendo alguns momentos presenciais, há ali todo um conjunto de relações sociais e informais entre estudantes, entre estudantes e professor, que são fundamentais para o trabalho em equipa, que também é uma dimensão que se cá não foi tão conversada hoje, mas que na maioria dos modelos pedagógicos de ensino à distância se tenta isto, não é? Que o estudante não esteja sozinho a trabalhar de forma individual em casa e que haja uma cooperação entre pares e muito trabalho em equipa. Por isso isto para dizer que sim, eu acho que temos tudo a ganhar em apostar neste híbrido. Agora a palavra é híbrido, não é? Noutros tempos de learning mas claramente penso que podemos e que devemos ir para aí. Sim. Um, complementando a, a intervenção do Fernando Ramos, eu também concordo que a, a solução híbrido é algo que se saiu da, da caixa e já não volta. Ou seja, neste momento, todas as universidades, dentro do limite que nós temos neste momento na lei, hão de estar a adotar alguns dos créditos no ensino parcialmente à distância. Eu, a única, o único receio, mas esse é um receio mais pessoal que eu tenho do ensino híbrido, é que eu vejo o ensino híbrido no sentido de que parte dos créditos ou parte da formação pode ser dada à distância, pode ser parte pode ser dada presencial, mas já não vejo, mas isso é uma opinião mais pessoal, uma situação em que haja percursos académicos diferentes. Ou seja, para o mesmo curso e para a mesma cadeira, há uns tantos alunos que estão a frequentá-los presencial e a outros à distância. Isso é que eu já não, não, não percebo como é que poderá funcionar. Ou seja, para mim o híbrido é algo em que o percurso é igual para todos os alunos, todos os alunos fazem o percurso, parte desse percurso é presencial, parte desse percurso é à distância. Agora, ter dois percursos no mesmo ciclo de estudos, isso é que uh, me levanta algumas reticências. Sr. Manuel, se eu posso desafiá-lo a acrescentar um comentário sobre um aspecto que não foi muito falado hoje, mas que também é muito partilhado quando se fala do ensino à distância, que é a aplicação do ensino à distância, teoricamente, a todas as áreas do conhecimento, mas na prática, algumas áreas são mais proibidas do que outras. Claro, eu, isso é óbvio, o ensino à distância não se aplica igualmente ou, ou da mesma forma a todas as áreas, porque há áreas onde nós temos, por exemplo, a, a escola que eu aqui represento, eu represento a Peste, mas sou presidente da Escola de Saúde de Santa Maria do Porto, que é uma escola, obviamente, tem uma componente prática de 50% nos cursos, não é? portanto, as práticas não podem ser feitas todas à distância, algumas podem, nós temos um simulador onde podemos fazer ensino de altíssimo nível sem estarem todos os alunos a praticar ao mesmo tempo. Há um grupo que pratica no simulador e os outros estão numa sala onde têm acesso a tudo e vão, e vão podendo fazer crítica. Agora, evidentemente que nada substitui a prática, não é? Mas 
isso é nada impede que nós não possamos ter modelos, e eu estou inteiramente de acordo, não é? que, só, que sejam modelos ou, ou híbridos ou de be learning, enfim, o termo é exatamente a mesma coisa. Uh, e eu mesmo neste momento eu acho que quando nós falamos em ensino presencial é uma falácia. O ensino hoje em dia, se for presencial, tem que ser mau. Porque os alunos vivem num meio completamente imerso em tecnologia e em solicitações de toda a natureza, se nós apenas nos limitamos a fazer aquilo que era tradicional o professor fazer em aula, nós não prendemos a atenção dos alunos. Portanto, há quatro princípios que eu acho que são fundamentais e acho que se aplicam ao ensino à distância tal como, como no ensino presencial, que é a autonomia dos estudantes, é para mim a coisa mais importante que nós temos que fazer a partir do jardim de infância, é desenvolver a capacidade de autonomia dos estudantes. E quanto mais elevado é o nível, mais autonomia eles devem ter. É o pensamento crítico, é a criatividade e a inovação. Estes quatro eixos são fundamentais, seja o ensino à distância ou seja presencial. Isto é o beabá de qualquer relação pedagógica. Evidentemente que, que quando nós falamos em presencial aplicamos-nos de uma maneira, quando falamos à distância aplicamos de outra. Mas reparem, hoje em dia o que, o que aconteceu com a pandemia foi que nós todos passámos a utilizar este modelo que aqui vimos hoje. O que é este modelo? A falta de melhor eu tenho chamado de vídeo presencial. No fundo, reúne as, as, as melhores duas coisas dos dois modelos. Nós estamos à distância, mas é como se estivéssemos presentes. Por acaso, aqui não houve muita interação, mas pode haver. Nós temos cursos inteiramente uh, à distância, em que há imensa interação. Os alunos respondem, uh, em termos de qualidade, para aí em 90 e muitos por cento, uh, positivamente às avaliações que são feitas sobre o modelo que se utiliza. E há uma interação enorme. Portanto, se nós soubermos aproveitar bem o, 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 o que temos, a tecnologia que temos hoje, não precisamos de muitos recursos, como precisávamos antigamente. Por exemplo, quando nós arrancámos com a Unidade de Ensino à Distância no Politécnico de Inglaterra, nós não utilizávamos esta plataforma. Portanto, era tudo, digamos assim, através dos computadores, não havia interação com, com, os, com os professores, era tudo diferente. Mas logo nessa altura se criaram equipas multidisciplinares. E eu, eu deixava muito aqui esta tónica, porque eu acho que é uma, é, é, é uma falha enorme do nosso sistema educativo, é nunca se ter apostado na formação. Os, os, os brasileiros chamam-lhes tecnólogos, que é uma, coisa, é uma expressão que em Portugal praticamente não se utiliza, mas, enfim, o que interessa é isto. São especialistas em apoiar os professores a transformar aquilo que há bocado se falou aqui em instruction designers ou coisa que vale, enfim, a palavra é mais ou menos esta, são, são técnicos que nos ajudam. Eu só preciso ter as minhas ideias e do ponto de vista científico validá-las. E depois eles põem aquilo na forma mais adequada à comunicação à distância. Nós nunca apostamos nisso, nós inclusivamente na Escola de Leiria criamos um curso, eu fui o principal empenhado na criação daquele curso, que agora se chama a comunicação aquilo de comunicação, era exatamente para formar esse perfil profissional. Não se conseguiu fazer isto, porquê? Porque não tem emprego. Porque ninguém nas escolas vai contratar uma pessoa com este perfil. Como é que eles depois na A3S podem aparecer como membros das equipas, se eles não existem, que não se formam? É porque o problema não é dizer se as pessoas têm experiência ou não têm experiência. É, as instituições têm equipas multidisciplinares ou não têm equipas multidisciplinares. Eu posso ter um professor que não percebe nada de ensino à distância. E ser regente de uma disciplina de ensino à distância e fazer um tipo de trabalho espantoso por ter uma equipa à volta dele a preparar tudo e a pôr-lhe tudo num, num, numa forma, num modelo de... Uh, quer dizer, não é ensino à distância, é aquilo que se olha para aí, para as televisões, para as séries, para tudo. É aquele modelo, é aquilo que funciona, capta a atenção dos alunos, etc. Por outro lado, relativamente ao que se passa agora, eu acho que o que se passa agora... É uma espécie de caos organizado, digamos assim. Não é? Cada um faz o que, sobe, o que sabe como pode. Por exemplo, eu fui almoçar com o meu filho que andou numa universidade aqui em Lisboa. O que é que o puto me disse? Oh, pá, aquilo agora é tudo a monte e fé em Deus. Pronto, acabou a pandemia. Estão todos ao lado uns dos outros, a única coisa que acontece é que estão de máscara. Mas não há distanciamentos, não há nada. Noutras escolas continuam a impor distanciamentos. Numas escolas é tudo à distância. Não vou agora aqui citar exemplos, conheço. Tudo o que é teórico é a distância. Só as práticas é que são presenciais. E pronto, portanto, cada um anda a fazer o que sabe. E depois a A3E vai fazer a análise dos cursos. Eu nisto não é uma crítica, atenção, Sr. Presidente, não é uma crítica. Mas também fiquei interrogado agora, quando o Brás disse, ah, acreditar um curso para 25 alunos, estão a brincar connosco, com certeza, estou 25 alunos de ensino à distância. Valha-me Deus, o ensino à distância é para 25, para 250 ou para 2.500. 
Não sei se é verdade, quer dizer, ele é que disse, e eu estou a só a perguntar, se aprova um curso de ensino à distância para 25, 25 estudantes, a gente pergunta, então, mas só 25 estudantes aonde? A distância tem que ser 25, 250, 2500, qualquer coisa assim. Não estou a ver como é que se pode aprovar um curso ou acreditar num curso para 25 alunos à distância. Mas pronto, alguém me há de explicar isso. O Sr. Presidente da Agência me autoriza, só esclarecer foi o número de estudantes, de vagas que foi pedido pela, pela instituição. Muito bem, então muito obrigado a todos pela participação e passava a palavra ao Sr. Presidente da Agência. Bem, portanto, estamos, vamos encerrar esta conferência, mas antes disso eu queria aproveitar este momento, este momento na presença de todos, sobretudo do Sr. Ministro, mas também das, das instituições representativas, das entidades representativas das instituições de ensino superior, para testemunharem a assinatura de um protocolo entre a Agência de Avaliação e Acreditação do Ensino Superior de Portugal e a Agência Reguladora do Ensino Superior de Cabo Verde. Estão os nossos colegas aqui, sobretudo o professor João Dias, da Silva, que eu chamo para podermos assinar então o protocolo de colaboração entre as duas agências. É um protocolo que, que de certa maneira consolida uma área de cooperação que temos mantido entre as duas agências, mas que agora será ampliado e será de certa maneira formalizado com este novo protocolo mais amplo do que o anterior. Portanto, assinamos. Muito boa tarde a todos e, mais uma vez, agradecer à A3GS uh, pela oportunidade uh, de estar aqui nesta conferência e, ao mesmo tempo, ter acedido ao, ao, ao pedido da, da Ares de Cabo Verde para uh, darmos seguimento a um protocolo que foi assinado em 2019 pela anterior uh, uh, administração e que, neste momento, pretendemos, mais do que assinar, a dar o seguimento e a personalizar tantas ações que nele estão consignadas. Portanto, muito obrigado. Depois dá uma capinha também. Muito obrigado. Portanto, vamos encerrar eu apenas umas breves palavras para, de certa maneira, fazer um, enfim, aquilo que pode ser entendido como uma mini síntese daquilo que se passou. Eu gostava de evocar, nesta primeira, nesta primeira parte da intervenção, a metodologia que a agência seguiu, uma metodologia que veio da, na anterior, do anterior Conselho de Administração, mas que nós reforçámos, desenvolvemos e reforçámos, que tem a ver com a mobilização de atores externos, externos à agência, mas internos ao sistema de educação, de educação de ensino superior, ao sistema de ensino superior, no sentido de apoiarem a agência a identificarem os melhores critérios, as melhores metodologias, as melhores, os melhores parceiros para constituir as comissões de avaliação externa e, portanto, esse passo que nós demos, 
e que foi a criação de uma comissão de ensino à distância, liderada pelo professor Fernando Ramos, que da Universidade de Aveiro, que está presente, e que outras, de outras, integrando outras, outras pessoas que estão presentes também, do Instituto Politécnico de Leiria, da Dra. Rita Cadímia, etc., foram, foi um, uma, uma iniciativa que eu gostaria de sublinhar. A iniciativa é esta, que nós estamos a tentar multiplicar noutros setores, designadamente com a constituição daquilo que nós chamamos as comissões temáticas de avaliação, em que mobilizamos, enfim, colegas nossos, colegas nossos de topo das respectivas carreiras, que não só do ponto de vista científico, mas também do ponto de vista da sua inserção nas comunidades, no sentido de apoiarem a agência e, no fim e ao cabo, encontrarmos aqui uma, um modus vivendis que possa ser simultaneamente integrador daquilo que, é, que são as dinâmicas do sistema de ensino superior, mas também enfim, dar a credibilidade que nós todos gostaríamos de dar ao sistema de qualidade, ao sistema de, de, de garantia de qualidade das instituições de ensino superior. Tudo isto se passa sem qualquer tipo de, 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 de beliscado, não, não, não há qualquer tipo de transgressão naquilo que são os critérios de qualidade a que a agenda está obrigada, está obrigada por efeitos da legislação nacional, mas também por efeitos do seu enquadramento europeu, do seu enquadramento internacional, e portanto esses princípios são eh, inquestionáveis, indiscutíveis, mas de qualquer maneira alarga-se esta capacidade da agência de, de intervir e no fim e ao cabo de, de criar, eh, eh, digamos, eh, uma, enfim, um, um círculo de, de avaliadores e de, de, de personagens que nos ajudam neste, neste, nesta tarefa. Sobre, o, sobre o, o, a conferência, a conferência é a primeira conferência da, do, do nosso Conselho de Administração, a nossa ideia é que fazermos sobre temas centrais que afetam o sistema de ensino superior, fazer uma conferência anual com estas, com estas características, conferência internacional, em que chamamos para, para debater o, enfim, a questão central que, está, que é colocada à discussão especialistas mundiais, daqueles que são mais enfim, notáveis na, na reflexão e no desenvolvimento dessas, dessa, de, de, desses temas e por isso esta é, digamos, foi a primeira, a primeira sessão desse ciclo de conferências. Uma, teve um êxito, como é conhecido, de início referi isso, tivemos 1.200 inscrições, cerca de 70 a 80 presenciais e o resto online, enfim, os números que nós temos foi que enfim, a, a participação andou entre os 400 e 500, enfim, simultâneos na na, nos trabalhos da, da conferência e, portanto, isso é fundamental para criar aqui reflexão, para criar aqui, enfim, estratégia no respeito a estas áreas que estamos, que queremos, que queremos, que queremos, que queremos avaliar. Dois ou três tópicos apenas daquilo que foi, que foi, foram a reflexão. Por um lado, há um tema, enfim, permanente nas, nas intervenções, que é a flexibilidade e, portanto, nós hoje em dia, não só no ensino à distância como no ensino presencial, temos uma, enfim, um conjunto de, 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 de critérios, um conjunto de modalidades cada vez mais flexíveis. Hoje em dia, aquilo que era no passado um, um ciclo de estudos muito bem ordenado, com sequência, com, 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 com aquilo que nós chamávamos as, as, as precedências, tudo isso está hoje alterado. E, portanto, os, enfim, há, hoje em dia há ciclos de estudo que, 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 enfim, que colocam na mão dos estudantes a identificação dos seus percursos, a identificação daquilo que pretendem enfim, aprender, aquilo que pretendem desenvolver, aquilo que pretendem reflexionar. Naturalmente há colegas nossos que sempre acharam que a matéria deles é essencial para aquela formação e, portanto, há sempre um clima de tensão nas instituições no sentido, entre aqueles que acham que o estudante deve ter autonomia, deve encontrar o seu próprio percurso, com acompanhamento, com tutoria e aqueles que acham que a sua matéria é essencial e que não pode prescindir de estar no currículo. E, portanto, este clima de tensão, que é normal nas instituições, vai continuar a acontecer, mas cada vez mais esta flexibilidade, esta abertura para novas, novas procuras, novos caminhos, novos percursos académicos, vai ser importante e vai ser fundamental. E isto passa-se também no ensino à distância. As, as, as intervenções que foram realizadas marcaram também a diferença entre a educação presencial e a educação à distância, não obstante, enfim, um conjunto, o professor João Queiroz referiu-se à, à modalidade espanhola que foi introduzida e que, no fim ao cabo, cria aqui um, uma, uma, uma outra modalidade de ensino híbrido. Do ponto de vista da agência, o ensino híbrido é avaliado como ensino presencial e, portanto, enfim, temos aqui uma, uma, uma questão que provavelmente eh, será, deverá, deveria ser objeto no futuro de um reajustamento legislativo, mas, eh, enfim, esta questão... É, é, é essencial. Segunda questão, a centralidade do estudante. Enfim, cada vez mais 
nós vimos todas as apresentações a mesma coisa e responder àquilo que são os percursos que, 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 o, que o estudante quer seguir na sua, no seu percurso académico, eh, desenvolver as suas autonomias, eh, responsabilizado por aquilo que são as suas, os seus, as suas opções e, 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 e enfim, as matérias que escolhe. E, portanto, a centralidade do estudante é cada vez mais importante. E, portanto, isso também é um elemento que está no ensino à distância e que está no ensino presencial. Portanto, é fundamental também, enfim, na agência estamos a conceber alterações naquilo que é o sistema de avaliação, sobretudo o sistema de avaliação institucional, para dar mais peso àquilo que é a intervenção das, das instituições no sentido de libertar e de melhorar e de facilitar e de promover, no fim ao cabo, e de condicionar pela positiva o percurso dos estudantes. E, finalmente, um aspecto que tem a ver com, com a formação do corpo docente, enfim, várias referências foram feitas também, é fundamental. Eu daqui lanço um, um desafio à PESP, ao CISP e ao CRUP também, o CRUP não está presente, mas ao CRUP darei também esse, esse, farei também esse desafio, no sentido de promoverem, sempre que possível, enfim, multiplicarem as ações de formação dos docentes, eh, ensino à distância, mas também ensino presencial. Nós precisamos de renovar os nossos métodos pedagógicos, de encontrar novas características no sentido de, de, enfim, de reforçarmos este sistema, o nosso sistema de, de ensino superior, e de libertarmos um pouco daquilo que tem sido no passado as, as ameias que têm condicionado em excesso eh, o, o, o sistema de ensino superior. Portanto, este, 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 este seminário, como disse, é o, é o primeiro de um ciclo que nós queremos fazer sobre temas centrais do sistema de ensino superior. Hoje foi de ensino à distância. Eh, eh, para o ano será um outro, enfim, ainda, ainda estaremos na, na, na fase de identificar exatamente o, o, outro, o, o, outro, o outro tema. E, portanto, eu gostaria de agradecer, enfim, nesta fase final, a, a presença do Sr. Ministro da Ciência e Tecnologia, né, enfim, para, nesta sessão de encerramento, agradecer a todos os intervenientes, agradecer à PESP, ao CRUP e ao CISP, enfim, o, o apoio que nos deram na organização. Este elemento, para nós, é central, nós queremos caminhar no sentido do reforço do desempenho, do, da qualidade do sistema de ensino superior, mas com as entidades representativas do setor. Portanto, isso para nós é fundamental e só dessa maneira é que nós conseguimos introduzir novos parâmetros, novos critérios com o apoio, com a anuência, com a colaboração, com a, a, enfim, a cumplicidade dessas, dessas entidades. E por isso, enfim, os meus agradecimentos pela, pela participação, espero, esperemos que tenha sido útil este, este, este dia de reflexão e, como estava previsto, eu agora pediria aos dois membros, ao Presidente da PESP, para fazer as suas considerações, ao Presidente do, do CIS para fazer as suas considerações e depois pediria ao, ao Sr. Ministro para encerrar a sessão. Antes de mais, queria cumprimentar o Sr. Ministro, o Sr. Manuel Leitor, Cumprimentar o Presidente do CISP, o Sr. Pedro Dominguinhos, de uma forma muito particular, saudar o Professor João Guerreiro, Presidente do Conselho de Administração da A3ES e toda a sua equipa, por a organização deste evento. Nós tivemos a oportunidade de ouvir nas palavras dos últimos intervenientes que, de facto, este é um assunto que tinha que ser discutido nesta altura. Eu diria que é o tal caos organizado que foi criado por um fenómeno que foi a pandemia que obrigou toda a gente a ter que olhar para, este, para esta questão de ensinar à distância, portanto, em que os alunos e as pessoas não estão no mesmo espaço, obrigá-los, obrigar as instituições a pensar neste sentido. A evolução das, das, das novas TICs foi, foi crescendo nas últimas décadas, muitas instituições mais atentas já estavam a utilizá-las, mas não há dúvida que foi a, a pandemia que obrigou toda a gente a utilizar estes, estes processos. De uma forma urgente, as, as instituições tiveram que se organizar muito rapidamente e acho que todas terão de uma forma geral de parabéns, foi com sucesso que se conseguiu em determinada altura. Não parar o ensino superior, continuar a ter ensino superior agora numa modalidade diferente, e por isso a oportunidade deste, deste encontro parece-nos de facto eh, enorme. E, portanto agradecemos em nome da PESP, ao professor João Guerreiro e a toda, toda a equipa da A3ES este, este, esta discussão. 
Eu diria que uh, o ensino em que os alunos estão separados dos professores com as novas tecnologias, paradoxalmente é um ensino de proximidade. Isto é, eu consigo estar próximo de um professor que está nos Estados Unidos, eu consigo estar próximo de um professor que está numa outra universidade, um especialista, e esta distância é encurtada pelas tecnologias e acho que é uma arma fundamental para termos ensino de mais qualidade que o que tínhamos. Porque há uns tempos atrás, nós para termos um, um professor estrangeiro, visitante, não, tínhamos que o convidar, a questão das viagens, uma logística, dificilmente pensaríamos em fazer um webinar e ter o professor a falar connosco àquela hora e ter uma conversa, coisa que hoje acontece com naturalidade e que, no nosso entender, veio melhorar, francamente, a questão da mobilidade. Que não é física, é mobilidade do conhecimento. E, por isso, a questão do ensino à distância é importante. Eu diria muito importante. Despertada pela pandemia, e agora é preciso pôr a tal ordem, e aqui a 3 s tem um papel fundamental, que é ajudar as instituições a encontrar o caminho certo. Outra coisa é ter ciclos de estudos, que são ministrados neste regime, que foi agora regulado pelo Decreto-Lei, em 2019-133, e aí, de facto, tem que se ter mais cuidado. Porque é fácil de entendermos com os ciclos à distância, alguns terceiros, mas há áreas científicas onde primeiros ciclos à distância não são fáceis de entender, de perceber aqueles ciclos que exigem o desenvolvimento de competências de comunicação, competências sociais, como é o caso da saúde. Eu tenho mais facilidade em falar de uma área que me é mais próxima. E, portanto, há áreas onde vamos para o sítio, ou, ou para o oposto daquilo que eu ensino à distância, que eu ensino em ambiente real de trabalho. Também podia ser um tema de conversa, numa reunião como esta, porque o ensino em ambiente real de trabalho também tem as suas características, também tem que se ter muito cuidado da forma como é feito, e, portanto, poderá ser um tema um dia até ser discutido a questão do ensino superior em ambiente real de trabalho. Uh, pois não, acho que foi tudo dito hoje. Queria só, de facto, dizer que eu tive a oportunidade de participar com um o Grupo Santiago Compostela. Ainda no início da pandemia, no desenvolvimento do primeiro sistema híbrido, pensamos nós, foi o primeiro, de facto, o sistema híbrido não, não é igual a, a, ao somatório de um sistema presencial com o um sistema à distância, é diferente. Existe, de facto, uma construção do modelo de ensino eh, que se baseia, para além das tecnologias, nos monitores, em características próprias de distribuição dos tempos de formação em cada um desses tipos de ambientes. E penso que sim, acho que é um modelo, eh, esse talvez aplicável a quase, a quase todas as áreas científicas. E, e penso que também valeria a pena este sistema híbrido ser esmiuçado e perceber como é que ele é composto, como é que ele eh, pode ser colocado à disposição das instituições. Por isso, Sr. Presidente da 3 es em nome da APESP, eh, gratos eh, por, este, por este evento, porque é oportuno, acho que foi importante todos, Tivemos a oportunidade de perceber o que é que se passa em várias instituições e, obviamente, contará connosco para próximos eventos, seja para o ensino à distância, seja para o ensino em ambiente real de trabalho, como é que eu que entender que possamos ser úteis. Muito obrigado. Muito boa tarde a todas e a todos. Uh, e já o digo há mais de 10 anos, não é só de agora. Uh, uh, cumprimentar o Sr. Ministro, o Sr. Presidente da APESP, o Sr. Presidente do Conselho de Administração e todas e todos os colegas aqui presentes, mas como aqueles que nos acompanham uh, à distância uh, nesta nova realidade. Permitam-me, eu tive a oportunidade de assistir a várias intervenções e permitam-me descentrar para recentrar no ensino à distância. O que é que eu quero dizer? O ensino à distância ou presencial não é o fim em si próprio. O que, é o, o que é o fundamental é o desenvolvimento daquilo que o professor australiano nos dizia hoje de manhã, são os learning outcomes, daquilo que nós queremos com formação superior. Eu, porque também tenho a sorte, o dever, e faço parte do Conselho Consultivo da A3ES, a última avaliação a que a A3ES foi sujeita, um dos desafios que veio plasmado no relatório é como é que nós, enquanto instituições de ensino superior, conseguimos evoluir para desenvolver e mensurar os learning outcomes dos estudantes dos diferentes ciclos 
de avaliação. E parece-me que esta deve ser uma discussão central em toda esta temática. Por isso é que, e perdoa-me aquilo que eu vou dizer, e nós temos que cumprir cursos presenciais, varrer para baixo do tapete o que foi a experiência durante estes 18 meses e voltar tudo para o presencial de um momento para o outro, ao lado uns dos outros, é não avaliar criticamente e ser um, um, um profissional reflexivo sobre aquilo que, que competência nós queremos desenvolver nos estudantes. E este é um desafio importante que nós temos que ter, nós temos que cumprir a acreditação, não é isso que está em causa. Agora temos que fazer uma reflexão muito rápida, envolvendo os diferentes atores do sistema, os estudantes, os professores, as empresas, as organizações, naturalmente o Ministério, a A3E, a ES, para perceber como é que conseguimos evoluir para melhorar verdadeiramente os learning outcomes dos estudantes. Porque, de uma forma muito clara, é evidente que os contextos de aprendizagem não se resumem à sala de aula. Seja ele uma sala de aula física, seja uma aula em videoconferência. E os estudantes, quer os que estão a chegar ao ensino superior, quer o desafio enorme que nós temos pela frente, que é a população ativa, não vive apenas de um tipo de modelo ou de entrega, por uma expressão, em termos de ensino superior. E, portanto, esta era a primeira reflexão que gostava de fazer. Centrar nos learning outcomes obriga-nos a uma reflexão profunda sobre este modelo e por isso é que esta relação híbrida é tão relevante. Por isso é que a autonomia dos estudantes é tão importante com os professores como facilitadores, como promotores, como tutores, etc. E que envolvam os estudantes em diferentes processos de ensino-aprendizagem. Nós hoje em dia conseguimos perceber a virtualidade em termos de aprendizagem para os estudantes da integração desses mesmos estudantes em projetos de investigação. E, portanto, isto é, estamos a falar de diferentes contextos de aprendizagem que são fundamentais. Depois, uma segunda reflexão que gostava de fazer e que é essencial, este modelo ou outro tem que estar devidamente integrado na estratégia institucional. Ou nós nos preparamos institucionalmente do ponto de vista daquilo que é a nossa estratégia em condições de ensino superior, dos recursos que afetamos a cada uma destas atividades, ou não é à última da hora, num mês, que preparamos esta mesma estratégia. E isto é fundamental, nós interiorizamos e nem todos temos que ir a correr, perdoem uma expressão, para propor cursos de ensino à distância. Eu tive na terça-feira uma reunião com a divisão de recursos humanos de uma grande empresa portuguesa que nos lançaram um desafio. Como é que nós fazemos a reconversão de centenas, para não dizer de milhares de pessoas, que vão ser afetadas pela digitalização e que já sabemos daqui nos próximos 4, 5 anos, muitos deles estão bem licenciados, muitas dessas profissões vão desaparecer. E nós temos que encontrar modelos organizacionais, modelos de, aprendiz... de ensino-aprendizagem, que respondam tão bem a esta realidade, porque esta vai ser verdadeiramente a realidade que nós vamos ter nos próximos tempos. Nós estamos em processo de avaliação das propostas do PRR, que vai começar na próxima semana, e sabemos que uma parte significativa das propostas feitas, sobretudo no impulso adultos, tem a ver com esta relação com as diferentes organizações, quer no setor da saúde, quer no setor das engenharias, quer no setor da gestão e por aí, e por aí fora. E, portanto, nós temos que encontrar institucionalmente essas mesmas respostas. Depois, sobre a questão da formação dos, dos professores, dos, dos técnicos, nós, eu costumo dizer, nós, enquanto instituição de ensino superior, é um bocado estranho, Estamos a dizer que temos de ser flexíveis, formação ao longo da vida, e não apostar na formação das nossas pessoas. Sejam eles docentes e não docentes. Isso é contraproducente. Qualquer instituição de ensino superior tem que ter uma estratégia clara de formação do seu corpo docente, dos seus trabalhadores não docentes, para estar adaptado àquilo que são as exigências. E aqui permitam-me destacar, no âmbito da CNAPES, que é o Congresso Nacional de Práticas Pedagógicas, hoje em dia, e todos os anos, Existem um conjunto de formações oferecidas gratuitamente por vários docentes de várias instituições eh, universitárias e politécnicas, onde participam centenas ou milhares de docentes eh, nesta mesma formação, nos diferentes níveis e, e nas diferentes estratégias que estão aqui eh, colocadas. Nós ontem, em Santarém, entregámos prémios de um projeto que estamos a desenvolver, o Link Me Up, que envolve 13 politécnicos a nível nacional, e foi possível desenvolver estratégias pedagógicas alternativas com envolvimento inovadoras, melhor dizendo, com envolvimento de organizações e com a entrega de resultados extremamente desafiantes. 
e em que os estudantes estão a trabalhar em equipas multidisciplinares, que estão a trabalhar com as empresas, com os tutores, em lógica, em contextos de aprendizagem completamente distintos, onde combinam essas diferentes abordagens. E, portanto, como dizia o professor João Guerreiro, e para terminar muito rapidamente, provavelmente nós precisamos fazer uma reflexão aprofundada para ver se, do ponto de vista legislativo, aquilo que temos neste momento se torna adequado para nós desenvolvermos algumas alternativas para poder, acima de tudo, cumprir o desiderato fundamental que é desenvolver os learning outcomes nos nossos estudantes, sejam eles de ser teste, de licenciatura, de mestrado ou doutoramento, e da formação ao longo da vida, porque vai ser um desafio muito grande que nós temos que naturalmente cumprir. Vou levantar, não sei se é o defeito de ser professor, mas... Prefiro falar em pé também para vos ver a todos e agradeço certamente o convite ao professor João, do, do professor João Guerreiro para aqui estar, face à, à relevância e à oportunidade do, do tema. Não posso deixar de fazer duas referências iniciais, uma ao nosso colega de Cabo Verde, o Dr. João Dias. É um longo processo o que aqui hoje foi assinado. De facto, como sabem... O regime legal português ou de todos os outros países europeus só permite as agências de acreditação atuarem no território nacional, podendo, excepcionalmente, abrir protocolos de colaboração quando são solicitados pelo Governo. Foi isso que se passou entre Cabo Verde entre, e depois desse também outros países que pediram a colaboração. Foi alvo de um protocolo de colaboração entre Portugal e Cabo Verde e eh, agradeço terem chegado a um, a, um, a um acordo para a Agência de Acreditação também eh, trabalhar, funcionar e fazer a capacitação eh, dos processos de acreditação eh, em Cabo Verde. A segunda referência é, face a esta sessão, espero que a composição de desigualdade de género neste painel não, não se transmita no ensino à distância e que seja rapidamente corrigido, ou pelo contrário, que seja um apelo para o ensino à distância também facilite a formação de mais mulheres e a capacitação de mulheres em Portugal, que sabemos que é uma dimensão muito importante daquilo que é a população estudantil e de, de, de docentes no corpo do docente. Eu vou ser muito rápido, fiz, já tive várias hum, mensagens e reportes sobre aquilo que se passou durante o dia, mas como tive de estar no Porto e, e no centro do país, não consegui uh, participar nas sessões. E uh, uh, trago aqui, sobretudo, quatro mensagens. A primeira é sobre a oportunidade um, deste tema, sobretudo face aos tempos de exceção que vivemos. Se tínhamos alguma dúvida, claro que hoje sabemos perfeitamente que os últimos dois anos foram anos excepcionais e aquilo que foi, diria, um ensino um, uh, transmitido uh, à distância por uma necessidade de emergência, um, obviamente resultante da condição sanitária, mostrou bem que não é ensino à distância. E com o ensino à distância é uma realidade diferente daquela que foi feita durante os últimos anos, mas também um, aprendemos a capacidade em vulgar que as instituições de ensino superior em Portugal e em grandes partes do mundo, certamente em toda a Europa, tiveram para se rapidamente adaptar e providenciar formas de ensinar e de aprender que hoje sabemos que não são ideais, mas que foram aquelas que foram necessidades. Mas também estes tempos são tempos que nos levaram a perceber que aquilo que se passou nos últimos anos, por um lado, não pode ou não deve continuar, não é certamente o ensino à distância, foi um ensino de emergência, numa situação de emergência e que, portanto, nos deve levar a refletir sobre a necessidade intrínseca daquilo que é o ensino presencial e, portanto, estamos agora no início do novo ano letivo, nunca é demais, para apelar à mobilização de todas as instituições e de todo o corpo de e estudantes para, efetivamente, se concretizar o ensino presencial, assim como termos agora a maturidade suficiente para diferenciar o que é o ensino à distância do ensino presencial. Isto leva-me ao meu segunda mensagem, que é efetivamente a da maturidade. Como todos sabem, temos aqui a reitora da Universidade Aberta, o ensino à distância é referido em Portugal desde a Lei de Bases de 1986, portanto tem eh, quase eh, 40 anos, eh, foi um longo trajeto, eh, só 
cerca de um ano e meio atrás, em 2019, depois de um longo debate público, é que temos uma regulação para o ensino à distância, naquilo que é graus totalmente um, à distância. Também sabemos que, sobretudo até à pandemia, muitos estudos internacionais, quer feitos na Europa, quer noutros continentes, mas sobretudo também em termos comparados europeus e norte-americanos, apontam, um, obviamente com alguns alguma diversidade, mas apontam que o ensino à distância, sobretudo no contexto europeu, pode chegar a 10% da oferta de, 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 daquilo que é o volume de, 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 de estudantes. Em Portugal, hoje, a Universidade Aberta representa cerca de 1,5% e por isso, qualquer que sejam as análises, mostram que o ensino à distância tem um grande potencial de crescimento também em Portugal, em Portugal continental. E crescer, e crescer mais, e formar mais, tem que ser sempre a nossa ambição. Estamos hoje com um padrão de formação inédito em Portugal. Temos pela primeira vez mais de 50% dos jovens de 20 anos no ensino superior. Ultrapassámos nos últimos anos de uma forma inédita, e mais uma vez aqui o um reconhecimento às instituições, a fração da população entre 30 e 34 anos com formação superior. Temos hoje 46% dessa faixa etária com um diploma de ensino superior, quando eram pouco mais de 30 e poucos por cento, 34 por cento em 2015, e por isso temos hoje também mais maturidade para perceber a diferenciação entre o ensino à distância e o ensino presencial, e também aprendemos aquilo que são as formas híbridas, como o Pedro Dominguinhos já falou, naturalmente usando ferramentas à distância no ensino presencial, mas diferenciando aquilo que são os graus um, um, essencialmente à distância, que também sabemos, por todos os estudos internacionais, que tem que ter uma forte componente de tutoria presencial, e sei que esse tema também foi abordado esta manhã por alguns dos uh, oradores uh, espanhóis e franceses. A minha terceira mensagem vai para, efetivamente, a especificidade do ensino à distância face àquilo que é hoje a necessidade absolutamente crítica de formar a população adulta em Portugal. Não nos podemos esquecer que, apesar do crescimento da população estudantil nos últimos anos, Portugal tem ainda hoje a população estudantil mais jovem da Europa, os últimos dados, que não são muito recentes, mas os últimos dados oficiais apontam para uma média de idades da população estudantil em Portugal de 25 anos, que compara com a população estudantil nas regiões mais desenvolvidas da Europa, acima de 40 anos de, de idade, e por isso também pelo desafio da transição ecológica, sobretudo, mas as oportunidades da transição do digital, temos hoje uma necessidade, mais do que nunca, de acelerar a formação da população ativa e, portanto, de, de adultos em, em Portugal. Também temos hoje cerca de um milhão e meio de adultos entre os 25 e os 40 anos de idade que têm o ensino secundário completo e nunca tiveram a oportunidade de ir ao ensino superior. E por isso, a especificidade, o foco, a ênfase na necessidade da formação da população adulta, que obviamente, que obviamente não tem nem o tempo, nem a disponibilidade, nem a possibilidade de, de ter ensino presencial quando é na população mais jovem, penso que é uma certamente oportunidade, um desafio, mas uma necessidade nacional particularmente importante. O Pedro Domingos, mais uma vez, referiu aqui algumas necessidades. Temos hoje, entre muitas outras questões, quer em Portugal, quer no contexto europeu, uma, uma previsão de uma alteração acelerada em muitos setores industriais. Um deles é o setor automóvel, e hoje sabemos bem a relevância do setor automóvel que tem na economia portuguesa, Deve ser raro entrar hoje num, num automóvel na Europa que não tenha peças ou sistemas produzidos em Portugal e sabemos que no âmbito daquilo que é o pacote da lei do clima na próxima década, a alteração rapidíssima que irá haver na, eh, no setor automóvel, isto é um, um, um ponto para não identificar outros pontos, como seja, por exemplo, também a, a, a economia do hidrogênio, que é sobretudo uma economia de elevada qualificação e por isso a necessidade intrínseca de efetivamente qualificarmos a população adulta e portanto a oportunidade um, do ensino à distância 
certamente usando ferramentas flexíveis, certamente horários muito flexíveis, mas certamente metodologias flexíveis, sobretudo orientada para a formação de adultos, já que também aprendemos que os jovens precisam verdadeiramente de ambientes presenciais e hoje sabemos bem, em Portugal e no mundo, aquilo que foram as consequências do aumento da ansiedade e de outros aspectos de natureza psicológica que afeta os jovens por um excesso de horas à frente de um computador. A minha quarta mensagem vai ser, é certamente para esta necessidade e para os requisitos do ensino à distância, porque sabemos, e sei que foi hoje abordado aqui muitas vezes, metodologias próprias, de uma pedagogia própria, e para que nunca é demais estudar, investigar, reforçar e melhorar os métodos que precisam de ser profissionalizados. E sabemos, por muitas experiências internacionais que também foram aqui relatadas de manhã, que este é um tipo de ensino que precisa ser altamente profissionalizado naquilo que é os serviços de apoio aos docentes e à preparação de conteúdos próprios à distância. Certamente que isto leva a, 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 a referir um aspecto que não está aqui neste painel, nem não vejo na audiência, mas talvez estejam, outras instituições que não sejam instituições de ensino superior que hoje oferecem um, diplomas e formas de ensino à distância. Temos várias realidades dessas já na Europa e até em, em Portugal, um, desde a célebre escola 42 formada em Paris e que hoje tem ações em toda a Europa, também em Lisboa e, e, e em Portugal, que tem uma forte componente à distância, para além de algumas atividades presenciais, mas temos outras realidades, sobretudo no contexto empresarial, quer academias empresariais, quer outros atores, que estão a fazer uma oferta crescente um, nesta área. E esta é uma realidade em contínua, em contínua mutação, e é bom esta diversidade de atores que, obviamente, também obriga as próprias instituições de ensino superior a perceber o contexto e a oferta de formação que hoje vai nesta área, sobretudo, muito para além daquilo que é a oferta tradicional do ensino superior por instituições de ensino superior. E na última, e na última instância, sobretudo naquilo que é a formação de, de adultos, serão, obviamente, as pessoas a fazerem opções e a valorização social e económica das competências, sobretudo pelos mercados de, de, de trabalho, que são particularmente sensíveis a esta diversidade de atores. Portanto, pela oportunidade, devido à exceção do tempo e aos momentos de emergência que estão a ser finalmente ultrapassados, mas também devido à maturidade que já existe em Portugal, devido à especificidade do que é e deve ser um ensino, um, de, um ensino à distância de, de qualidade, mas também devido, certamente, à necessidade intrínseca dos requisitos pedagógicos e da diversidade de atores e à própria profissionalização de, de, dos métodos associados a este ensino. Penso que esta reunião foi particularmente oportuna e agradeço à Agência de Acreditação para continuar este debate com todos os atores e aprofundar este processo. Muito obrigado e muito obrigado à Agência.